pleasure in uh, you know introducing dr shiba pakan actually <clears throat> uh, uh, her research areas and research impacts are bibliometrician specialized in research impact engagement citation analysis research network visualizations alt matrix uh, science communication researchers profiles and research impact indicators she actually offers customized instruction uh, instructions and consultations for faculty staff and students on these topics she provides support and education on major bibliographic and analytical databases such as web of science scopus civil dimensions pure digital commons and funding institutional in addition to research impact she teaches bibliometrics to the library and information sciences department students and also provides opportunity for students from different disciplines to complete their internships she offers research consultations to faculty staff and students in un sustainable development goals to identify research topics mapping to high priority areas uh, which are you know uh, in today's date even if you are publishing somewhere so these priority areas are chosen from sustainable development goals sdg provides expert advice on the meticulous use of different research analytical tools across the university to ensure that the researchers fully understand the quality uh, quantity and the impact of research outputs which are very necessary for each and every one who is pursuing the research she analyzes and evaluates nirf time high, higher education world university rankings and qs world university ranking methodologies she is the principal investigator of a dst government of india awarded research grant we welcome you ma'am in this international conference i would like to acknowledge all the participants with your research inputs thank you so much thank you so much so uh, can i start now yes yeah. Good morning, everybody. It, uh, it's a very uh, happy moment for me when I uh, long back uh, met Dr. Sushil Kumar sir in uh, LinkedIn, and then we had a connection and we discussed with bibliometric aspects. And he uh, uh, requested me that whether I can be uh, a uh, uh, resource person on today's uh, conference. I was very happy to discuss and. give my knowledge to everybody in in the area of bibliometrics today uh, we were talking about i'll share my screen first i hope you can see my screen yes Yeah, today I have chosen a topic which is uh, very important for the researchers in India because we every day see the researchers in our universities and in many universities that we uh, come across. They talk about journal quality, how we can think about it, and what is the meaning of this indexing. We are hearing every day like Scopus indexed journals, Web of Science indexed journals. What is the meaning of this indexing, and what that we think about analysis and the metrics, and then we are talking about impact. So I was, I am just in, introducing uh, to you that what is that about journal quality? What is that we think about indexing, and what is that? impact meant in research so every day that we are talking now we know that every day thousands and thousands of publications comes into the research field we are seeing data in that there are numbers and there are um, keywords and there are words that uh, represents science and we know that there are many databases that are, uh, represents these uh, research that we are doing which are a mentally scopus web of science these are the word that we are seeing as a researcher every day 
and the impact factor for measuring and achieving depth citations, altimetrics, and there are some analytical tools which talks about how the uh, research is measured that like is Hival, like Insight, and Dimensions is one more, one more uh, platform for uh, seeing the research, indexing the databases. So every day that we are seeing here, there are thousands and hundreds of uh, publication comes into. So when we think about publishing a paper, how we can think about like, what is the journal that we have to choose? How we can think that this journal is a genuine one? And how that indexing matters to a researcher? And how that impact matters after publication? We never think about impact or we never think about analysis once we publish a paper. We will be happy that, yes, I published a paper in this journal and that journal is indexed somewhere in some databases. There ends our thinking of our publication. But beyond that, there are so many things that we have to think about. So we will discuss one by one today. So once um, we start the thinking about all these things, so what is the scenario that is there in India? Since the introduction of publications as a quantitative indicator of research output, University output jumped considerably in spite of stable staff number and tight funding. We have we know that we have teaching staff in our universities. So when we think about the quantity of publications, like number one, number two, how many publications you have in your university this year? We started publishing and we started thinking like yes, number as a quantity. And then quality, when we think about, we think that only citation measures the quality. There are many things which measures the quality. We will discuss about it today. Then uh, when we think about publication, when we think about the impact, all this requires a well-planned and organized system, which is achieved by monitoring the progress and collaboration of your project, finding pertinent literature, writing your project proposals, reports and articles, avoiding language errors, citing original sources, building networks, searching for journals for publication, et cetera. So we never think about all these things when we think about, yes, let us do research. It's not something that we can think, let us do research. We have to plan it properly. And how do you plan on handling all these by yourself? How we can think about, like, let us plan all these things together and start doing research. The outcome should come in one year, right? Your university will ask, what is the progress in, in, in the last year? So how we can plan it very easily and how we can go ahead in doing better research for in, in, in the scenario. Let us discuss few related topics today. So first think about journal quality. So we know that we talk about journal quality. We only know that only thing that impact factor. That is what we used to hear here when we think about research. There are so many other metrics comes again after that. But journal have different recognition factors, which can be specific to a field or applicable across multiple disciplines. The quality and impact of journal is usually apparent through how widely it is read, how often it is cited, and its perception in the community. We only think about that impact factor or how it is cited, how much it is cited, what is the impact factor of the journal. No, there are so many other things that we have to look into. The quality and impact can be quantified in terms of various widely accepted parameters like aim and scopes of the journal. Impact factors is one thing. There are article influence that also coming nowadays, H index, site score, and there are many more things. Like we have to see that what is the aim, what is the scope of the journal before we think about publishing. Yes, my friend published in a journal, I cannot select that journal as my public, my uh, source of journal, right? So we have to think about it before going for selecting a journal. Then we should think what is the discoverability of journals? How we are going to see the journal? How do we search for this journal? Where we, which platform we will search for it? How do we differentiate between a predatory or a genuine journal? How would you access the quality of the journal? Is the journal follow peer review process? What about editorial board? We never see the editorial board of a journal before we sending our article for publication. We normally think about, yes, my friend published, he got recognized or she got recognized. So let us also go with that. It is not the fact now. 
it was long back when there are few publications and nobody bothered about were you published now things are changed everybody is thinking about how is your publication were you published what is the effect what is the subject area your journal and your uh, publication came out fine it is a ranking in comparison to other journals or whether it is subscribed to a library or not we never think about whether the journal which we are planning for publication is subscribed by the library whether it is an authenticated one most importantly author should be able to obtain relevant detail from the journal home page specifically issn number so many people when i join in in my institution the researchers doesn't even know about what is issn number how it is different from one journal to the other and where we can find it and we used to see that same name for two journals okay that is there in indian scenario it's very sad to say that same name will be there in international journal that will be taken by our people and then put one start one journal and when our poor researchers find that journal is publishing so nicely so they will uh, select those journals and start publishing they will not even see that the issn number for both the journals with the same name is same or not they won't even know that that journal title is indexed anywhere or not so we have 400 abstracting and indexing services some of well known services you know that scopus web of science pubmed and there are i triple explorer isim base all these indexing agencies we are not aware of indexing services much about now we are talking about it okay then uh, when we talk about all these things like how to publish how that we can publish in a quartile one journal we think about quartile one impact factor how we can go for high impact journal so before thinking about publishing in any good journals or any journals in the sense which is an indexed one which is a good one we have to perform so many things we have to think about so many things like how to perform top journals have very high standard right we know we think about journal nature nature genetics nature chemistry nature physics think about it no from when we are very small our grandfather grandmothers used to say look at the sky and then think that i have to reach there and plan yourself same way when you think about doing research when you think about publishing in top journal think about nature and then start preparing yourself theory your theory development your research method get research training if you need you can find out people around in your institution itself there will be very good researchers who published in these uh, journals meet them discuss with them how they plan themselves how they started their career in research that is what we should do practice start as a student now what happens in india is that when we see the research scholars who comes to uh, our institution long back they are they are not aware that they are going to do some uh, research or something called research they think it's another job it's not a job it's your interest that should be research should come from inside fine for that what you should do as a teacher as a researcher what you should do you should induce research culture in your students so start as a student tell them how they can uh, send a paper in conference small small conferences and make them realize that conference feedback is not the one which when we when you send a article for journal publication when in, when you send an article for publishing in a journal the feedback will be different so make them aware that this is not so easy you have to plan yourself from the start learn from others and then support your own students never send out a paper without some internal review there should be some two three people sitting together and review the public review the article before you send it for publishing right and then participate in academic network you should have a network of yourself like researchers a research network start from your institution itself there should be a pool of researchers sitting together once in a month discussing about the research work how they are doing the research we used to have in our institution like how we have a journal club we used to sit together we discuss about 
everybody's research and how they are doing better in and what they are planning next, how the research can be together, how we can start interdisciplinary research, how technical and health science should come together and do research. Even the um, sustainable development goal is giving you an ample uh, uh, opportunity for mingling uh, even humanities together with all this. Right? When we think about no poverty, when we think about gender equality, we are talking about the social science aspects also. Right? So uh, when we think about the, uh, the life below water and our life on a land, we are talking about the social science aspects of research also. So never give up and never surrender. Why we are thinking about never give up? We know that when we send our article for publishing, most of the time it will get rejected first when we when we try up try for it so when we get a rejection we will think that some journals will not even open your article they will send it back the second day because the aim and scope of the journal is not what you send okay so first we should know that before sending the article what is the aim and scope of the journal whether my article will fit into that Fine. Here, most of the time, what the researcher is forgetting that you are going to do literature search before you write a paper. And when you do a literature survey, you are going to get n number of journals which talks about your kind of research. Right? We always forget about those journals which give an information to us. And then when we send our article to a different journal which never talks about the research. Okay, so starting from your References. Start from your references, the journal which is there in your references, and then think about other journals. Right? So that is the one thing which I would like to uh, mention over here. And many people will be rejected and many will be accepted also. Okay? Every paper will find its home finally. So when we talk about journal, when we talk about quality, we are talking about the indexing part also. How we evaluate a journal? Okay, the journal is indexed in Web of Science. It is having this many impact factor. Fine. So that place is a place where we have thinking. We are thinking about the indexing. Okay, it is indexed in uh, Web of Science. It is indexed in Scopus. When we think about if a tree falls in a forest and no one is around it to hear. Does it make any sound? No, right? We need people around us when we talk about research. We publish paper, it should reach to the people, then only it will make some noise. When the journal is staying separate, it is not indexed anywhere. How will it make some impact? How you will find out that the journal is existing? What is the value of the journal? So indexing is very important. The, the person, uh, the prestige of any journal is considered by how many abstracting and indexing services cover that journal. Find a journal, whether it is indexed in Web of Science, it's Corpus, it's in Dimension, it is in PubMed, that is what a researcher see first. It has been observed in the last few years that others have started searching for indexed journals to publish their articles. An abstracting and indexing service is a product, it's a publisher sells or makes available. The journal content are searchable by using subject headings, some keywords, some other names, titles, or abstract in available databases. So they have their own indexing methods. Okay, the way they you put things in, you will get it back. So there are indexing techniques through which the uh, all the databases index themselves. Okay, index the journals, index the articles. So it is very important. Some of the most popular general scholarly abstract uh, databases to consider are Science Education Index, Scopus, you know about it, right? So basic indexing standard. So if you are starting a journal from your institution, so there are so many things that you have to take and care of, right? Just starting a journal and then think about tomorrow, my journal should get indexed in Scopus or Web of Science or in PubMed or in EBSCO is not the fact that you should. You should all academic index require journals to follow certain core publishing standards. To meet basic indexing requirements, journals should have an international standard 
serial number we know about like ISSN. Then all the articles should have a DOI number. That is the particular number, a sing single number for a, it's not a single number, it's a number for a, it's an identification for an article. Okay, it's, it's unique for each and every article. And established publishing schedule. There should be a publishing schedule for a journal. Like if it is monthly, if it is uh, bi-monthly, how it is yearly, you have to think about it beforehand. A copyright policy should be there. And a basic article level metadata. There should be some article level metadata that should be followed, that should be mandatorily keep. So different inclusion requirements. There are a few more things that we have to take care of when we think about indexing. Publication scope. What is the scope of the journal? When you even for even you send uh, an article for publishing, you should see the scope of the journal. So if you are maintaining a journal and you wanted to index your journal into any. <laughs> Fine. So publication scope is very important. So, uh, and then editorial board and policies. There should be a clear editorial board and there should be clear mention about who are the editorial board members. And then often indexing requires a full name and affiliation of journal editors, as well as information about journal editorial policies, such as public, publicly available peer review policy and et cetera. Fine. And level of publishing professionalization. How that you are publishing. Some indexing look at publishing professionalization, professionalization, including readability of articles and production quality. How the how that your articles are reaching to your audience and the quality of your peer review, all these details has to be maintained and think about indexing in any databases. Or even when you are thinking about publishing a journal, pu publishing your article in a journal, you will you have to see all these uh, things which uh, is uh, explained in the journal. Sometimes when we see that predatory journals, they will not maintain all these things. So if it is journal, journal is genuine, they will maintain all these activities. Okay, archiving policy. This is also very important like archive should be there in journal. And most important thing which I saw the practice which I see in journals is that you, they will publish 100 papers, right? But only 20 or 50 articles will be indexed when, they, when we search for the articles in Scopus or Web of Science, some of the platforms. Okay, you have to track that, how many articles published in each issues in that journal at least to find out one or two issue and then see that how many articles they published and how many came in Scopus platform. Don't look at recent publications, look at two to three months before publications or two to three volume before publications. Okay, and see that all the articles are equally reflecting in Scopus database or not. Because I used to see researchers complaining about my article didn't appear in Scopus. It's a database. Okay, Scopus is a database and my article is not sh showing the, what is the problem? My friend's article is there, why my article is not there? So most of the times the publishing uh, industry uh, do such kind of things. So you should be, if it is a journal, it will not do such kind of activities. If it is not, these are the things that will make you aware that yes, the journal is a genuine one or I can go for it. If, if, it is, if it is doing some fishy activities, these are the things that you can monitor. And the consistency of publications, whether this year they published 200 articles and next year they are publishing 400 and next year they're publishing 600. There is some ambiguity in that, right? It's not a consistent one. A journal should have a consistency, 200. Maybe they, have, they can publish 220, not 400. Okay, so the publication consistency, the number of publication coming in each volume and issue, all these things matters 
when you go for a public go for publishing your article also and you are selecting a journal so next we'll think about what is the impact how we can find out the impact the analysis of journal or of articles of journals of um, your institution of a researcher okay when we think about impact understanding and awareness meaning your research helped people understand an issue better than they had before or whether they are understanding that yes this research has given something new to us find research is something new right every day whatever we are doing we said that we are thinking about research already there is research happened we will do a literature research and we will find some new problem and then we'll start doing research so it, it's a new one and attitude now your research helped lead to a change in attitude some things that we already decided has to change that is what research gives us we have to rethink we have to change the thing what already had happened economic impact your research contribute to cost saving cost avoided or increases in revenue profits or funding there should be something that is happening in our research that, that will be doing something to the economic activities and environmental benefit arising from your research a generic genetic diversity habit habitat conservation and ecosystems some changes that is happening in the environment health and well being your research led to better outcomes for individuals or groups research impact when we talk about it, it's not only metrics that we are seeing there are so many other things that happens that is why we have sdgs right sdg talk about the societal problems that is existing so when you do your research if you if it is affecting if it is affecting anywhere in the uh, in, in 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 these sdgs you can you should in, involve that in that you should mention about it in that okay health and well being your research led to better outcomes for individuals or groups this is also important and whether your research is impacting somewhere in the policy your research contribute to new or amended guidelines or laws whether it is giving some uh, reviving in, in in any policy okay that is also very important to see so research is overall how the impact that this measures it's not only impact factor it is not only the citations that we got it's not only the h index that we calculate it's not only that in the top percentile we publish okay there are so many other measures whether your publication comes in the top percentile of talking journals the talking uh, the issues so there is an analytical database which is which says about how, which percentile your publications are whether it is talking about now the the problems the situations that is happening in the world so all these things matters when you publish a paper fine so how is impact achieved how we can see that okay well, uh, uh, my research is doing some impact reach communication of knowledge is key to impact you need to reach to the audience that can best build or or benefit from your work so how you will reach out to people and talk about the research that you are doing talk about the publications that you are doing and then discuss about it why you are doing this your findings will not be able to deliver any kind of change if no one knows about them right everybody should know about what i am working on now everybody should talk about it at least the people who are working in the same area then there is a benefit comes out of that research engage you need to interact with those audience whether they are policy makers industry educators health practitioners and media the media people the public to understand their needs and existing levels of expertise and to be able to address their feedback as your work evolves so when you do research you have to discuss it about it's not that you have to um, 
open and say everything to everybody. Not that you have to discuss about your research to attract the people who are related to your research field and whom you are meeting every now and then. If it is something related to policy, you have to talk about people who are already there in the activities of policy making. Fine. If it is educationist, you have to talk about them. If it is something related to healthcare, then you have to talk about the people who are working over there. Already, they will have an idea about whether your work goes into the same direction. You will come to know. Fine. So this engagement is very important. Your findings will not be able to deliver any kind of change if they are not relevant to potential stakeholders. So who are the stakeholders of your? Who are the beneficiary of your research? if they are not aware of the work if their contributions are not there so it will not give any impact so changes you need to be thinking from early in the research research process about the kind of change you want to create whether that is changing behavior attitude awareness process policy product or specifications impact must be more than an academic concept for it to be truly valued by the real world and thus by research funders and institutions so what is the impact how you are benefiting to the research funding you already got funding and you are not uh, delivering it to the people who has to work on it then it will not reach to its uh, impact impact okay so finally when we talk about impact we can think about you need to think about how any change can you bring about it will scale such that it affects is as significant widespread and lasting as possible how can a benefit to the local community be translated to national or even international impact how it is going to impact whether the impact is national if it is a local you are doing as research on some a local problems but you should make it to the national level there will be problem existing if it is something related to health science issues health related issues there will be issues happening in some other part of the country some other part of the world so you should make it to the national and international impact to maximize the impact potential of your research work otherwise it will get a, a negative impact you have to think about like how i can maximize my problems which is locally seen has to be there in some other part of the world and you have to reach it to the people who are there in outside your local community fine so this is how we talk about impact we think about i know that we are talking about bibliometrics the metrics that is the to measure india is totally talking about h index the impact measure about citations not only citations or h index matters that is the reason there came an stg which measures which is not number which talks about the problems that is the that that you do as a researcher the problems that you talk about that is there in the society fine so impact is not only measured with numbers it measured with what you are delivering through your research fine so finally when we think about how we can find a good journal how we can think about the indexing or we should see that yes our journals are indexed our articles are indexed in then comes about after publishing after doing so much of research work and then finding out a journal and after all the process of peer review from a journal waiting for one year you your article got published think about how i can make my article visible to the world fine it start from the selection of your topic then are the methodology the research that you did and then the selection of your journal and then the peer review process and the publication and after publishing how you are talking about your journal which platforms you are expressing your journal your article to whom you are discussing about your work fine and then see the impact 
if you publish a paper if it is not public if it is not discussed in any platform your publications will not reach the people whom it has to reach and one more thing when you do research not don't focus it only to your institution try to collaborate with people outside your institution outside your country fine the collaborations will take your visibility from one institution to the other institution to the other country so it is very important to have visibility getting from uh, our own home to outside the society and to the international level to find now find out uh, how i can collaborate with researchers find out the best researcher in your area so bibliometrics will help you in finding out good uh, research publications and the best researcher in your area and then follow the researchers a pool of researchers you find out in your research area and then try to see that how they are publishing which are the topics they are covering how i can do a better research over to them and how i can collaborate them uh, with them and propose some new topics and then start doing research on that and then publish and then give visibility fine so what is that the research is you get what you put in so first you start how you have to plan your research and then go, go on progressing with that and finally you think about how i can make some impact to my research fine so let us start we can do it together thank you so much so i'll be happy to uh, answer some questions if you have Thank you, thank you, Siva, ma'am, for this wonderful talk and uh, the information you have provided. Uh, it uh, will be more useful. And uh, on behalf of the participants, uh, I would like to ask some question. Uh, first thing is that uh, many of us are aware about to the Scopus as well as of Web of Science and uh, DOJ like that indexing or uh, the repositories. But uh, very few young researchers are aware about to the dimensions that you had mentioned and that uh, database is almost similar to the Scopus mm -hmm. and Web of Science mm -hmm. and uh, useful for the bibliometric studies. Uh, mm -hmm. So if the researchers basically are, are interested to know uh, about to the uh, a particular topic, they can also use the dimension as a platform to find out the number of particles. What is your take on it? Yes, um, there are, hello. Yeah. yeah. Hello. There are, uh, there are uh, many uh, databases which is uh, indexed, um, uh, indexing uh, uh, databases, even uh, dimensions, uh, scopus, or web of science. All these uh, uh, indexing uh, databases are giving you an idea about, like, if you have a keyword and you search through these databases, you are getting a pool of publications which is related to your search. And then you can go ahead, like how I can filter it, how many years data I want, which are the relevant papers, and then you can go ahead with your search. There will be few researchers which, when you when you do a bibliometric search, what you will uh, come to know is that who are the best researchers in your field, and then you, then you can plan your research to go ahead. You have also mentioned. Yeah, any database is fine. If it is a web of science and scopus or dimensions, any database is fine for doing a bibliometric search. Scopus have wide coverage. That is the reason people mostly focus on scopus. You will get uh, uh, publications from many journals. They are indexing more than 25 to 30,000 journals. Mm -hmm. Uh, the point is, uh, next point is about to the uh, a different type of model of the journal that you had mentioned, uh, F100, triple zero, F1000. Hmm. And uh, that is open access and they are using different approach. Hmm. Uh, right? uh, so uh, nowadays, actually, it is, uh, uh, it is useful, um, basically, this point uh, to understand by the researchers that not only traditional uh, journals are uh, existed, there are many different models. Basically, now I, uh, you can see into the publications. So yesterday we had discussed about to the open archives platform and uh, this F1000 actually it's a similar, but here 
there is no uh, that traditional uh, the viewer approach here here audio article article is review that and then after they publish right is it same i said there is there are some uh, problems that researchers face like how they can go ahead with publishing whether we have to go ahead with open access if there is an open access there are journals which doesn't ask money but there are journals who ask money from the researchers so some uh, some areas which which uh, we cannot uh, blame the researchers some area is like that they have to pay some amount of money to publish in open access so i got a dsg project in that we are basically discussing about uh, these problems and then how the funding can be improved to uh, promote open access in all these details so the basically the ideas that i have given to the funding agencies that anyway they are funding for some problems why can't they think about giving some fund for publishing in open access that also good journals think about that how much money that they are asking otherwise there should be a consortia in indian scenario to some universe, some uh, maybe universities can pull together and make some uh, consortia kind of thing and then uh, started thinking out how we can promote open access how we can put together not to a burden to the researcher even some universities are coming forward in, and helping the researchers in uh, having contact with the publishers and making some tie ups and then uh, publishing uh, promoting open access publishing so this is what uh, Uh, not a researcher has to think about this is the authorities of the institution or the uh, or the government of india has to think about otherwise some consortia has to think about like how we can promote uh, research uh, open access research the funding agency at least when they fund for the research has to think about so awareness of this uh, has is is good for um, researchers that and they should know about how they can choose the journal in open access there are so many problems happening because of predatory journals which come into open access and then ask the researchers for money and it is of waste that they don't know that the journal is genuine so these and are the points as to me i think you had mentioned here about to the doi and it is uh, again very important because many researchers still are not aware about to the digital object identifier hmm. that is given the uh, content digital content as a uh, basically that is understood as a property digital property and mm. to identify that digital property on the web on the net it is must that uh, that should be basically published with some identifier and here cross rep and other agencies are helping for the doi mm. uh, you just give some light on yes uh, you know uh, like i'll give an example like when we entered into a college or in a school wherever it is we will get an identification number right our code number for the single uh, student the same way when your article entered into a journal there will be a code name given to the article that is what we mention about doi it is a single for that single article so when you take the doi and put it anywhere your article will open not any other article so it is very important to have a doi number to your article so genuine journals if the journal is genuine there will be doi number for each and every articles so when you think about publishing uh, a paper sending your article you have to verify with the journals there is no clear cut rule for uh, identifying predatory journals these are the identifiers c issn number that is also unique number for a journal c doi number that is unique for an article so i uh, think about all these aspects and then go ahead publishing paper and now this question is on behalf of the hashika uh, hashika mm-hmm. and uh, uh, and might be for other young scholars basically when they had start to search the research objectives mm-hmm. so it is very then that they have to define the research objective in that way they should be totally a new area a new area means a new kind of problem that problem should not publish earlier mm-hmm. so you are uh, you are expert in the bibliometric studies so how basically this study can help uh, to the young scholars to define the research objective that this uh, article or this uh, topic or uh, this thing basically studies has been done already yeah research objective it's a broad uh, 
like uh, area which you are talking about like see when when we start doing research your uh, guide or your um, teacher who is asking you to do a bibliometric search so a search a, a literature search so when you do a literature search you will come to know that yes these are the publications which is you should have an idea in mind right this is the area that i am thinking about like i should work on so it's it's not that the same area will be the the ultimate thing that you are going to get keep an idea and then go for a literature search and then see that relevant literature in that area go through the abstract and conclusion of that uh, articles you will come to know yes whether the idea is relevant or not if there there should be some changes that i have to make get the idea from these uh, what say the result which you get got from the literature search and then start building your objective it is not that one two uh, objective you have wrote that will be the final objective do the literature search in two to three months every day different keywords in the same uh, topic and then see that those articles whether it is giving the same objective whether i can go ahead with the same objective or i have to change this is what you have to do and literature search also you should do it in a relevant database it's not that you put it in google and whatever result you are getting you build your objective accordingly google is not the platform where you have to do a, uh, a scientific uh, literature search for scientific literature search you have to depend on some authentic databases maybe web of science maybe scopus maybe they mention some kind of databases which gives you some a uh, good idea about what is that you are going to discuss about then you start building your objective go on okay. changing it after 6 months of your literature review you have to finalize that this is my objective which i have to take forward right and second thing is about to the uh, multidisciplinary journals so you had mentioned earlier that uh, according to the quartile subject specific journals and these are four and uh, if in the first one that you just try to motivate the young scholars that one have to basically follow the uh, good quality journals and it is must and one have to basically approach that the uh, question is that uh, sometimes scholars are not aware they just uh, publish their article in multidisciplinary uh, a journal and uh, because of that they basically did not get uh, actual exposure of for their article is that true or not or subject specific uh, quarterly based uh, journals are most suitable uh, to publish the article yes it is uh, it is not like that it's according to the problems that you have expressed in your article like if it is totally related to some kind of a health related issues then you have to think about the publishing it in some health science journals and if it is totally in the relevant to technical side then you have to think about journals which is in technical if it is a multidisciplinary something that you are a computer science person is to, uh, uh, doing something research to the health, some health science issues something like we can talk about that like some uh, mouth cancer if they are uh, making some device then the journal should be in that way like how we normally i used to uh, tell my researchers is that we cannot uh, uh, like say that clear cut rule go with health science journal go with technical journal go with social science journals then the first thing that you have to do is do a literature search find out the article relevant to your topic then see the journals which published those papers you have got a number of a pool of articles right in your related to your area then those article which talks about how uh, your research is and uh, where you have to think about publishing so one journal in that or 10 journal in that will lead you to the other journals which you can select thank you thank you thank you shiva ma'am for providing this so uh, wonderful information at this platform and i am sure that uh, the young scholars will get a benefit of it and uh, uh, now we are moving uh, uh, to the next talk uh, uh, so thank you thank you once again thank you so much thank you sir and uh, i will request uh, ma'am dr harbin bhandari to introduce the uh, next speaker uh, over to you ma'am harbin very good morning sir and thank you for giving me this opportunity 
I would like to introduce Mr. Vishav Sharma, our next resource person. Mr. Sharma is Regional Solutions Consultant at Clarivate Analytics with his strong expertise on the research solutions such as Web of Science, EndNote, and JCR. Mr. Sharma has been instrumental in supporting the researchers and management at top research and academic institutions across the country. This includes top universities, CSIR labs, BST labs, ISRO labs, ICMR labs, IITs, and ICERs, etc. He's been a regular speaker at various forums on best practices in scientific research, discovery, analytics, evaluation, and benchmarking. He also conducts the online Web of Science certification series every year. He has an experience in the medical device industry and had the honor of working for organizations like Boston Scientific and Johnson & Johnson. Mr. Bishop did his chemical engineering from SLIT Longowal and completed his MBA from IIM Calcutta and had started his career with Seco Technologies and later Voltas Limited. Mr. Bishop is a keen sportsman, likes to play tennis. He is a state level swimmer and now runs marathons also. So that's a long list. Uh, sir is going to speak on a very needed topic for all of us selection of the right journal for publishing research. With that, I welcome, sir, to the international conference. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, and a big thank you to Chatkar University, Dr. Sushil, and everyone associated with this conference for uh, you know, giving us this opportunity to present. Uh, just a small tech check. Am I audible to everyone? Yes. Yes. OK, great. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So. Uh, uh, very quickly, without wasting much time, I'll start by sharing my screen. And uh, uh, Shiba ma'am, a wonderful session. I sat through most of it and it was a great session. And Dr. Sushil, I would like to compliment you uh, for arranging uh, so many valued speakers. In fact, I was while I was going through the agenda, I was, you know, totally impressed by the kind of relevant topics that you put together and the speakers that you managed to uh, brought uh, bring to this platform. So uh, congratulations to you on that, sir. In fact, I would be sitting through most of the sessions because some of the topics are of uh, personal interest to me. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, so I'll share my screen with all of you. So just let me know, is my screen visible to everyone? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So in order to save on the bandwidth, I'll uh, switch off my camera, if that is okay. Uh, fully screen mode? Yeah, yeah, I'll just go, go full screen. Just a minute. Okay, no, we, are, we are full screen now and I will switch off my camera for the moment. All right. <clears throat> okay. So let's start. Actually, I had agreed on a certain topic with the Dr. Sushil, but I've, uh, you know, I've taken the liberty of adding a few words to it. So today I'm going to deliver a talk on selecting the right journal for publication, uh, research metrics, and how you could possibly avoid predatory journals. So I'm sure most of us in uh, this industry understand what predatory journals are. However, there is no method of, you know, finding out which one, uh, which journal is predatory and which one is not, right? There is no clear cut demarcation between a good journal and a predatory one. However, uh, you know, uh, during the course uh, of our, uh, you know, uh, talks with various agencies and with the experience that we get, uh, we have been able to find out certain points which we would like to highlight today in the session, how you can actually avoid those predatory journals. But before that, we'll uh, straight away get into the topic of uh, selecting the right journal for publication. So my name is Bishop Sharma. I'm the Regional Solutions Consultant, and I'm handling uh, the uh, marketing operations as well for uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and recently the territory has expanded to ANZ as well. Uh, so let's start. Okay. So this is the agenda that I'll be going through, common terminologies in research, exploring open access, how to select the right journal for publications, uh, where we will talk about the uh, journal citation reports. And I'll also touch upon the EndNote manuscript matcher, 
uh, as well as the master general list then we will dive deep into this uh, you know this parameter which everyone knows about the general impact factor i i believe everyone in the research uh, community knows about impact factor but we'll, we'll just dive deep into understanding what it really means for researchers and then metrics that contribute to nirf ranking which again is very very important very relevant to most of the institutions within india uh, academic institutions i mean and then predatory journals and uh, you know orchid identity so we'll get on with it i understand that you know a couple of topics could be overlapping because of the sessions that uh, which will be follow, uh, following throughout the day after my session we i know that we have a talk on open access as well as on orchid so i'll just try to you know minimize and i do not intend to steal the thunder from their presentations <laughs> okay so moving on here are some common terminologies in research. I believe, uh, you know, uh, this is specifically targeted at young researchers. I'm sure most of you uh, don't really need this, but uh, uh, all the young researchers out there should know what is a citation. They should understand the meaning of a reference, uh, the difference between a citation and a reference. Uh, what do we mean by open access? What are the different categories and types uh, of open access? And what are the differences? Well, open access, uh, I would like to, you know, take a pause here and talk about open access first. I'll not uh, be talking about a citation or a reference because it is it is something which is very basic. Uh, now, people say that open access is something that you get uh, free of cost, right? But that is not the complete definition. We, uh, what really matters within open access is the key. Uh, the key word here is full text. Do not forget this word, full text. So open access means you're getting the full text absolutely free of cost. You do not pay any subscription fee. This is from a researcher's point of view, someone who is uh, you know, reading those papers. Open access has a completely different meaning uh, when it comes to uh, the authors. So for authors, open access has a completely different meaning, right? It means uh, your research becomes available uh, from day one, as soon as it gets published, it becomes available. That is one form of open access. And, you know, whether you are required to pay any APC, APC is the article processing charges, right? I'll not talk much about that. We have sessions here. Dr. Sushil has lined up uh, some sessions on open access where I believe this will be discussed. Uh, there are different types of open access, right? We'll talk about that today. Uh, you know, we have the gold open access, the green open access, and so many more types of open access. And what are the differences? We'll also be talking about H index, impact factor, and orchid numbers. Now, I will be sharing this presentation once I'm done with this. I'll email this to uh, Dr. Sushil. Uh, the link at the bottom of this slide, are there are a few training videos that we have. Right. Uh, I'm sure most of us uh, who are already using Web of Science, uh, this, this link basically does not cater only to Web of Science. It has training videos on all the products that we have. Web of Science, Insights, EndNote, JCR, all these products are there on, on the Web of Science platform. And we have training videos all compiled in one place. So this link can actually be very useful to all of you. OK, uh, moving on. So open access status identified in the web of science. So we identify web, uh, what are open access papers and we show them with this open lock symbol. As you can see here, uh, this is the universal symbol for open access. And we have things like DOAJ gold and other gold and bronze and green accepted, green published, right? So these are the various categories that we have within open access. You, again, I've embedded uh, links here. Uh, you can actually go through these videos and you can understand what these terminologies really mean, okay? So there are a few other types of open access. Uh, we have the diamond open access, the bronze open access, and the hybrid open access. Now, it is a common perception that, you know, every open access article means you have, the author has to pay some APC. Right. However, there are a few categories where there is no APC that applies even to the authors. Right. So we have such a category. It's called diamond open access. Journals do not charge subscription fee or access charges similar to gold open access with article going through peer review. OK, yes. Talking of peer review, uh, 
again, it is a common perception among people that when we talk of open access, uh, people feel that there could be a compromise in terms of quality. Well, let me tell you, uh, any good open access journal coming from a good publisher, uh, there is absolutely no compromise on quality, right? So the peer review process uh, is followed uh, very religiously and uh, I can assure you the quality is just as good as any other subscribed journal, right? So open access in no ways means uh, that the quality is compromised, however, uh, there is a thin line between open access and predatory journals, right? Because the revenue model is more or less similar, right? Open access journals, uh, they usually charge an APC from the author. And there are some predatory journals which charge some fees from the author in order to publish, right? But there's a very thin line. So be very careful when you're looking at open access journals, right? Uh, do all the uh, quality checks that you have to. Uh, and I'm sure uh, you will definitely uh, be safe. Then we have the bronze open access and the hybrid open access. Hybrid means, you know, uh, a journal which has partly uh, uh, journal uh, articles which are open access and some of the articles which are on a subscription model. Okay. Moving on. So commonly used terminologies. So uh, this, these, uh, first of all, these are the most commonly used criteria. So when, you, when do you feel that this is the right journal for you, right? What are the things you should watch out for? Well, the things you should actually be looking at are, uh, you know, many people try to look at the scope of the journal, right? Scope basically gives you all the details what the journal is all about, right? So that could be a good starting point if you really want to see uh, just give me a minute. I'm just getting this panel in front of me. Uh, I just, I'm just trying to get rid of this control panel that is showing up on my screen time and again. Just give me a minute. Okay. But no, uh, no uh, PG bullet. Uh, uh, we can see only this slide. You can see only the slide, yeah, but uh, actually I would say the top portion of my screen is kind of blacked out, I don't know why. I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll share again, if that is okay. Just give me a minute, I'll stop sharing. And I'm gonna share my screen all over again. Just give me a minute. Okay, is my screen visible now? Yes. Okay, fine. Anyways, the the thing is still there, but anyways, let's just continue. Okay, so uh, these are the a few commonly used criteria uh, for selecting the right journal. People, researchers like to look at the scope of the journal. Uh, many of them consider publisher reputation to be very important. Uh, but let me tell you, there is no means of measuring the reputation, right? It's not a quantifiable thing. So there is no means, it is just a, a perception. Right. And anything that is perception, you know, can be different for different kind of people. Right. Uh, for me, a, a particular journal could be good because I feel that the publisher is very reputed, whereas another person could have exactly this, uh, exactly the opposite opinion about the same publisher. Right. So publisher opinions cannot be measured. And anything which is, you know, based on perception, we don't really give that much weightage. Uh, then Many people like to consider the journal impact factor as one of the criteria for selecting the right journal. Well, this is actually a good thing because it can be measured. It is a measurable parameter, right? And then uh, the type of articles that are published in the journal, that could again be one of the factors that you can consider. So we will focus on the journal impact factor and other additional, uh, you know, citation-based metrics. <clears throat> Moving on. Okay, so what is the journal impact factor? Now, the journal impact factor, of course you can go through the definition, but many people actually get confused how it is calculated. It is no rocket science. It is a very simple calculation. All you need to know is you have to have a clear understanding 
of the year for which you're calculating the impact factor, right? So I'll just give you a brief example here. On the screen it says, suppose we want to find out the impact factor of a certain journal for the year 2017, okay? So there are three years that we need to consider. The current year, which is the, 2000, uh, which is the year 2017, and the previous two years, right? So uh, what we'll do, we will do is, now if you look at, focus on the left-hand side of this slide, right? We have that calculation for you. In the numerator, we have the citations, and in the denominator, we have the, uh, uh, the publications. So the calculation is very simple. The thumb rule is you have to first decide what is going to be your denominator, right? In the denominator, we have the number of citable items. So these are basically, in simple language, it is just the number of publications. So for that particular journal, since we are calculating it for the year 2017, we have to consider the previous two years. I repeat, previous two years. So the previous two years would be 2015 and 16. So in this example, we find that, you know, this journal has published 317 papers in across all the volumes and all the issues of that particular journal in the year 2015. So there are 317 papers that got published in this journal and 325 papers in the year 2016, right? So these are the total number of publications that happened in the previous two years. All right, so our denominator is now 642. And the calculation of citations is slightly tricky. So please hear, hear me very, very carefully. We consider the citations only in the current year. And the current year is 2017. So we have to consider the citations accumulated by those 317 publications of 2015, right? So we'll just say that how many citations did those 317 papers gather in the calendar year of 2017, right? So the publications of 2015 received 10324 citations in the calendar year of 2017, right? We are not going to consider citations. I'm sure the papers in 2015, they must have received some citation in the previous years as well, but we are not going to consider that. We will consider the citations that it received only in the calendar year of 2017. We do not follow any financial year or any other type of year. Uh, it is just simple calculation from 1st of January to the 31st of December. So we go as per the calendar year. Similarly, uh, the citations gathered by those 325 publications of 2016, how many citations they received in the year 2017? And the answer is 8979. So after that, it's just simple mathematics. Uh, we just add up the citations, which comes to 19303, and we add up the publications, which adds up to 642. And after that, that's the impact factor calculation for you. So anyone can actually calculate the impact factor. However, we are the only agency which can allocate an impact factor to a journal, right? Because this is something which was proposed by Dr. Eugene Garfield uh, and he has been associated. He is actually considered the father of web of science and he started this database. So uh, we are actually the only agency which can allocate this impact factor to any journal. The other thing that you need to remember is impact factors, hear me carefully, impact factors should always, always be given to the third place of decimal. The calculation should be such that it, uh, you know, it shows impact factors to the third place of decimal. So in this case, it is 30.067. I'm just, uh, you know, making it up, but if the impact factor is, let's say 30, you cannot say the impact factor is 30. You have to say it is 30.000, okay? And along with that, you must also mention the year. Remember in this case, in this example, we found it for the year 2017. So the right way of saying this would be the impact factor is 30.067 for the year 2017. Why, why mention the year? Because it changes every year. As you have the formula in front of you right now, I'm sure you uh, appreciate 
that impact factors calculations will change year on year because the previous two year criteria will obviously keep moving as the year progresses, right? Okay. Now, as far as impact factors are concerned, we declare the impact factor uh, by June or July of the next year for the previous year. Uh, for example, if we do not currently have the impact factor of 2021, although the year is over, but still we've not found uh, calculated, we've not uh, come out with a list. It will be declared probably in the month of June or July, right? So we have to wait till the calendar year completes. 2021 is completed. However, we will declare it in June. Similarly, for the impact factor of the year 2022, it will be declared somewhere close to June or July of 2023. Okay, moving on. So uh, if I ask you that, you know, uh, 3.45, or I should say 3.450, is if this is the impact factor of a journal, is it really good or bad, right? Many people, many researchers feel that, you know, just by knowing the impact factor, we can tell whether a journal is good or it is not so good. So my question is, do you consider the impact factor of 3.450 as good or not so good? Well, if you ask me, I really, uh, I will say that I really don't know, right? I really do not have any answer for this. I don't know, I would say I need more information. Why would you need more information? Now, here's why. So in the first example, let's just say that for a particular subject area, the impact factor ranges from one to four, right? So let's just you know, give it, a, you know, uh, uh, create a hypothetical example. Let's just say that in the subject of, uh, let's say, psychology, uh, the, the journals uh, which are dedicated to the subject of psychology, their impact factors range from one to four. So within psychology, if I pick up a journal with an impact factor of 3.45, it is very close to the upper limit of four, right? Which means it is actually a good impact factor. However, you know, if I consider a different subject, for example, if I pick up the subject of, let's say, uh, chemistry, okay, chemistry. So all the journals in chemistry, if I try to create a, a list of all the journals, and if I look at all the impact factors, I realize that uh, the range is between three to nine, right? So if the journal has an impact factor of 3.45, it is close to the lower limit of this range, which means it is a poor impact factor, right? So the bottom line here is impact factors have no meaning by itself. Unless you specify the subject, I really cannot say whether the impact factor is good or bad, right? Well, uh, you know, talking of, let's say medicine, uh, uh, or maybe let's be more specific. Uh, we have, uh, there are actually a lot of journals dedicated to cancer and cancer research, right? So those kind of journals have, tend to have very high impact factors in the range of 60s, 70s, 80s, right? So if a journal within, uh, you know, cancer research has impact factor of, let's say, 25, right? People may consider that, oh my goodness, 25 is a very high impact factor. However, uh, good journals, uh, within this research area tend to have impact factors which are actually much higher in the range of 70s or even 80s, right? So 25 is not such a good impact factor, although the number may seem very high, but it's actually not good when we look at it from a subject point of view, right? Whereas 25 is actually a very high impact factor if you pick up any journal uh, from, let's say, chemistry. Chemistry journals have impact factors, you know, ranging as high as 20 or 21. So 25 is a very high impact factor if you pick up any journal uh, from chemistry, right? So it is dependent on the subject. I hope this point is clear. Let's move on. So on Web of Science, what we've done is we've also introduced another parameter. It's called rank. IF here stands for impact factor. And if you notice, uh, all the impact factors are given to the third place of decimal. And you would also appreciate that the year is also mentioned within brackets you in all answering. the four examples. Yes. Uh, is there a question? 
No, okay. there is no. It was <laughs> disturbed. Okay. All right. No problem, sir. Uh, so, in the first example, we look at this journal called Toxicology Letters, right? Here, the impact factor is 3.858. We really don't know whether it's a good impact factor or not, right? However, when we look at the rank, which is available on Web of Science, you will see this little option on Web of Science. The rank is 14 of 92. What it basically means is within the subject of toxicology on Web of Science, we have indexed 92 journals. And based on, on the impact factor of all those 92 journals, so it's like saying that we create a list of all the journals within toxicology and uh, along with the impact factors. And if we follow that list, then this particular journal, Toxicology Letters, ranks 14th according to its impact factor, which means there are 13 other journals having impact factor higher than 3.858, right? And it is a quartile one journal. Again, we've introduced another terminology, it's called quartile. Uh, this is again a very good concept and you know it helps you in comparing journals now if i say that you know let's compare two journals one from the subject of chemistry the other one from the subject of let's say cancer uh, we cannot really do a head to head comparison we, it's like you know it's not an apple to apple comparison however uh, simply because they are from different subject areas however when we look at the quartiles Quartile is more generic and it allows you to compare subjects from different research areas. So what exactly is the concept of quartile? Well, quartiles are, you know, as the name suggests, quarter. So it's 25%, it's right? So there are four quartiles, Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4. So for every subject, if we create a list of journals according to their impact factors, then the top 25% journals will be called quartile one journals. The next 25% journals, the, the uh, next lower category will be called quartile two. And if we go 25% lower, it will be quartile three. And the last quarter is called quartile four. So in short, the uh, highest quartile is quartile one and the lowest quartile is quartile four, Q4, okay? This is all according to impact factor. Now you can actually compare journals from different subject areas. So, uh, you know, a journal from chemistry, which is having an impact factor of let's say 21, which is very high according to chemistry would be quartile four, uh, sorry, quartile one. It is quartile one because it is very high. However, in if, if we pick up another journal from the subject of let's say medicine or maybe cancer research and its impact factor is also 21, However, although the impact factor is the same, but it will be uh, it will be put in Q4. It will go to quartile four because in the subject of cancer research, uh, you know this particular journal is very low as compared to other journals. So it will go to Q4. So same impact factor journals can go to different quartiles, right? It again depends on the uh, subject areas. So that is the concept of quartile. Uh, and here you look at the second example, OncoTarget. Again, this journal caters to two subject categories, cell biology and oncology, different quartiles. So if you're a student of oncology, well, uh, this particular journal is good because it belongs to quartile one. But if you're a student of cell biology, then OncoTarget is not such a good journal because it belongs to the second highest category, which is quartile two, right? So I'll, uh, other examples are also based on the same logic. So I'll just skip that part. Now here, this is exactly what I was saying about quartiles. Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4. The top 25% of the GIF distribution, general impact factor distribution is called quartile one, okay? And the lowest one is the quartile four. As we move on, now there are a lot of fake impact factors floating in the market. If you just run a search on Google uh, by writing impact factor, you'll see so many agencies which have now come up, right? It is not surprising actually for us because you know anything that becomes popular, people tend to copy it. 
right? And the same thing has happened with impact factor. Uh, but be very careful. Uh, we are the only agency which allocates impact factors to journals, okay? So uh, selection of, uh, you know, journals can be very tricky at times. It all depends on what you are really looking for, right? So if your requirement is something like this, I look for internationally recognized journals. If that is your requirement, then we have just the parameter for you. Uh, on JCR, Journal Citation Reports, we have something called as, uh, you know, uh, you have to use Web of Science or JCR to find high quality international journals. And you can actually do it using JCR. If you really want to publish in journals with high rank and prestige, well, find uh, journal ranking and percentile and quartiles in JCR, right? Again, I've already mentioned about uh, rankings and percentiles and quartiles to you. So this is what you can do using JCR. Uh, if you really want to aim for journals that uh, get cited very quickly, I'm sure every researcher out there wants, wants that, every author wants that, that your research should get cited at the earliest. Well, in that case, you should be looking for journals having high immediacy index, right? This is the parameter that you should be following. And on JCR, we capture that as well. I want to publish in journals uh, that get cited for a long time, right? Of course, this is another requirement which many authors have, right? You'll be surprised. Many of the, no if you pick up any paper of any Nobel Prize laureate and you go through the references that they may have used in that Nobel winning paper. Uh, well, you will realize that they've cited papers from very old journals at times, right? So there are some journals which get cited over a long period of time. They, they maintain a lot of consistency as well as citations, right? If that is something you're looking for, then you should be looking for cited half-life. That is the metric you should use. And how can I find the related uh, list of journals? use citing and cited journals. All these parameters are captured on JCR and this is an example of a screenshot that we generate on JCR. Uh, for any particular journal, this is what we capture, right? And the year is there. If you look at the columns, the key indicators year, and then you have the total citations, the impact factor, the impact factor without uh, self citations, the five year impact factor. And here is the immediacy index. Right. I don't know if it's the right word, but it measures the cutting edgeness of a particular uh, journal, right? So how soon or how immediate is the citation that it tends to receive, right? That is what is measured by this immediacy index. So higher immediacy index means more quickly uh, would your paper get cited if it gets published in this journal, right? And then we've got eigenfactor score uh, and a lot of other parameters that you can follow. Then we have the manuscript matcher. Now, this is an excellent feature on EndNote. In fact, personally, this is one of my favorites, and I'll tell you why. Right. Now, the biggest challenge which researchers have these days, especially young researchers, right? Uh, I don't really want to uh, teach anything to seasoned researchers. I'm sure they know already what they have to, but uh, when we talk of young researchers, the biggest dilemma that they face is, where should I publish? They may have knowledge of the journals in their research area, right? May, and if you ask any young researcher that, okay, if you publish a paper, where would you pub, uh, which journal will you select? They may rattle out a couple of names, right? Maybe four or five journals. However, which among those journals is the right match for your particular paper? That again becomes a challenge. And this is exactly the problem that we solve using the manuscript matcher on EndNote, right? We call it the match feature on EndNote. So it, were, it is actually a very simple mechanism. All you're required to do is enter your manuscript details. If you look at the upper half of your screen of this slide, it says, enter your manuscript details. You just have to pull up your paper. So this really works only if you have written your paper and it is complete in all respects, which means you should have a manuscript ready for you, re ready in hand, right? So from your manuscript, just copy paste the title here in this field. And again, from your manuscript, copy paste the 
abstract. So these are the only two things that we require. And you, when, when you click on find journals, it gives you uh, a display like this, right? If you look at the lower half of the screen, you will see this. It displays the journals that it finds most suitable for your kind of paper. So these are the journals. In the center, you have the journal names, right? And two of these are actually open access. You see that open access symbol in orange. And then you have various other things that you can look at, various other parameters that you can look at, and you can decide where you would want to publish. And here in this case, there is no right or wrong answer, right? Many people like to follow the impact factor. So you have, we display the impact factors there for you. If you are a person who believes in impact factors, then you can choose the one which is the highest, right? Or if you are someone who believes in open access, you can choose accordingly. So there is no really, you know, right or wrong answer here. It depends on your personal preference. And we even have, if you focus towards the extreme right of the lower half, there is an option of submit highlighted in blue. So we even give you the option of submitting directly to this journal, right? And this is one very important USP of uh, EndNote. It does not really mean that, you know, uh, you can submit, uh, your paper will get submitted and accepted. It simply takes you to the place where the submission process will actually start, right? So there is no guarantee that your paper will be accepted. However, you know, the key thing that often people tend to ignore is we take you to the correct web page of that particular journal and you can start your submission process from there which is actually a very important step, actually more important than even getting published. Why? Because we always take you, our algorithms are designed in a way that we take you to the right place, to the right uh, journal, and you can start your submission process from there, right? We never take you to a predatory web page. There are no predatory journals, there are only predatory websites, predatory web pages, right? And these days they are getting smarter and smarter. Right, they design their web pages in a way that it looks very similar and very genuine, right? And people often get confused and they by mistake end up submitting the papers there. So our algorithms can actually identify between a, uh, you know, a predatory journal and a genuine journal. So this submit icon, this submit link on the right-hand side will always take you to the genuine website of that particular journal, right? Okay. Moving on. So it helps you find the best fit journals for your manuscript. Okay, and we've already uh, spoken about this. Match feature takes you to the actual journal website. Okay, predatory journals, predatory publishing. Predatory publishers, they exploit the gold open access model for their own profit. Like I said, initially, there is a very thin line that uh, you know divides uh, an open access journal and a predatory journal because oh, in, in gold open access, uh, you can read through this on Google, but in, in the gold open access model, uh, authors are required to pay an APC, the article processing charges, which means the author has to pay first to get their uh, research accepted in that journal. And then after that, the peer review process will go through. And if it is, if it, uh, you know, clears the peer review process, then obviously it gets published. However, in case of predatory journals, they adopt a similar model. They may give it different, uh, you know, uh, fancy names like, uh, uh, you know, administrative charges or processing charges or something like that. Some fancy name would be there, but the uh, the idea behind their intention is uh, is to, you know, just extract money and then publish, or at times may even not publish. They take advantage of exploit and pander with scholarly authors. They pretend to be legitimate copying established and restricted journals, websites, and practices. Okay, many do a poor or a fake peer review. One uh, good example of uh, finding out whether it is a poetry journal or not is to look at their editors, right? Uh, normally, if you go to a good open access journal, they will always display the names of the editors they have on their panel. Uh, the peer review committee would be shown there and you can look at their details and you know their credentials in many predatory journals they generally do not have any uh, you know details of their reviewers 
that could be one red flag that you uh, that is raised and you could understand that it's it's actually a predatory journal so uh, this is a good slide uh, how it can damage science right so increase in published uh, published research misconduct such as plagiarism now i will not read through all the bullet points you can actually go through this i'll uh, maybe pause for a moment Okay, uh, let's just proceed. So complications that arise, right? So here are a few complications, uh, you know. Uh, now, what we're talking here, we're talking of is, you know, uh, having similar names. What are the complications that, that may arise? Many people have exactly the same name and is a commonly observed problem. Even many institutions have similar problems, right? So I'll just give an example here of uh, one, Mr. Uh, one Dr. Lee. So as you can see, there are three people having exactly the same name intentional. Oh, okay. okay. So as you can see, there are three are people having, uh, there is some disturbance. Okay. As you can see, there are three people having exactly the same name here. Right, uh, and and as you as you can also appreciate, uh, all all seem to be uh, belonging to a different profession, right? So this is a, a very you know basic example uh, in trying to explain what uh, author ambiguity really is, right? Of course, we have a session uh, later today on uh, Orchid, but this is just coming towards that. People having, you know, similar names, what problems can arise? Now, this is a problem which is commonly observed uh, all across the world, right? And it also uh, runs across different, uh, you know, uh, uh, different people. For example, here, uh, the two people here initially are uh, men and the third one is a woman, right? So it applies across genders as well, the name ambiguity problem, right? Uh, in India, we have some very common names like, you know, Ajay, Vijay, Amit, Ashish, you know, these kind of people are, you know, they're so, these names are so common. I don't blame uh, uh, anyone, but, you know, these problems exist. Some surnames are very common, like Singh, Kumar, Sharma, my surname is Sharma, it's very common, right? So people tend to have same names. And when they publish research, publish their papers with those names, there could be other researchers having exactly the same name. So that is the problem which arises, right? And there is one solution to that. It is called ORCID. So the problem of same name leads to confusion in uh, author names. And these names further leads to complications when it comes to taking credits, credits of publications and citations, right? So ORCID is the solution for that. It's a unique 16 digit number. And I urge everyone to, you know, uh, register on Orchid. It is a free website and you can generate your 16 digit number. And uh, this will uh, make sure that this problem does not arise. So it becomes your identity for the rest of your life. So just the way you state your name, you should also state your Orchid number because it is always unique. No two people can have the same number. So with that, I would like to end my uh, talk here, and I'm open to any questions if there are. Thank you, thank you so much, Mr. Sarma sir, for providing all the details related to the uh, journals and uh, variety of that, and clear definition about the open access as well as of uh, how one can basically apply uh, in a specific way to the specific journal through the quartile modes. So uh, I hope uh, that uh, every point uh, you mentioned is so uh, very clear to all of the, uh, the scholars, especially young scholars, those who are basically attending first time this approach. So uh, uh, there is a question basically uh, when we are talking about to the uh, quartiles uh, in this right. basically, you filter uh, the journals as per this subject, right? Yes, as per this but uh, sometimes we had also observed uh, a multidisciplinary uh, uh, 
uh, journal also and they also correct. lie into uh, different different uh, uh, quarters correct one is according to the subject uh, maybe in uh, q2 maybe in q4 like that right so how basically at that time uh, one have to decide uh, the journal uh, your intake or your some idea actually about it. right uh, that's a, a fair question and actually i had a slide on this here it is if you focus on the screen it's right there if you look at the second example on the left hand side uh, onco target it 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 is a it is an example of a multidisciplinary journal and so is the third example on the top right right so this is a very common practice within journals these days that uh, they tend to have papers from different subject areas we call them multidisciplinary journals now in case of onco target uh, it contains papers related to cell biology as well as oncology right and as you can see the quartiles are different in both the cases so how do we select it depends on the researcher so if the researcher is from the subject area of oncology then for you this is a good journal because it is a quartile one journal however if you're a student of cell biology then it is in the second highest category it is quartile two right so uh, these quartiles are different according to different subject areas and you just uh, need to check uh, what subject area you belong to and uh, the corresponding quartile uh, related to it. So that will answer your problem. Good. Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, second thing is, uh, if uh, this is true, I will, actually I want to focus on this slide because I want when the scholar decide the journal, right? So at that time, they, their idea, their concept should be very clear. Yeah. So, First thing you had made it clear, and now the second point in terms of the multidisciplinary, if they are interested, uh, so they have to check it, right? As per the Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, along with right. the one slide you had mentioned where the impact factor you had shown, right? Yes, and I want to again highlight that point. Uh, you had made it very clear that the impact factor of the more suitable journal was less as compared to the other journal, which were which were basically was not more suitable. Uh, there was some original uh, uh, oh. part. Okay, is this the slide you're referring to? Manuscript, and not manuscript uh, uh, matcher. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll just come to that. Manuscript matcher, uh, this one. Yeah. Again, uh, I want to highlight actually this point, if someone did not catch it. So it depends on the scholars. Right, but basically, yes, he, yeah, yeah. Here, uh, second one is more suitable uh, with respect to first one, but the impact factor is the lower side as compared yeah. to uh, other journal, which basically at the bottom side they have uh, five impact factor here. Yeah. So, uh, right, uh, uh, and uh, uh, because uh, uh, there are uh, different journals uh, possibility here as per the subject and it might be because of the keywords they had considered into the abstract and that is the most important point uh, when a uh, scholar basically uh, write the research article can you say something about it on the keywords basically because of that all sure. these uh, in, uh, sure in the, fact uh, in the interest of time i did not actually explain this slide in detail but uh, i'm happy that you uh, raised this question now here we give uh, researchers a lot of options to choose from it basically depends on what you as a researcher are interested in right for example now we've designed this platform in a way that you know it it will suit everybody's need for example if you're a researcher who focuses more on keyword matches right how far is the keyword matching within my paper how does it match against the journal if that is the criteria you have in mind then the extreme left you, you would see match score. Higher match score mean, means higher keyword matches, right? It makes your paper more discoverable. If somebody is doing a search based on keywords, your paper becomes more discoverable in that search. Uh, then if uh, there are researchers who focus more on impact factor, we have the second column there, right? Which is on impact factor. So uh, you can decide according to your liking. It doesn't need any explanation, higher impact factors or lower impact factors, whatever you uh, want, you can choose accordingly. However, 
there is never a single journal where you'll get all the parameters high, right? You'll never find a journal which has high mass score, high impact factor, open access, high similar articles. You'll never get such a journal. You'll have to make compromises here and there. So it depends what you want, right? There are researchers who would want uh, to publish in open access. In this example, there are two journals which are open access. So how do we decide within those two journals? Okay. There are two journals, you can see which one has higher impact factor or probably which one has higher match score, right? Accordingly, you can decide. Now, the last parameter that I want to talk about is actually the most important, why it is very helpful for research scholars. Now, mostly research scholars are in a hurry to get published, right? Uh, many institutions have this criteria that uh, during your PhD, you have to publish at least two or maybe three papers in high quality journals, right? So in order to get, uh, you know, in a hurry to get published, they, you know, this is the biggest problem and this is the uh, place where they go wrong most of the time. They tend to publish in any random journal just for the sake of getting published. Please don't do that. Now, similar articles here, you would see numbers there, zeros, ones, twos, et cetera. This simply means, now, if you look at the example, the third from, from the last, the, uh, the journal called RSC Advances, it has one against it. What does this one really mean? It means there is one paper which is similar to your paper and it has already been published in this particular journal, right? How do we know that it is similar? Because if you look at the upper half of the slide, we've already uh, read through your title and your abstract and we know that your paper is similar to this other paper, right? It It is, uh, you know, uh, a ballpark estimate, it gives you a rough idea that your paper has more chances of getting selected in this journal called RSE Advances because the number is one there. There is one paper which is already published and it is very similar to your paper, right? So higher numbers, higher number of similar articles means more probability. It is just a probability, guys. Do not take it as a guarantee, right? In publishing, there is no guarantee. So it, higher similar articles means just higher probability of getting published in that journal because those many papers are already published, right? So you can choose any parameter from this and accordingly select. So if I'm a PhD scholar, I would go with RSC advances. I will not really uh, uh, give much, weight, much weightage to match score. Uh, impact factor is fairly good, 3.040, but there is one similar article already. So I have higher chances of getting my paper published here and that is what I'll choose. If I'm a very senior researcher or a faculty member, I would rather go with higher impact factor. If I'm a person who is uh, wanting to get my research more uh, visible to a larger audience, I would select open access, right? So it all depends on what you want from your paper. Uh, one more question. Uh, yes, sir. Sir. yes, sir. Yes, uh, sir. Uh, your uh, slides basically uh, contain many good information and uh, we require some more time. But right, here uh, I had noticed that when you giving an example of the uh, old published uh, article and people is still uh, citing that article and uh, yes. covered, I think in to be cited half life. Yes, sir. So uh, where you defined uh, the immediacy index or, and many other things. So at that time you define this cited half uh, life. So my question, uh, just my uh, curiosity, uh, uh, does this uh, factor contribute in any way to the impact of the journal in addition to the impact factor like in terms of the quartile calculations? Uh, well, not really, because uh, as we've really seen this, now suppose there is a journal which let's, I'm just taking a hypothetical example. Suppose a journal got published in the year, let's say 2005 right, which is being cited even in the year 2022, 2022 in the current year, right? It's an old journal, right, 2005. However, so, so it, it does not really have any, uh, you know, impact on the, it does not have any, you know, uh, link or any weightage on the impact factor, because if I scroll up, uh, I, I had discussed this, impact factor calculation depends on the That's current year and the previous two years. Right. So if I have to calculate the impact factor for the year 2021, I will consider the previous two years, only 2020 and 2019. So the citations received by uh, that particular journal or that particular paper, which was published in the year 2005, 
will have mm. absolutely no impact mm. right we are only talking of see look at the denominator here we are looking at the publications that happened in the previous two years we are not talking of publications that happened in the year 2005 which is 10 or 15 years old we are not really bothered about that right so it is just that the paper will receive citations which is okay but it has no impact on the calculation of the impact factor in quartile quartile impact, impact factor impact factor which uh, obviously relates to the quartile right okay. because okay. quartiles are decided on the basis of impact factors okay. right. so everything is fine and uh, thank yes, you so much sir right, sir wonderful it's been, and informative uh, talk thank you uh, sir thank, thank you sir it's been a pleasure thank you everyone and have a good day thank you and now uh, i invite uh, dr santosh agarwala sir uh, head uh, of the department of physics from the fakir mohan university uh, to introduce the uh, next speaker uh, uh, dr anubhav pardhan uh, over to you santosh sir thank you dr sushil good morning all am i audible yes so it is uh, a great pleasure uh for me uh be a part of this uh, conference so thank you for giving me a chance to introduce this uh, session uh research person dr anubhav so he is now working as a assistant professor in the department of liberal arts indian institute of technology bhilai his work struggles urban planning heritage history and writing as well as colonial cultural contact and the intersections of empire and modernity he is also served as deputy director of south asia research council member of the committee for publication ethics and board member of the association for literary urban studies his major publications include articulating urbanity writing the south asian city which is a forthcoming uh that means uh, it is coming in 2023 then literature language and the classroom ss for pramodini verma already published in 2021 kipling and yeats at 150 retrospectives and perspectives he has also designed and anchored elective workshops at the indian institute for human settlements at bangalore cpt university ahmedabad school of environment and architecture mumbai and taught at ambedkar university delhi south asian university jamia millia islamia university delhi and the university of delhi he also served as the senior marketing editor uh, in primus books delhi so thank you sir for accepting uh, the invitation from the organizer for this session so i welcome on behalf of the organizer as well as on behalf of me to present in this session thank you all thank you very much dr agarwal and uh, thank you everybody for being here um, good morning uh, allow me to begin by thanking dr sushil kumar our excellent host today uh, for putting together this you know very rich and dynamic conference i am glad to be representing the council committee for publication ethics scope in this forum today um i think conferences such as this do a good job at reinvigorating the debate on publication ethics within the indian context uh we close a reference to blog international trends and discussions i do not have a ppt i uh, prefer not to have ppts when i can uh, manage without them because i i like speaking to people more than just you know uh, having something to show and i want to talk about something um, which i thought does not require as much of a present it, it, it requires more of discussion it requires more of thinking perhaps The topic of my presentation today is uh, publish and perish rankings research and the humanities. Let me begin by uh, you know telling you a very small story. In the 1960s, a bright young lecturer from Delhi had gone over to the US to do his PhD. The title or the topic of his PhD was the influence of Shakespeare on William Butler Yeats's writings. Now William Butler Yeats is a very uh, very important uh, author and poet and playwright in uh, in British literature. I should also specify that my disciplinary background is actually literature. 
Like I do a lot of urban studies work, but I come from the discipline of literature. Um, so this, you know, this young lecturer in the 1960s went to the US to do his PhD. Uh, Yeeks was a very important figure in the literary canon at that time. And Shakespeare, of course, had been Shakespeare for a very long time. You know, this, everybody knows about Shakespeare. Shakespeare was very important. So this young man went on to write a very brilliant thesis on these two very brilliant authors, came back to India, and had a long and illustrious career as a professor in the Department of English at the University of Delhi. Sometime in the late 70s, he started publishing a journal on Shakespeare's play Hamlet and continued this journal single-handedly till 2004. He also published in the early 1970s a monograph on his PhD, and that remains one of the most uh, foundational texts in this field, even today. The journal he published, Hamlet's Curries, was one of the longest running journals on a single Shakespearean text. However, in a career of public life and letters stretching very over six decades now, very over 60 years, this professor has published only three books and only half a dozen articles, and only six research articles, so to say. I am not going to name any names, you know, this is not appropriate, but uh, this is, anybody who's from the future will know that this is very, very respected and very venerable member of our community. Let us move on. Around 20 years ago, in the late 2000s, actually around 15 years ago, another black young man from Bihar came to Gary to pursue his higher education in literature. This person had a smooth transition from the undergraduate to the postgraduate degree, and he was talented. He got a, he secured a position as a PhD scholar in one of the best universities in the country. Nonetheless, given the precarity and the informality in the job market, this is something we don't often talk about, but this is good, right? Given the precarity of the job market in higher education, he was not able to get a single teaching appointment despite being talented and everything not even on a temporary or contractual or guest basis. Around 2013, those of us who are in teaching in India will remember, this is around the time, around 10 years ago, that the union government had introduced API. Right? Uh, API and other performance metrics were not there in the higher education system around 20 years ago. Not in the same way, we had certain indicators, but not these point-based indicators. So the central government revamped the appointments and promotion system for lecturers and professors and linked it to a point-based assessment of their publications and conferences. Now this young man was very good as a researcher, but he became acutely conscious of the need to publish in order to make it to a stable and new position. Over the span of the past six years, this person went on to publish 12 research articles, 12 research articles, in six years, in journals and books, all of which were from, you know, the usual suspects, the big multinational publishers, your Taylor and Francis, your Sage, you know, the usual people, all reputed international publishers. This man is now, finally, he has received tenure at a reputed university in South India. I will again not take a name, but only add that this man is a junior of mine. I am also not very old, I am also not very senior, but this man is a junior of mine. You know, let us think a little about this. You know, let us think about what it says about the kind of scholarly world we live in, you know, as lecturers, as professors, as scholars. What is this kind of world that we are living in? Both the scholars I have referred to are very inventive and original. You know, one of them has already made an indelible mark in the community, the senior professor I referred to. While the other is very on his way to making a mark, within the scholarly community. Yet, if that senior professor was to seek for an interview today, he would probably not get a job. He would probably be found wanting. Only one of his books was from an international publisher. None of his papers appeared in any of the big ticket journals. Judge on today's standards, he would fall woefully short of the benchmark that is now the norm in our, if I may, industry. Academia is also industry. He would perhaps feel a niggling pressure to put himself out there, to find quick ways, like Mr. Sharma was also suggesting, scholars are in a rush to publish quickly. So perhaps our senior professor would also 
think of quick ways to become published to find topics and journals which would have a quick turnaround. All of us know to get published in a good journal, it takes at least two to three years. Right? Uh, in my own journal in South Asia Research, that is the turnaround that we have. We, we receive around 250 submissions in a year and we get, reject around 90% of them. Right? We, there is gimmick space, there are too many submissions. The pandemic has also increased the number of submissions that are coming. So all of this is good. That senior professor, if he was in the job market today, might feel the need to network a little aggressively. You know, try and get himself on the board of some journal or association. He might even frame his research to make it more publishable. All of us know, we may not acknowledge it very openly, but all of us know certain topics are more publishable than other topics. You know, certain topics are more, you know, considered more relevant than other topics. Like, work is more attractive to publishers and journals. And this happens. People sometimes choose a research area, keeping in mind how quickly it would be possible for them to get published. Welcome to academic publishing today. This is the world that we live in. A very high stakes and high pressure game of connections, luck and merit in that specific order. I firmly believe it is connections, luck and merit. Merit comes last. A lot of has been a lot of has you know a lot has been spoken and written about the publish or perish conundrum in contemporary academia. We are all familiar with publish or perish. So I will not take up your time trying to go over familiar ground, over which a considerable amount of collective angst, whether you are in the States, whether you are in China, whether you are in France, everybody is you know very worried or concerned about this whole publish or perish dilemma. However, looking at the Indian context, we are, many of us are based in India right now. And I, of course, can talk much better about the Indian context. Uh, I want to suggest a slight variation of this model, which is perhaps more responsive to local conditions here. It is not publish or perish, but publish and perish. And I think this is true, especially of my discipline, which is literature and many other disciplines in the humanities. I, I'm making a proviso that I'm speaking largely of the humanities. I'm making the humanities largely of literature. Let me explain what I mean by this. Let us consider another hypothetical situation. There is faculty recruitment, which is happening uh, for the SSKM professor level, which is the starting level in an institute of national importance somewhere in North India. Now the selection criteria in such institutions, you know, institutions of national importance, all of us know which kind of institutions I'm talking about, uh, they are not necessarily required to follow the UGC or ministry norms, right? There is an autonomy, the autonomy can be exercised and institutions can come up with their own criteria in keeping with their specific requirements and also aspirations. Now, let us say this institute is listed in the National Institutional Ranking Framework, NIRF, but it wants to be amongst the top 10. It is not yet amongst the top 10 in the NIRF ranking. So this institute decides that in order to attract the most competent and talented, the best candidates, and to do this fairly, it must quantify its assessment metrics and create points and cutoffs for all aspects of a candidate's performance the candidates marks in all the exams and degrees from like say class tank to PhD. Where did they do the PhD from? Because then there are marks for that also. And which kind of journals they have published in and how are these journals ranked? Furthermore, to make this framework more objective, this, this institute decides to fully adopt the SkyMago rankings as a benchmark to go by. And candidates will need at least one Q1 publication, not Q2, Q3, not Q3, one Q1 publication at least to be shortlisted to get to the interview stage. It is not sufficient to just apply. You will have to be shortlisted also. Right? Think about all this. Now, obviously, all of this minutia is not mentioned in the advertisement, by the way. Like, all of this selection criteria is not mentioned uh, in the websites. It is not in the public domain. So most candidates don't have a way of knowing this unless they are insiders or they have some inside information. 
Now, you can say there is a meritorious candidate from the discipline of English literature. That meritorious candidate may have published in the journal Indian Literature. The journal Indian Literature is the official journal of the Psyche Academy, which is an autonomous institution by the Ministry of uh, Culture in India. Like it's one of the central academies of literature in India. And the journal Indian Literature is one of the most respected platform for letters in India. It's been running uh, for more than 60 to 70 years now. Perhaps the candidate may have published in one of the university journals. Many universities in India also have journals. Right? Uh, you can say JJCA, the Jadapur University Journal of Comparative Literature. Now the Jadapur University Department of Comparative Literature is one of the most respected departments of comparative literature, not only in India, but the world. Right? JJCA is the first Journal of Comparative Literature in Asia. It has been publishing continuously for over five decades. It is an institution in its own right. It's, it's very prestigious to get published in that journal. Or perhaps this candidate could have published in many of the association journals. There are many, as professors, as scholars, we have many associations. And some of those associations have their own journals. Uh, there is a journal called Forkel. Those of us who, for example, teach English language, like I teach English language in my institution. So English language and English as a secondary language for ELT and ESL, Forkel is one of the most respected platforms. It has been around for more than three decades. It is the central most important platform of research and scholarly community in this field. Yet, this meritorious candidate of ours could have published in any of these journals but his application would still be rejected because none of these journals figure in SkyMap. Like, they are not part of the international rankings game. Such candidates who might have risen through the ranks from within the Indian education system, they may have followed their professor's advice. Their professor would have told them, go and publish in Indian literature, go and publish in Jadapur University Journal. They would still be considered undeserving simply because these journals are not considered good enough according to one third party ranking. Right. Now this is the situation I want to draw your attention to works and open dialogue on this through this conference. What many scholars and professors in the humanities increasingly face today is a situation of not publish or perish, but publish and perish. Over the past decades, since the introduction of API, there has been an explosion of academic publishing in this country. All of us know this. Um, overnight distributors, you know, they, they, they would be these book distributors who would come to your library and, you know, sell you books. And suddenly these guys became publishers. Suddenly people put together editorial boards. Suddenly whole new journals were launched. Like so many journals have come up over the past 10 years. There's been an explosion of uh, academic writing. Perhaps not research, but academic writing at least over the past 10 to 15 years. And you could pay, let's say, 500 rupees, 800 rupees, 1500 rupees, 2000 rupees as processing fees and get published in any of these journals. Right? And the turnaround would be perhaps a month or two months. Yeah? A lot of work has been done on this at COPE. Uh, and many other places, many other, many of our industry partners have done work on this, on, on what we call predatory journals and paper mills. This remains one of the most pressing challenges in the field, as some of us have already said. And I will not go into all of that right now. Um, within our context in India, the UGC woke up to the, you know, the Frankenstein's monster it had accidentally created and it sought to cleanse the field by creating its own list of acceptable journals. All of us are, all, again, familiar with this list. We are familiar with what happened when the list was announced, and there were many loopholes, there were many gaps. That list was followed by another risk, and yet another risk. And now, if I'm not mistaken, the process has become dynamic. Like right? It is open to revision, which is, I think, a good thing. Such risks have to be revised. They have to be periodically assessed. But what it, the impact this had was multi pronged right? It had a dual impact, if I may. On one hand, the established and competent journals strengthened their ethics procedures and protocols and created benchmarks for 
a certain kind of competence in scholarly publishing right so many of the journals which i have mentioned and many others which i have not mentioned um get get strengthened their processes right get get became more aware of the need for mainstreaming ethics in research publishing many of the you know new and upcoming journals or i should say some of the new and upcoming journals actually also pull up their socks and mainstream the ethics discourse in order to make the cut in an increasingly crowded marketplace of publishing but on the other hand the terms of the debate also started shifting towards not just national but international competition like right? this was orchestrated by various governmental dispensations as a move towards transparency efficiency and accountability in research but what has happened is that there is a growing abandonment at least in the humanities if i may of home grown platforms right? of journals which are published by xa our own universities and associations within this country right like, uh, this 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 shift and transition is going towards global ones you know global platforms uh, international uh, publishers um or journals which are risking of big international publishers journals which has some kind of global accreditation or recognition 15 years ago very few of us perhaps had heard of scopus or sky mago all of us are very familiar with that today um we did not think of times rankings 20 years ago but you know that is now a byword and a fam very familiar bug bear in the narrow corridors of the ivory tower that is academics now this is something which will not seem like a very big deal to those in the sciences and medicine and i know many of us today here are from the sciences or engineering or perhaps even from medicine but and and, be and because you know this this process has been it started largely in the sciences in medicine and many of the professors and supervisors were already aware that there is a need to publish in high ranked journals there is a need to publish in visible journals and the entire ecosystem was moving towards that direction however in the humanities and in literature specifically this is still coming somewhat of a shock and this was largely unprecedented like uh, i remember when it was announced the policy i was a lecturer in a delhi university college and even the you know principal or the you know senior faculty of the college had not published in any journals many of the professors in delhi university's departments had not published in journals okay so this came as a very unprecedented move um as i pointed out almost no journal in the field of literature published from india figures in sky mago rankings for whichever reasons but that does that mean that there are no good journals in india does that mean that we are incapable of ethical publishing does that mean that there is no good research happening in india please do not consider what i am saying as a harang against rankings and performance indicators i am not against ranking right i will say that some of us or at least many of us have a nostalgia for the google days when you could be a professor and you could have a illustrious career and still publish two or three books in your entire life many of us can look to our own professors in literature in social sciences even in the sciences even in engineering think about so many of the senior iit professors who retired let's say 10 years 20 years ago and think about how many books or papers they have published right but nostalgia apart all of us know the world has changed too much for that situation to come back um what i'm sharing with you today comes not for some sort of nostalgia for the past but a very uh, you know very active concern for the future rankings and assessment are necessary today there is no doubt about that there is no way around that there is simply too much predation there are too many malpractices there is too much which is happening for us to say that okay why should we have ranking why should we have all of this we need informed and rigorous gatekeeping assessment is a kind of gatekeeping if i can speak a little informally and that is required to prevent the sector or the field from becoming 
for over overthrown by the malpractices which you know so many of these malpractices we we observe regularly at cope so many of these malpractices are very common in academia yet what i want to say is that we have to be participatory and responsive any kind of rankings framework a ranking framework is necessary but such a framework must be participatory and responsive it must take into consideration the very real and varied and subjective conditions which inform research across disciplines today all over the world right and such a framework must reflect the struggle it's a very difficult thing to actually take into account diversity it is much more easy to create a standardized template you know the same template for medicine the same template for engineering the same template for sociology the same template for uh, literature it is much more difficult it, it, it requires much more effort to acknowledge that look each discipline has a separate history a separate way of functioning for legitimate reasons right and therefore those ways of functioning must be acknowledged while strengthening the research procedure again this is one of a one of the active steps which we are taking at cope today we are trying to acknowledge the difference between disciplines and ensure that there is no standardization in the ethics debate and dialogue globally what has happened instead in our context in india is that there has been a hasty pursuit of what is supposed to be world class excellence right and that world class excellence is supposed to be largely quantified right uh through third party rankings and the haste with which this has happened this has perhaps not been able to take into account many of the extraneous factors which act fundamentally upon a scholar's productivity a scholar's access to funding a scholar's access to tenure even a scholar's access to a simple library a jstor at membership or you know archives right to data once again let me speak let me let me give you an example consider the case of a gifted young woman who comes from a very small town in bihar right um all the education of this woman has been from state government colleges and universities but somehow she manages to impress a selection committee and secures a seat in the phd program of a central university or an institute of national importance now this woman knows that there is something called publishing she knows that it is useful and important but she has not had any exposure to the rigors of academic writing despite having done a ba or ma despite going through all the stages she still has no exposure right suddenly when this woman joins a phd program in a central university she is expected not only to finish her phd within 3 years right now that is increasing the expectation 3 years you should finish the phd but also churn out one or two research papers to be published in so called top ranked journals as per stimago or scopus now can we wish she not be able to submit her phd without this she will also be placed disadvantageously in the job market without such a publication or two to back her candidature there are many such examples we can think of um for many of us english is not the primary language i know many scholars in india struggle for example in my own journal in south asia research we actively try to not make uh the english of the submissions which come to us as a benchmark to reject journal reject submissions like right? our focus is that if a, if an author has displayed originality we are willing to handhold and guide that author into improving their language skills we take out the can like i i personally do that but let us be honest how many journals are interested in doing that how many people uh how many editors are willing to take out time for that let us be honest how many of us are have uh, the utmost confidence to write a research paper of 8000 words in impeccable english professional english how many of us have taken professional help in you know and then gone through various looks gone through various kinds of processes 
there, you know, there's, there's all this informal market. There's an entire informal copywriting, proofreading, editing, even writing industry, what is called paper mills. And all of us know people who have taken that help. All of us know people who have done that. My point is not that I'm saying a black and white thing. Yes, paper mills are bad. But the condition for paper mills, the condition for predation, the condition for my practices are there because there is a precarity in the industry. I'm, I'm deliberately using the word industry. Many scholars are uncomfortable with their work, with academia being described as an industry. But I think uh, we should be a little more honest. It is an industry. It is a specific kind of occupation, but it is an industry. Um, one can think of many such examples, right? They, they, are, they are examples of, say, Dalit scholars who may could have come from villages, right? And for whom, let's say, Malayalam is the first language. And they want to work on Malayali cinema, right? And again, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I know of all these instances. Um, but they have to ultimately write their PhD in English. They have to ultimately publish in English. How is that person supposed to compete with a person who may be, let's say, from a metropolitan city like Bombay or Delhi, who may have gone to English media? Uh, one at your end, everything is fine. Or uh, I think uh, this is the problem at the Anubha. At the end of Anubha, I think there is a network problem, I suppose. Yeah, it means the rest of the persons are active. That means uh, my platform is working for me. Yes, yeah. This is a network. By the way, points are good uh, from the doctor on, on both side. Actually, there is a gap uh, that I had observed. Earlier, uh, uh, we had discussed with the library person, library representative to make uh, to very try to, yeah, yeah, yeah. welcome yeah, back. Very, very sorry about some. Oh, it's fine. I was trying to kill the time. <laughs> okay, please go ahead. Yeah, I'm just, I'm just about to finish my, my presentation today. I, I, I want to end with iterating that the process has to be participatory. It has to be contextual. It has to be responsive and enabling. As long as we keep on pushing a standardized idea of even ethics. And again, that is a conversation that we are internally having at COPE, and it will come out very soon in the public domain. There must be a benchmark, but the benchmark must take into consideration local conditions. It must take into consideration local histories. It must take into consideration disciplinary specialities and particularities. I'll give you one small example. For example, in the sciences and in medicine, it is very, very common to have multi-authored papers. Right? In my discipline, people work alone. <laughs> you would be hard pressed to find people. It would be considered strange to have four or five authors writing the same paper in a discipline like English literature. Whereas you would be hard pressed to find a single author paper in the sciences. Now, just because an English paper does not have five authors, should it be considered unsound. Like, so there are many, many kinds of disciplinary, uh, you know, specific, uh, you know, traditions, specialities, and those have to be taken into consideration as we strengthen the discourse about ethics in research and publishing. And as we work with partners in the industry, we as scholars, as we work with partners in the industry, whether they are COPE, whether they are SkyMago, whether they are different journals, and we try and make sure that 
there is an inclusive framework for many different kinds of platforms to also be figured in. Right? Now, this is not some process which, you know, this is, a, this is an ideal perhaps. It is very difficult to, uh, for one institution, for one, you know, university, for one journal, for one organization to initiate it. But I think they are very encouraging signs of a global conversation on this which has started. I remember you, you correct uh, brought out a paper on this last year in which this started talking about this. And I think moving forward, if more and more of us are open to talking about this, are open to acknowledging that there is diversity and there is a need for inclusion even in the process of assessment, then I think there will be a structural change which will be enabling. Right now, we have created structures which are keeping people out. We want a rankings framework. We should have a rankings framework which enable people, which allow them to come in. On that, I would like to conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anubhav Pardhan. To put uh, the content in terms of the Indian uh, perspective, and you uh, bring out the genuine problem. Uh, personally, I feel that, uh, 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 that there is a gap between the uh, uh, library and uh, lit literary uh, work and uh, all the humanities and sciences. And uh, earlier, actually, uh, the, first of all, let me know, uh, let me introduce about the conference. The purpose of this conference was to bring out the technical points related to the research as well as how the publishers and other factors are working in this, uh, in this domain. Right, uh, so uh, different expert yesterday they had talked about the open access uh, plan as and then after uh, there was uh, uh, you know, Kathleen uh, who basically gave the uh, uh, detail about to the repositories and many things. She had also mentioned that uh, the scholarly article should be actually, uh, it is not necessary uh, that all the articles should publish in English language and it is it could not be possible. Uh, by many people who uh, have the original idea to uh, translate at their own, but they have idea. So how to put that idea in the scholarly form that matters actually. So here in India, there are many universities as you had mentioned and association which are publishing the uh, journal. And uh, some uh, you had also uh, pointed out and everybody knows that uh, the process I had also observed that uh, how basically people are publishing, right? So how uh, we together basically can improve the quality as well as in terms of the technical terms. That is the main concern because uh, I am uh, I am little uh, uh, quite surprised that uh, most of the uh, social sciences and humanities scholars uh, did not create it here. Uh, profile uh, like in the web of science, like into the Scopus, like uh, and Google Scholar movie. Uh, most of them had created the uh, their profile on the Google Scholar without uh, making it manually. And uh, that point uh, in the earlier slide, uh, basically, uh, Vishnu Sarma sir had mentioned uh, that if the name are similar, so automatically that credit goes into that profile. So here also, if the person are not aware about to that point, then it will show in the Google Scholar profile their citation. And uh, for the ranking and other purpose or for the uh, job uh, also, uh, these citations matter. Now my question, to, uh, question basically to you, uh, basically you are working in the uh, this literature area. So when you people publish uh, the article into the local journal or as well local in terms of the uh, some state point of view or some you can understand that point uh, in the journal. So how basically when you consider the reference of the Indian journal article, right? Uh, suppose uh, that Jadavpur University is publishing many journals and they are uh, really uh, good some of them. So if suppose, uh, uh, and, and many other uh, associations are also here, and they are not, uh, they are publishing all the article in one PDF file. And suppose in your own article, you have to consider the reference of one paper, right? 
now the question is how the person basically this one uh, for which you are taking the uh, reference uh, consider in your uh, own article will uh, observe the citation i don't know uh, you are getting this point or not but the uh, thing is that the process which are going on here in india is just to publish the journal only there are many things uh, that uh, we have to incorporate uh, with the journals in terms of the technology so the people basically those our uh, uh, indian scholars who are publishing the article uh, basically one day they they basically uh, get the credits of their published article right at this time i am 100% sure there are many indian scholars related to the this uh, sshh domain uh, social sciences and humanities domain that they are not uh, uh, getting the citations or uh, the getting the uh, credits of their work this is one of the important point that i had observed from your talk that we have to work together to uh, bring out this uh, problem or this uh, thing uh, together right earlier uh, when i had started uh, all these things uh, that time i felt uh, there is a gap in between the library and uh, sciences people so i had started to talk with them and uh, bring out uh, those information on this platform and try to sort out then after some uh, many other expert and now my request to you that uh, try to fill this gap at least in india like you had mentioned uh, there is only one author in most of the cases most of the cases uh, because you had observed uh, here in india all the journals uh, and uh, from that point of view only uh, one author so why the people of the literary work cannot work together so there are, there are so many uh, open area where people can work you are from the uh, english uh, domain and uh, you are using that uh, and you can train someone where basically uh, we can help the scholars indian scholars and uh, can save uh, and can uh, basically motivate to them uh, for this scholarly work and put them uh, in a, in a uh, repository way or into the journal forms or uh, national as well as to the global level right uh, so that is the main concern and uh, one thing that i had mentioned about to the uh, profile like, of uh, the... answer the first question first if you before you move on to the second one yes yeah please yeah because it was a big question it was some kinking um yeah thank you i i think uh, see what has happened is that as i said there is a there has been a generational change within mm -hmm. the humanities um many of the journals which were at least nationally published and many of the good journals were not being published online now the sciences and engineering jumped on to the digital platform much before the humanities and social sciences um for whichever reasons like uh, bang is not here to discuss why sciences jumped on to the humanities digital first but for example indian literature today is still not published as an online journal it is still published as a print journal um so there is obviously a difficulty in uh, integration like right? somebody published in indian literature they not figure in a google citation we not it is impossible for that to happen so therefore uh, you know that process needs to happen with its own time many of the journals will have to consider how to move on to have a digital presence as well and there is also the agi problem of the finances and logistics of maintaining a journal right so so that uh, um, no, no 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 there is no problem of the finances or any other things because the people the scholar who are publishing they have sufficient uh, you can say the uh, the either they are the uh, belongs to the uh, universities colleges uh, right so they they uh, basically a study we were discussing about this thing and uh, from the community point of view they can contribute instead of the apc article processing or article publishing charge they can uh, provide this amount to the uh, that society right by this kind of wigging our discipline for example wigging many of the 
processing fees is also something very unprecedented. It is not considered uh, completely legitimate for journalists to be charging a processing fees. So for example, many of the journalists that I mentioned, they don't, they have never charged the processing fees. So, I mean, it is also a question of capacity. Finance is one thing, uh, but it is a question of capacity whether some of them are moving forward to have an online presence. Some of these journalists have done that. They have started digitization. Some others are still trying to do it. So I think the integration will take time. The integration of uh, the archives of those journals into a digital repository will also take time. Can, can you wait? Sorry. So I think that uh, is going to take its own time and that process will happen. Um, I'm not fully sure if uh, it is a resistance from the disciplines per se towards uh, having, um, uh, you know, like saying Orchid ID or towards having a Google Scholar ID. I think it is a question of awareness. That awareness is growing. So more and more people now are making those, uh, joining those platforms. They are becoming a part of those processes. And that awareness is coming across as, you know, we talk about in our research methodology courses, we discuss all this in conferences such as these. So that awareness is coming. I don't think there is any uh, resistance in any discipline that I, I don't want credit for my work, but there was not a sufficient awareness of how to do it. And again, that is a process which is happening and it will get integrated. So I think that would be my submission on that. Yeah, we can digitalize all the journals together because this is a kind of a matter of uh, uh, some awareness. And each and every institution, whether that is a college or a state university, have their own IT team. So one IT person can easily manage the open journal management system. I had me uh, learn all these things, uh, me as a person of physics learn all these things and set up the OJS, all the nine journals there. So we, as a volunteer, basically can convert those static platform into the dynamic form uh, at the digital platform and uh, can basically use the uh, technology in a proper way. There is no uh, requ much requirement of the money and other things. One thing, second thing is about to the awareness uh, in this uh, social sciences and communities scholars about all these things for the visibility of their research that matters and i think uh, these scholars are lacking there are very few basically uh, uh, are aware about all these things so we have to work i think together uh, and uh, in addition to this one if there is any other question from the audience side so most welcome please uh, Put the, your idea. Hang up. There was a case. I think there's a comment uh, in the chat box. Uh, it might be to, uh, at your end. Uh, yes, uh, it's a it's a direct message. It was. I I just read out the question quickly. My question is that uh, NI NIRF ranking framework in social sciences domain considers Scopus index journals for the Marx calculation. But the researchers and faculty publish good articles in other journals. Isn't this framework comparing to publish in that journal only which is indexed by Scopus? Or they are bearing the internet by not considering? Uh, well, I would say that they are not bearing any internet. But uh, yes, that is one of the points that I'm making. That, uh, for example, if you're a historian, then the Indian History Congress has been publishing a journal for around 90 years now. Like almost all the prestigious reputed historians over 90 years have published in that journal. But that journal may not still be on Scopus yet. As I said, the integration is happening, the process is going on. Meanwhile, we should have a rankings framework so that such scholars, let's say a historian who follows his professor in publishing in the proceedings of the Indian History Congress should not suffer any disadvantage for publishing a journal which is considered prestigious by everybody, but does not figure into scopes. Yeah, Vani, you are asking some questions, please. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for giving an opportunity for that. 
actually uh, yesterday uh, dr shrisi sir also asked the same questions which i just want to take uh, opinion from uh, abhinav sir that uh, maximum scholars are taught about uh, various publications uh, ethics and uh, you know publication matrices which we have to uh, clarify before publications regarding selection of any journal about it so uh, uh, apart from that uh, yesterday uh, uh, dr sushil sir also take the opinions from different other uh, speakers as well regarding that how we can uh, train the scholars regarding the peer review processes which would be focused totally focusing on that because for example if any uh, scholar is submitting any manuscript to any any journal so uh, scholar itself for himself is not totally aware what would be the consequences and what kind of the technical points a reviewer or editor has to consider while uh, reviewing any manuscript so what would be the right way uh, from this uh, institution standpoints for various scholars so that they can train them what would be the uh, you know uh, checkpoints from the uh, reviewer side uh, in a re peer review processes so that uh, a scholar himself or herself can easily uh, go through that and they can easily uh, you know uh, uh, minimize all those errors, correct all those errors as well so that would be a one kind of very very uh, time uh, saving process as well so uh, just want to take your opinion into that yes thank you very much shahid i think uh, again this is a process which many of us as supervisors i am also i also have phd scholars so many of us as supervisors have already started doing at a personal level that we have this conversation with our scholars and try to sensitize them but the more institutionally robust platform is the research methodology course which is offered i think as part of all phd programs in which they should be some of us have already started doing that but they should be also modules on academic publishing academic writing is already becoming a very sought after and important course so for example many universities today have academic writing courses at the undergraduate level uh it is important to strengthen those courses many times they are just elective courses which people do because you know they see one more credit or you know some easy marks but it is important to strengthen that and especially at the doctoral level the methodology course must be able to handle all of this it should not just be left to individual supervisors and professors but in a university system the methodology course is the i think the most appropriate platform to also have discussion on this also we have to sensitize the scholars about to the ethics as well as the best practices uh, into the publication like this time you people are getting more exposure about to the publication houses and the uh, practices uh, that people basically do with the uh, this research papers uh, for which basically we uh, try to do effort more than 9 months to publish so what are the things so scholars basically have to uh, provide this kind of exposure at every platform that i personally feel i i fully agree with you yeah if there is no any other question so we are moving to the uh, next uh, uh, speaker and uh, anubhav sir thank you thank you so much for thank providing you. Uh, thank you thank you once again and now over to uh, dr mamta agarwal ma'am to introduce the rusali dhand uh, what madam and uh, he is from the doj uh, ma'am Yeah, Dr. Mamta Agarwal. Yeah, yeah. Am I audible? Yeah. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Sushil, for organizing this wonderful international conference with a wide range of audience and topics about research publications. and this conference is actually giving us many new insights into publications and communications now this session uh, i take immense pleasure in inviting and introducing ms brushali tantavadi brushali is head librarian at aiss ms college of engineering college pune maharashtra india and she holds a phd degree from reva university bangalore india her research topic is open access e resources development in asia a study brushali was the winner of the alcts online course grant for library professionals from developing countries in 2014 
and the INASP Open Access Week competition in both 2015 and 2016. She too was invited to OpenCon 2017 in Berlin, Germany, and subsequently worked as a member of the organizing committee for OpenCon 2018 in Toronto, Canada. She also served as an advisory committee member for Open Access Week 2018-19. She is selected as an advisory committee member of Open DOAR and conference committee member of the FORCE 2021 conference. She is active ambassador of DOHA India. So today she will be speaking on the topic publishing in open access journals. What is DOHA? How DOHA is useful for open access publishing? So I welcome you, Brushali. Over to you. Thank you, ma'am. I just share my screen. Just can you see it, ma'am? Yes, yes, please. So, uh, thank you, uh, Sushil sir, and all uh, for organizing this conference. And this is really wonderful learning. I was also able to attend some session from yesterday. So today I will speak on publishing in open access journal. What is DOJ? How DOJ is full will be uh, for open access publishing. Uh, I saw there are many scholars here, even some faculties and uh, some publishers here. So I hope this presentation will be useful for all. So today's agenda is what is DOJ? Who will get benefit from DOJ? why it is important to be indexed in DOAJ, what do journals need to for inclusion of, uh, in DOAJ, and how it's useful for open access publishing, and uh, what are the best practices in open access publishing. So uh, it's the, the DOAJ is Director of Open Access Journals. Uh, journals. It's launched in May 2003 uh, in London University Sudan uh, with 300 titles. Uh, it's non-profit database uh, of high quality open access journals across the all scholarly disciplines means all subjects are included here. Uh, so now nearly 17,476 journals and more than 7 million uh, link of open access article are included in our platform. So the mission is uh, to increase the visibility, accessibility, reputation, usage and impact of quality of peer-reviewed open access scholarly research journals globally, uh, regardless of any discipline, any geography, or any languages. So yes, as Sir was saying that, we also include the uh, multidisciplinary uh, subjects and uh, multidisciplinary language, but the journal should be in open access content and the quality should be uh, good so that we are monitoring that uh, in the system. So, who will get the benefit from the work uh, the DOJ is doing. So it's enabled researchers and the students and the public to search for the good open access journals and uh, by prevent the use of unethical and questionable journals. So as a lot of discussion was there on uh, uh, predatory journals and questionable journals. So that uh, need that is being awarded in DOJ platform. So it's allow researchers, uh, so advise them to find a proper publishing channel and even such compliance with the funder policies and the mandate because a lot of journals in the uh, DOJ platform uh, can take you the without the APC and uh, if any, uh, any country is giving fee waiver policy that can be also searched from the database. So for the research managers, uh, it, is, uh, it is data determined so publishing in good open access journal, it's also monitor the compliance of open access policies and the mandate. And the, for authors and the researchers, it's a reference point. So looking good publishing channel in the field of research. And uh, uh, so we can also check the seminar. So accept seminar. So uh, it's, uh, we can identify a good open access journals. And so uh, people will not submit the paper in uh, questionable journals. So for uh, research funders, so it's uh, look to DOJ to check good quality open access journal. Uh, it also to check, as I said, it's compiled with the policies and the mandate. So several funders have open access publication fund. 
and often listing in DOJ uh, is eligibility criteria for their getting support. So like in India, we, uh, we have very less funding for APC, but in another country, they have the uh, APC funding available. So uh, the, the main criteria that publication should be uh, available in open access journals. So DOJ is main uh, key po point there. And it's also operate the list of uh, good open access journals that is included. So for publishers and the learned society, it's a stamp of quality because once their journal indexed in DOJ, they can put the uh, logo and the seal uh, if, the, if they got a seal. So it's important for the stakeholder. It's good reputation for the them. And it's also uh, it's very good criteria that uh, they follow the best practice. So uh, we can judge the quality of the journal. It's also for, for the value of the DOJ publisher that number of sponsorship, number of the articles they will get. And uh, it's helped to uh, support open access. And uh, we also help to that learner society to publish in open access journals. And it's also for the source of income for them. So it's benefited for all the stakeholder. So I'll just, in a short, I will tell uh, how is the DOJ team is working. So governance advisory board is there with no influence, but they are providing uh, advice and OA advocates and publishers and library directors are there. In organization, uh, earlier Lars was there, the managing director. Recently, Joanna uh, Ball, she joined as a managing director. Community manager, uh, Dominic and Clara. Editor-in-chief is Tom. And managing editor, uh, they are from different, different countries. Uh, Sonja, Rickards, they are, they are the name. You can see the list there, Lena. Uh, Kamel, I think Lena is also present in this meeting. So editor groups, then after them, the editor groups, they are voluntaries works. And the last, we are the ambassador. So right now, uh, 19 ambassadors, 90 to 20 ambassadors are there in different countries who are working to promote DOAJ platform among the researchers and the scholars. So also there are a lot of uh, volunteers, uh, editors, and uh, like uh, we are the ambassadors, we are promoting DOAJ, we are handling applications of the journals to be listed in DOAJ. We also promote the best publishing practices and uh, helping to identify the questionable and unethical uh, journals, unethical publishers. So we are based, a lot of ambassadors are based in China, uh, Russia, Egypt, Ethiopia, uh, South Africa, Mexico, uh, like uh, Indonesia, Korea, and I'm working from India. So any, any contact related to any query related to DOAJ, the journal application or any uh, work, if you want, you can directly contact to me uh, if you're from India. So the mission, uh, the mission is like to help the reader to find the quality of open access material, to help the author to identify where to publish, to help the libraries to highlight open access resources for the patrons. Yes, because I'm librarian. So we face a lot of problem with the funding issues and uh, we don't have that much funding available. So we always promote uh, open access uh, journals uh, with our research scholar. So because it's free of cost and also uh, for the funders, it's ensure the compliance with the mandate for the publishers to increase the visibility and the usage and adopt best practices and it's uh, help to a better publishing system for all. So this is our mission. So why editor want to index their journal in DOAJ? Because it's higher visibility of the journal. Uh, it's more discoverability of the journal content. Uh, it's also promote the quality of the journal process and also enhance the reputation and attract more authors and also attract the uh, research funders. So what is the main requirement? The journal should be in open access, full open access journal. So all uh, PDF file to be open in full open access. It's not a no, hybrid or no uh, abstracts or opening. So that that is not um, allowed. Also immediate access to all full text without no embargo. And it should be a peer reviewed journal. Full text original research uh, review should be available, no abstracts. And uh, primary audience is the researchers and any discipline, any subjects and any language. So this is, this is the most requirement. So how uh, the DOH is working? So journal apply via application form. The application form available in 13 languages. 
So application form is available. I have given the link here. So um, I'll just, uh, in a short, I will show you how the application form is uh, here. Why I'm showing here uh, to this, though you are a researcher, but you can uh, see the quality of the journal, quality of the content, what are the criteria DOH is looking uh, when the journal is getting indexed. So this is the first that open access compilers and uh, the researchers, uh, the editor, has to uh, go uh, from the system and uh, the journal website to be there. So journal must have a register, ISSN number, contact detail, unique URL and uh, publication date of each article and minimum five scholarly article published per year. So this is the uh, first criteria. So this is the journal uh, title, the link of journal home page, then ISSN and the uh, keyword search they have to give. Then the publisher name, publisher country. So society, if there is any society or any organization they are promoting, so that information to be given. Then copyright and licensing. So copyright for the published article may be written by the author or transferred to the publisher, but most of open access journals follow the CC by policy. So uh, the publisher, the editors uh, has to give the uh, which for copyright policy they are for they are following so licensing policy because this this is useful for us to review and also for the authors so which which is the copyright policy they are following so uh, the copyright information to be uh, is mandatory then uh, this is the workflow like uh, the publisher apply and the journal is assigned uh, to editors and then they assign to the ambassador then DOJ team uh, evaluate the journal, they recommend the journals uh, maybe to be rejected or some uh, corrections to be done or then we contact to the publisher, then we get uh, correction and if the journal is really not good or uh, we find any uh, unethical practices or questionable journals, so then uh, it's final decisions, either we reject or approve or approve or seal and the feedback is given to the editor. So this is the process. So live session, I will take you after this uh, presentation. So I will show you the platform, how it's working. So uh, now uh, the 12,124 indexed journals uh, are without APC. So APC, you might be knowing from yesterday's conversation, APC is the article publication cost. So uh, what, what is happening? Publishers are charging money from the authors to publish their journals. But uh, these are the some 12,124 journals are not charging any APC. These are the open access journals which are indexed in uh, DOJ. So when you want to publish your journal, uh, your paper, you can find out those journal uh, from DOJ platform. I will show you how it's working. Then this is a DOJ search box. Why I have taken this because the, sometimes uh, the librarians, librarians are here and they want to include the uh, search box to their website so directly the code is there you can just copy paste the code uh, in the and the search box will be displayed so from your website the directly journal search can be uh, done by the uh, research scholars and the students so uh, what is the major issue we are facing here in india so uh, you know now a ugc list here has been come but uh, still there is a a uh, lot of questionable publishing is the ma major issues because uh, you know last uh, from last two three years lot of news are coming like even uh, earlier Anubhav sir was saying that the yes we are having problem with the publication and uh, people are not working collaboratively and here because of the uh, system of promotions and uh, like that people just want to publish they don't see the quality they don't see the journals, they just, uh, you know, for their pay, publish and profit. So that's why India is getting top submissions in the predatory journals. And now the Indian government is taking some initiative uh, by uh, making a list of uh, questionable journals. And even the earlier list was removed uh, from the system. But still there, the problem is there. So we are trying to solve this issue. Even uh, the communication is going on with the UGC that include DOJ database in the UGC journals because we are also following the uh, good uh, indexing criteria. 
so uh, to index your journals and to publish your journals in open access the major questionable publishing uh, problem can be avoided so how this will be used for open access publishing because uh, it providing clear information on the websites so reader can recommend it it demonstrate quality and the commitment to the standard it build trust in your journals and uh, we have listed principle of transparency and best practices on the websites you can go and uh, see so the uh, the uh, coop and doj and oaspa and world association of medical Ed editors they came together and they uh, they made uh, all this transparency of best practices so doj is not alone working it's working with the co it's working with the OAS oaspa and these are really uh, leading organization who are promoting open access who are promoting best practices and who are uh, educating publishers and the research scholars so uh, these are the all guidelines has been given by them and uh, these are the uh, best practices that yes the journal websites to be very clear uh, it should be demonstrating the all professional standards the name of journals uh, it should be not uh, you know uh, easily confused with another journal because here in india we are also like i am also evaluating lot of journals so same same journals names are coming uh, publishers are putting just international journal the name before the journal the name is international journal uh, editors are some another uh, countries the editors uh, like peer review committee and the journals um, they don't know their name is there and uh, their name is in, included in advisory board editor board so that fake practices are still going here but we are uh, really evaluating it's it's take a lot of time and also peer review process uh, that earlier students also earlier somebody asked the question that uh, yes peer review process the all formalities and all the things to be there so it's allow the journal should give the information about the peer review process and uh, even individual uh, faculties and the students they are uh, looking that uh, which is good quality journals and really following the peer review practices or not so these are some uh, guidelines and the ownership and the management uh, so that should be clearly indicated uh, this is one then governing body so journals shall have the editor boards governing bodies uh, to be recognized experts and the uh, you know subject experts to be there so their full name and affiliation should be there because a lot of journals they are just mentioning the name of some person who is under the editor boards but the, their information is not there so that journals are really not good quality journals then uh, editorial team contact details should be there uh, copyright and licensing as all already i have told you that all the uh, licensing information clearly uh, discard, uh, described in the guidelines so uh, author should know that who is handling copyright so they can use the policy or not then author fees yes if journal is charging some fees that should be maintained uh, mentioned in the journal website and um, you know lot of countries are having a fee waiver policy so if fee waiver policy is there so then that information to be given on the website it's sometimes journals are taking the uh, uh, paper from the researchers and they are not mentioning any author fees and then when the paper is accepted then then they are, they are sending the mails to the authors that you have to pay this much money and then your paper will get published so please avoid that type of journals to publish your own work then uh, publisher uh, that research misconduct that publishers and editors they shall responsible steps to identify plagiarism policy should be there you have to see the citations is there then uh, data for uh, data and because see you know you are giving your own work and you are publishing your own work because you, it's uh, in good quality journal if you want to publish your paper it take really one one year eight months one or two years like that but if journal is taking your paper and if the journal is publishing your paper in the next month then you can also see the what is the quality of that journal so um, that you have to monitor and the publication ethics are like yes journal policies then a journal will handle the complaints and appeals then journal policies uh, of interest then uh, data sharing then uh, ethical oversights and uh, what is the 
uh, any uh, policies they are following about the corrections and any options and yes i say as i said the periodicity of the journals and publish uh, shall be indicated because publishing schedule should be there and the most important that uh, access of the journal the journal is in close access or open access so that should be find out so why to publish in open access journals because you will get more citations your work will be visible for all and uh, if you are doing any work uh, like uh, then maybe if you are working uh, alone and if you are publishing any article maybe from other countries people can contact you they may invite you to the work collaboratively so that you can do the collaborative research later on and uh, it also help to uh, give your academic impact and your uh, it's build your bio data also so a more policy for the best uh, publication practices that archive should be there so this is uh, this is for the journal publisher but also for the uh, useful for the authors because see if i publish my journal in suppose in 1995 and uh, now it's in 2022 uh, suppose if any author and he is very old and now he want to uh, he want to see his paper again so if journal is not having any policy the journal website is closed then that should be that's why the clear archiving policies to be followed by the journal so there are a lot of open access article can be available by uh, clocks and the pubmed centrals policies then uh, business model um, that uh, to be really clear for, correctly then um, this is oh sorry then uh, what type of um, uh, decisions and the marketing if journal is giving any marketing and all these things that should be avoided so these are some practices and more information on DOJ that is available on homepage and feedback and all this thing. So this is uh, in from my side for slideshow and I will take you to the um, website. Just tell me, can you see the screen? Yeah, okay. So uh, you can see, so this is the DOJ website and you can see it is available from 80 languages. 130 countries and uh, 12,291 journals without APC. And right now, 17,478 uh, journals are there. And these are the articles. So if you want to see the journals, uh, you can just see, suppose you, you are from social science and you can just put social science and you can just search uh, the term here. You can see the journals uh, here. And if you want to see which journals are not charging any APC, then you have to just click it here and you can see the data here. So once you, if you find this, so this is South Asia Multidisciplinary Academic Journal. Once you go on this website, so you can see there is a no publication fee, which is the policy they are handling. And if you want to see the editor boards and all these things, and it will take you to the directly to the journal website. So like that also you can go and uh, you can find out the journals here and information from uh, DOAG website. And what I was saying about the best practices and the documentation. So these are the widget where I show you that simple search. You have to just copy and paste the uh, search box that this code, this script, and the, you, you will get the uh, this type of search box which you can integrate to your library services or your college or your any uh, search platform. And uh, this is information about UAJ team, advisory board, uh, volunteers, news. So whatever latest news are there, so we are putting here. So Ms. UAJ is putting here in the blog. So all the all these calls and uh, new managing director type of things. So the next one is like, uh, as I said, if you want to search any article that you can search and it's same, you have to go here and you can type it from the article and you can just search. And uh, if you know the abstract, if you want the subject, if you want to search by author, so all search information is there. And uh, here in the documentation, oh, sorry. Here is the publisher supporters is there. And uh, I was just telling, so this is the information about, I will just tell you to the 
because now things will uh, here is the transparency and the best practices of the information is given also the uh, here is the application form guide for applying and why you want to index your journal in doj that information is given so if you want to read all which i have just shown all information so this this you can read it from here and as i said it's working with a lot of journals and these are the languages so in other languages information is available so if you are an editor or if you are a publisher and if you want to apply so you have to just click apply and this is the application form so you have to just apply you can save as a draft and you can apply from the website so for the authors and the, for the researchers and the faculty this is the search box for you you can search the journals you can search the articles so i think i have done and uh, any question you can ask me and just thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Salina, uh, for this uh, wonderful information. And uh, most probably, uh, our young scholars basically will get it noticed if they are not aware because uh, you had given both the options uh, with the, and without article processing charge. So it is very important for in, in terms of the Indian perspective that uh, the scholars basically have to approach uh, the journal. But there is a one point uh, that is related to the uh, uh, indexing as well as uh, to the repository in terms of that. So people may think uh, that DOAJ is indexer. So just try to make it clear, uh, Rusali ma'am, uh, DOAJ is a, uh, behave like or behave not be uh, is equal to the indexer or just putting all that information like a repository. It's an indexing system and it's a database of open access journal because as I have shown you that journals information is going from DOJ to the journal directly to the journals link. So the, those journals which are indexed in our system only those journals are available. So not open access, all open access journals are not available. So it's indexing system database and it's promote the quality of open access journal. And uh, there are uh, all web websites, scopus and yeah. uh, indexing open access article. So and a lot of uh, op open access journals from web of science and scopus also indexed in DOAJ. So as I said, we are also in uh, communication with UGC care and um, hope so that uh, will uh, also go in the UGC list very soon. And uh, it should be basically because uh, it will be useful for the in terms of the Indian perspective. Mm -hmm. And my question is again because uh, uh, there are many things uh, which we learn in a systematic way. Like uh, in my case, Earlier, we were uh, a simple, uh, like a teacher. We know about to the publications of the article that we write the research article, then we publish. We don't know uh, many things related to the publications, but when we uh, take the responsibility, then we take the idea from here and there. And then that time, it is similar to the publishing the research article, mm -hmm. right? When uh, a young uh, or early stage researcher, basically what they do, they just read the article and uh, just try to summarize all these things without the awareness uh, in your article, right? And that time, uh, we say that uh, the content is uh, similar to that one. Same thing happened here that I had observed, that uh, in the early stage, uh, what I had observed, that uh, there was some uh, publication policy, there are uh, some license or copyright policy, uh, all these things basically, uh, main part you had already highlighted uh, in the presentation. Uh, so those points actually for the information, when someone provides the information that this is that point, this is uh, for that purpose, your editorial policy, your article processing charge, uh, your uh, who is the owner, who is the editor, their details, uh, there are so many things in the journal, right? But when you go minutely, you are not aware about to the many things that only the expert can catch. Mm. Right? Like this time, we are able to understand that how basically what type of mistake these young scholars are doing. Mm. Either they are aware or they are not aware. 
So, uh, is there any way where uh, you basically at uh, your and Nicosio and uh, Lina are ambassador? So, can uh, uh, provide some kind of uh, training to the publishers uh, to of the India because it will help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It will help in that way that uh, uh, that I had noticed in terms of the publication that most of the uh, professors or like uh, some person uh, blame to the uh, Indian scholars, they, they are not writing uh, good articles or uh, other things. But when I came into this uh, point and studied, I had observed because they are not able to read good quality articles. Mm -hmm. If yeah. they are not able to read good quality articles, how basically they can think in that direction or at that level. Mm -hmm. So if we can provide high quality articles to our uh, young scholars and the people who basically are in, in contact, so obviously they will uh, try to uh, do the, the same effort for that work, right? Nowadays, what they are doing, uh, they are approaching lower category journals and try to write the article from there, mm -hmm. right? They, they can think only that point, mm -hmm. but the efforts are same. They are spending uh, their energy and time uh, in a similar way by that uh, they can write a good article if they take the information from the good source. So this is the same point uh, that I want to convey at your end and the Polina ma'am is uh, listening. So because uh, I was in uh, her contact. So we, we uh, publisher also, because we are growing and we, at, uh, we are from the universities and we are not uh, so much professional, but with the time, uh, like today, I can understand the many things. Mm -hmm. But in the early stage, we are not uh, capable to understand the meaning of the word, like you had mentioned here, license, and there are so many licenses, mm -hmm. right? But uh, still, there are many scholars and researchers who cannot understand all the licenses and that meaning in the detail, but they know that there are six uh, licenses are there, but they cannot uh, right now understand the feeling of that uh, uh, statement or like that. So this is my kind request to all of you, please, uh, uh, whether uh, in that case we or any other publisher, young generation, without any discrimination, we, this is our responsibility that the information which we have, we have to basically provide. And then after this is the take of the uh, person uh, that how basically they are taking. But to make uh, the awareness and sensitize the people, about the actual thing, about those minor, minor things, it is our responsibility that I feel. Yes, sir. Actually, uh, in the Medno publisher, they want to index the most of the journals in the database. So that can be host a training for them. So if you have, if you know some publishers and if some people come together, we are happy to host training for the publishers. So what are the things to be followed? And like, you know, that one by one, we are also replying on email also that this is the uh, thing. But the see the major uh, quality if that is not good, then immediately that rejection is happening. So even last, uh, last year, I think some uh, uh, agriculture or uh, some Ayurveda journal was there. So they requested for the training before applying. So we, uh, I have only the uh, conducted training for them. So if any, anybody's willing or if any like group of people, group of editor, if you know, and if you can bring some uh, publishers together, we are ha really happy to help you because we are really happy to host some training for the, because you know this uh, even, so many people start, want to start the journal, but they don't know the process and then without they are applying and they are getting rejected. So we're happy to help. Even um, through our Twitter, uh, like last uh, last in month of December, uh, we got a request from the Pakistan that some uh, information they want and like that uh, from Twitter we responded. So it's not like that if you contact us and nobody will respond. Uh, even Lena is here. We're happy to host uh, trainings for you if you're uh, if you know some like as I said, group of people, publishers, and also as a librarian and as an ambassador, I'm also conducting a lot of training and uh, not uh, Miss DOHR plus other open access resources useful for the researchers and the faculties because you know due to pandemic, a lot of uh, financial problems came and a lot of database subscription has been stopped by the library. So we are also, I'm also taking that OER training for the uh, faculty and the scholars. So we're happy to help. 
and uh, one more thing uh, i forgot that uh, somebody asked question i think uh, mr vani uh, that the training for the peer review process so author aid author aid is the platform if you might be knowing author aid i will just share my screen again and uh, so this is the platform and they are conducting uh, some courses if you go so now they are conducting courses in research writing so that is going to be start from 5th april to uh, 16th may and this is this research writing in social science research writing and proposal writing it's eight week course so you please take uh, because even i am the uh, i was the participant for this course and this course are very useful and uh, this will be useful for the faculty for the research scholar and uh, these are the open uh, online course without any cost so you go on authored website register for the course and they train you how to publish a good quality paper how to write a paper so this information for the students and the faculty who are here and i got some yeah so if any question uh, i'm happy to answer it would be great if there is a question uh, actually in the first session uh, in, in this before noon i was planning uh, the plan that uh, was in my mind that the scholar basically know about to the bibliometric and uh, related things so that's why uh, uh, the first lecture of the seba related to that some idea and you are also expert in in that area because you uh, all library and knows about to that that's importance mm -hmm. so uh, basically the trend in the uh, uh, india is what uh, in the early phase of the research career most of the scholars uh, follow uh, uh, like uh, all 10 or 15 articles of their research lab or the people or those who are working in that area but uh, do you don't think that uh, this is the somehow responsibility of all the librarian that they train uh, the scholars about to this field also because uh, of this uh, the study they immediately know everything about to the uh, uh, researcher of that domain the most suitable journals and many more things yes a lot and, of librarians are doing but it's you know it's depend on the librarian quality also uh, and the research and the institute where they are working so i know the librarian who are really working and promoting this type of practices but you know it's depend on the person to person organization and the management so that's why i i told you that if any query like we are think, i think uh, from 2016 i have uh, went many places we took lot of training so like that uh, we are connected with a lot of people from india so happy to help and also happy to because we have also conducted training for the librarians so then you pass on the message you help the researchers you help your students and the faculty but that initiative also to be taken from the librarian that interest to be there that you know for the um, faculties to help them to identify so and the one more thing that uh, in uh, uh, quite well known institutions uh, the scholar the researchers basically uh, thinks that they, why do they need to approach librarian mm -hmm. and on the other hand vice versa uh librarian uh, thinks that why do i need to say and uh, discuss all these things mm -hmm. with them but when the uh, the point comes related to the publication they select the they select the idea they select the topic from the topic and publish silent mm -hmm. yeah that is the point so, so that's why sir now librarian responsibility is too much like our librarian job is not only for the ratio return like here also i'm maintaining with one profile i'm i'm uh, admin of courser idx platform i'm admin of nptl so we are also promoting open learning uh, and lot of things we are doing we have uh, started our repository at the college then maintain digital libraries and uh, like you know now uh, citations are collected through the infinet portal promoting lot of plagiarism uh, training we are conducting so that's why even the main if principal and director also you know make mandatory for the librarian to learn all this thing and to share then i think this problem will be solved mm -hmm. uh, okay i uh, i have a question yeah uh, yes, uh, vishali uh, 
uh, see uh, this uh, DOJ actually I was not aware of this platform mm -hmm. like in pandemic uh, like we suppose we were working from home so we we did we were not getting the access to journals whatever office provides mm -hmm. so when we I go to my campus then I have access to some journals but at home then it was difficult so then we were requesting some friends who stay on campus to send us that journal so does this DOJ provides access to all the scientific journals also, international journals also? No, or no. It is, no. It's, it's DOJ, it's open access journals which are indexed in DOJ. You can open it from any uh, place. Uh, it's, it's worldwide available. You can open it from your mobile and computer. Okay. But uh, for if you, I will suggest you, uh, because in the pandemic, what we did, we, uh, provide, we took a remote access tab facility for our students and we provided the remote access. So if mm -hmm. your organization and if your librarian, they are ready to take remote access and they, then they can connect all the scientific journals and then uh, we govern the access at home. But DOJ, it's, uh, it's including uh, scientific journals, social science journals, all subject journals, mm -hmm. but uh, all the indexed journals in our platform only, the full text will be open. Okay, but it has international journals also. Also, uh, yeah, access. lot of okay. journals also. So anybody can, suppose I am working from home, I can also yeah, yeah, access. Yeah. So just journal. go on the site and you just Website. search. Yeah, you just search and you will get the articles. Okay. Then yeah. another interesting thing which I which you told me just now you showed that author aid. Yeah, yeah. See, I have been in the, in the previous uh, 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 this thing lecture also. He was mentioning about you know the students uh, how to write research, good quality research papers and all. So if they are trained to write a good, so if there are some seniors, you know, they come forward to train research scholars uh, in writing a research paper. And this author aid is an online course uh, done by, I mean, who are the uh, uh, teachers? Mentor are, they, are the, they are foreign uh, people uh, from mentors. author aid mentors. And they have also a uh, mentor policy for the developing countries author. So okay. if, if I'm writing a paper and if I'm got stuck, I can find a mentor. And okay. if some senior person, he can also become a mentor for the other student. So, so you, for this course, uh, the mentors will be from the author aid side and the learning material will be come and the people have to join. And you know, we have to solve the like NPTEL, if you're doing NPTEL courses, the uh, guidelines are there, then a lot of guidelines they are giving and it's six week course. Six okay, or eight so week the course. mentors, they work for free or? Uh, it's free, it's free. Every, for, it's even free. for students, even for Yeah, it's free. Free. it's free. I, I already done that course. So okay. I know. Okay, so I, I suppose I'm a, I'm a physics, suppose I'm a nuclear physics researcher, I'm looking for some guidance from a nuclear physicist. Mm -hmm. So do you have any such key, some subject expert only will mentor or anybody And then can... uh, you, you log in to the author ed website ed. and you can find the mentor from your okay. subject from, and okay. their details are there, then you can put a request and if you, if you're writing some paper, you uh -huh. can put a request that you want some guideline or suggestion. Then if that mentors are available, because like that, I got two, three uh, help from my own uh, research mm -hmm. writing. So the, they are most of the foreign peoples are there. So they happy to help. They will help okay. you by email. And author aid is like a, a mediator contact between the mentor and the scholars. But uh, I think this this facility, I think students are not aware. Uh, in yeah, like that's I am in right. Yeah. Miss, somebody asked <laughs> like, ma'am, I said now that lot of things are there. Yeah. Lot of open access resources are yes. there. Even the uh, DOAG is there, DOAB is there, repositories are there. Our own Shodh Ganga platform is there. Uh -huh. uh, lot of people are doing PhD, but they are not aware about the Shodh Ganga and the, all these things. So, like I, as I said, like we have in Flip, in Flipnet with one portal and lot of things are there, ma'am. And a lot of courses our college students are doing, but the people are not aware. So that's why if somebody give them guidelines and like that. Yeah, no, actually, I'm starting. I'm, I'm doing a project of creating awareness among. So I'm I want to tell students about what all is required in research and you know uh, about research. Yeah. So, I mean, I can obviously tell about this or this is a very good, uh, yeah. even I was thinking of creating something. So, since you're already uh, there, maybe at, suppose, suppose I'm doing an awareness and if there are some students, maybe we can collaborate also at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. no problem. Yeah, we can take awareness of all OER resources because I'm taking a lot of program for, because my own students and my 
own faculties are there and even i am also working as a doj ambassador so okay. uh, we are giving the idea of all open access platform which are free of cost available for the researchers useful and they no need to pay anything and okay. how they can they get the information okay okay so, that's great actually it's very yeah. nice thank okay. you for this and i think there are no more questions then i think we can thank the speaker dr sushil yes yeah okay so we thank mr shalika thank you for a very very insightful talk and it was very useful i hope uh, to work together maybe at some point That's we nice. will also collaborate and yeah make use of doaj platform yeah sure, sure. thank you so much okay ma'am over to you sushil ji thank you thank you dr mamta arora ma'am and thank you rusali ma'am for uh, this uh, uh, detailed information about to the uh, open uh, access doj and directory of open access uh, and other things uh now we will move to the uh, second session but before that there is a one hour gap to take the lunch and uh, in the second session uh, there are very uh, different uh, actually our talks we have we will discuss about uh, identifier we will discuss about to the uh, uh, cross rep uh, and uh, there is uh, one more talk about to the open access by few number so uh, let's uh, Uh, to the next session, but before that, uh, we are taking now uh, the gap or uh, rest of uh, one hour. So we will meet at one uh, fifty-five, right? So till that, thank you, thanks to for all uh, your time and uh, patience uh, to observe all these things. Uh, so thank you, thank you, Mamta, and thanks uh, participants and uh, other member. We will meet at one uh, fifty. Right. A very good afternoon to all participants, speakers. So now we are moving into the second phase, and in this uh, session, actually, uh, we will discuss uh, some more thing about to the open access as well as uh, to the identifiers. So. Now we just uh, uh, Fiona is uh, here, and uh, then Nabil, and then Amanda. Uh, there are three speakers in this session, and uh, we will discuss some more things. Are uh, that uh, basically we try to cover everything. So uh, without taking much more time, uh, I invite uh, uh, Dr. Monica Gupta uh, to introduce our speaker, uh, Fiona. Uh, Dr. Monica, over to you. Thank you so much, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, ma'am, and all the respected members. Uh, ma'am Fiona Murphy. She is co-founder, partnership and community development at More Brains Cooperative Consulting. She has over twenty years of experience in publishing and scholarly community communications. After completing a deep field. in english at oxford university she began her publishing career with roles at ville random house australia and bloomsbury academy it was these experiences working at the cutting edge of scholarly communications innovation that inspired her to move into independent research both as an associate fellow at the university of reading and a consultant Initially as founder and director of Murphy Mitchell Consulting she worked with a wide range of organizations including Belmont Farm Fos 11 Sloan Foundation Bodleian Library the Association of Commonwealth Universities JISC and the Institute of Physics creating understanding and driving alliances between funders researchers institutions and publishers As a member of More Brains, she continues to be a leader in scholarly communications, research infrastructure, and particularly open data, including in her role as deputy chair of the Dryad Board, working closely with the executive director and other board members to define Dryad's future direction and strategy. She is a founder member of the STM Research Data Group, a member of the Research Data Alliance. And Force Eleven, and on the 
researcher to reader advise the board she is also on the steering committee for the force 11 scholarly communications institute and on the council for the european association of science editors i welcome ma'am now please over to you welcome to this session thank you very much dr monica um and thank you very much for that introduction and for inviting me to speak to you all today. I'm just going to share my screen. Thank you, ma'am. Right, um, are you able to see it? Great, thank you very much. So, um, as, as, um, as per the programme, I wanted to talk to you today um, about open science practices and um, their implications and opportunities for research publishing. Um, it's quite a, a high level look, so um, I hope that um, people will um, you know, enjoy what I have to say, find it thought provoking and, um, and hopefully we can have a discussion at the end. So, how do we get here? Um, as you well know, there's a flow of research and knowledge producing activities. It's quite cyclical, but there's also, if you like, a rough trajectory of progress. You start with funding and grants, um, you do the research, you produce data, software and reports, and then move on to more formal publications such as articles and data releases. This then translates into assessment, into real life impact through policy and, um, you know, sort of academic and impact and also citations. Um, you're also hoping to obviously innovate and, um, and then fuel further ideas and go back to the beginning, if you like, more research, opportunities for funding and for research. And this process keeps repeating. So there are variations, obviously, depending on your, your discipline and um, resources and, and so forth. But this is this is um, these just depend, I think, more on on um, how quickly the cycle flows, what the up outputs look like, um, whether or not funding is is um, necessary for you to be able to conduct your research. But this is how we have advanced knowledge um, for uh, several hundred years. And especially if you like, since the printing printing press was invented. And that's a bit of a problem. I think, um, because I, I, I wanted to show you this, this picture, which is by um, Alberto Pepe, and I've only ever found it on his, on his Twitter feed, but I think it really encapsulates um, the problem of, of um, what we I suppose are, look, are looking at in this, in this um, current state, that um, scientists are um, trying to you know, work with modern tools, with you know, current um, levels of, of technology, um, but they're also being constrained by the um, by the the um, if you like the seventeenth century formats of journals by what people um, were were looking for in the the sixteen hundreds um, and also the, the the tools and the the workflows with which they are being um, asked to produce these outputs uh, have not been keeping up with the, the sheer scale if you like of of what the um, the, the knowledge that they're generating produces. So what happens in publishing at the moment is, um, if you like, the, the, the richness of the original um, outputs and thinking is actually stripped out, it's flattened in order to make it publishable. Um, and that also has a, a, a really awful sort of side effect, if you like, of hindering, of, of taking out vital information that um, open science would, would hopefully um, keep in. It means that we don't um, have full ideas about the provenance, particularly um, because of the there will be people who, for instance, aren't listed as um, the authors of a paper, but who did contribute to the knowledge that the paper's based on. Um, there might be, um, say, data center managers there could be um, you know, people working in the, you know, the research integrity office, there could be the librarians who, who helped advise on how to manage the data. Um, it's also um, meaning that reproducibility is hindered because so many steps um, are missed out, people only pro you know, produce you know, select data points, for instance. Um, and it could also be that things that simply weren't documented um, or, or that data that were lost. Um, it's also happening faster and faster. And, um, and so people are, are finding it more and more difficult to just keep up with what's going on. And the result, right now. Oh, yeah. The result 
is um, a very roughly organized mess. I would say it's, it's something that basically probably most things that you need are somewhere around, but it's not going to be very easy to find them. Um, and this this means that uh, people are delayed that, you know, you can't find necessarily what you're looking for. You can't necessarily establish the provenance of what you're looking at and, and go back and check where something actually came from. Uh, in short, you could say we don't know what we know. And this means that decision making is flawed. Um, we're seeing more articles being retracted as mistakes do come to light. And we're also left with perverse incentives um, because of the, the published or perish imperative and seeking high citations, people publish too quickly. Um, they might also tailor the, the results that they publish to look more interesting. And that's not really um, their fault, if you like, if that's what they're being incentivized to do. Uh, but that does mean that the science becomes un, uh, unreproducible. It also means that many of the producers, as we say, are uncredited. Um, and also, uh, we don't necessarily have things being properly connected. Uh, so, uh, again, data might not be um, properly connected with articles. People might not be properly connected with, with um, other outputs. Um, funders, you know, where... With, you know, where who the you know, funders can't necessarily track what their um, funding were, you know, achieved, if you like, what it was spent on, who did what, and what were the outcomes. It also makes it easier for predatory publishers to, uh, to inveigle their way into the midst because it's harder to check, um, the, again, to sense check, to, to valid, you know, validate what you're looking at to be heard in the last session. And that also means that um, you suffer things like link rot. You follow a link, and the, you know, and the um, what should be at the other end of it isn't there. Um, we also don't necessarily know which is the version of record. Um, in short, things are more confused than they should be. So um, before we look at what we could do about it, I just wanted to. I think this is quite a useful thought experiment that um, that I, I was part of um, a few years ago. Um, where a group of scholars got together, so it was in 2016, so a couple of years before um, the pandemic, and, um, and, and asked ourselves these questions. So if, what if we, we didn't have that legacy of the 17th century um, in controlling or, or at least um, having this massive effect on, on how we, we, we publish and, and output and organise things? Um, what, what if we were starting from scratch, but had this, this current level of, of capability and technology? Um, what, would, what would scholarly publishing look like and scholarly communications? How would they interact? Um, would they be more open? Would they be more accountable, if you like? And would a different set of people potentially be dis um, considered as scholars? Um, for instance, publish, publishers um, are knowledge supporters and knowledge management um, entities. Uh, they could be seen as, as um, sites of, of scholarship as well. Um, you know, funders, um, again, data managers, citizen scientists um, could all be you know, part of this, this wider mix. So um, some of these discussions, you can see there's a, there's a website at the bottom there. You can go and have a, have a look. So some of it was about principles and responsibility and accessibility. Um, but uh, the subgroup I was in, in part of, we looked at uh, workflows about what um, open science practices actually would look like. And we also had to think about what the implications would be for research publishing. So, um, this is a, a picture of a, of a diagram, an infographic that um, my, my um, colleagues and I, the more brains, have been working on and they're getting ready to, to publish. And I've also put up a, a blog post there from the Scholarly Kitchen that we published about this. Um, so basically, um, We've been working on a, a UK national PID strategy, which was prompted by um, an inquiry into how to um, understand and enable um, an open access uh, publishing strategy for the OA. And think about if that happened, how would everybody involved with that process know what they were supposed to do and be enabled to do it? And they felt that the key was persistent identifiers. Um, just to, to um, clarify, a persistent identifier is a long lasting reference to a digital resource. So it's got two components. There's a, the unique identifier and um, underlying it, a service that locates the resource over time. So that's even if its location changes. 
So the, um, the URL becomes, if you like, the, the name of something that calls it rather than a, an indication of where it is in geographically in the net. So um, as you can see, they, um, we, we picked on um, and decided to prioritize um, a few um, persistent identifiers and their registries. So they're in the middle of the, the, um, the cycle um, and, um, and they're around the, the outputs. So that's cross-ref for articles, data site for, for data um, sets and, and most other outputs. We've got the ORCID for people um, we're looking at the um, research activity identifier, the RAID for projects, um, and then also the RAW research organization registry for um, organizations. And uh, we thought about it, if you start um, at the at the bottom of the of the six o'clock, if you like, on the on the circle, you start with um, the, the person in the institution who's having the ideas, who um, is needing to um, put together their request for funding which is the nine o'clock um, they, they come up to um, again to the um, back to the organization where they actually will be doing the research they'll be performing their activities working with each other and then it comes around to the, the three o'clock to the um, research output platforms so that's whether the publishers the preprint repositories um, the, the, the news the media all these other all these places where you know we, we talk about uh, what we've achieved but through, throughout the process um, everyone is is in you know, basically interacting with using and um, and passing information about these these identifiers and that will hopefully um, have a have a big um, effect on on how ultimately um, you know, the research canon or the research understanding um, is, is understood and how we're able to use it in the future. So, so this is a, a, a physical uh, representation of a, of a knowledge graph. So basically, if you've got the persistent identifiers, which um, will, will enable you to understand interdependencies and communities, and um, um, collaborations. That will hopefully then mean that you've got um, an understanding of, of um, how to save money, how to save time and to ask new questions. If you're able to automate information about the people, the articles, the citations, then you're gonna stop people having to endlessly rekey information either inwardly to their, their institution to update them on progress, um, what they're doing, what they've been trying to do, or perhaps to their funder for, um, for grant applications or to other institutions for um, uh, scholarship or promotion opportunities. Um, it also hopefully make us better able to understand um, where our, you know, who our collaborators are, where are our connections and where are we missing people, places um, and on opportunities funding. Um, as you can see, this is, this is you know, something like a nice ideal sort of um, uh, picture at the moment, but um, as we all know, at the moment, this isn't happening. And, um, and moreover, that the, the system itself is in, is in massive flux. Um, so for a start, um, I think fund, you know, other people, I mean, you know, non-standard or non-traditional publishers are becoming publishers. We've got um, funders like the European Commission, the Gates, Welcome, uh, have actually all launched their own publishing platforms for their own research. A number of universities are either opening their own presses um, or they're also um, building their repository capabilities as well, and really encouraging their researchers to, to take that seriously. Um, we also have um, community groups for specific interests. They might be regional or subject, um, but building preprint servers, and if you like, and, and encouraging their, their communities to, um, to, 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 build, to build repositories of information there. Um, and that's um, you know, good and healthy, it's innovative, you know, it, it, it um, provides new opportunities, but also again, uh, makes it more difficult to know which is the version of record, what should I as a researcher be, be, be thinking about, be, be, be doing, which mandate do I follow, what's going to be most um, advantageous for me in my future career. Um, so, so all these questions you know, continue to, to, be, to be asked and answered in different ways. 
And at the same time, publishers themselves are, are branching out um, where they um, traditionally were you know, like content providers and disseminators. Um, they're now moving into things like um, indexing services, providing knowledge hubs to connect um, you know, potential researchers with potential projects, um, perhaps providing tools um, they could be um, working with um, industry or academic partners to kind of aggregate um, and provide infrastructure services. Uh, so it's, it's becoming much more about um, sort of assets and partnerships and, and finding, um, finding value um, in what they have and what, they, what they're doing and finding new customers for, for those um, that value assets. And open science is opening up a range of new ways to, to connect people and work and to build also new knowledge management tools. Although all the time we're working with these legacy systems and our legacy incentives um, and understanding and that should keep pulling us back to that, that 17th century framework. So thinking about what can the publisher actually do about this? Um, I think it's really important to, to keep the, 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 the people who are actually producing the research, the researchers, the research contributors at, at the heart of the thinking, because they're, they're if you like, the, the still place in the middle of the storm, that they're continuing to do all of these things, but everybody else is, is seeking to, to understand their place and what they need to do, what they, what they have to do, what they, what they need to collaborate on to make things happen, to improve the knowledge canon. Um, a big part of, of um, uh, improving things, I think, will be to, to build collaborations um, and increase trust um, across stakeholder groups and, across, and also among the, the groups themselves. So to, um, to talk to people, to you know, have conferences like this, to, to um, um, exchange ideas. Um, part of that is also to be really transparent about the costs of the services that are being provided, you know, the amount of time that things are going to, to take, what the effort and the processes are. Um, my experience is that uh, when working with different stakeholders from different parts of the system, um, generally, um, I would say it's true that each member of, you know, if you like, between um, the researcher, the library, the university, the publisher, um, all feel that they're the ones doing the heavy lifting. They're the ones doing the bulk of the work and uh, everybody else is to, to an extent, um, you know, freeloading, uh, 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 not uh, coasting. They're not just putting in nearly as much effort. And that's partly because we, we don't understand what's required for things to come to us. And then the people we pass stuff on to, they don't understand. You know what's required. You know what was required to get it into that that form. So I think you know be able to um, express and also hear uh, about the, the value that other people are contributing is also a really important part of that. Going back to the, the infographic, you can see that there's a, there's a, if you like a constant um, exchange of information. If I put this information into the PID at this point, it's going to help you further down the line. And then if you add something there, then it will come back and it'll help me later on. So, um, so there's also very much a case of um, investigating both upstream and downstream opportunities, which again, open science um, makes potentially available to, to publishers. So what's happening at the point of, of first ideas and, and conferences? Are there ways to, in, um, to enable people to, to you know, publish and put their, their valid stamp on, on their ideas at an early point? What's happening around um, text and data mining? Um, are there you know, things way after the fact? Are there ways of, of um, updating people um, years later on, on what the impact of their research has been? And can you find grey literature, you know, policy documents that, that are using their ideas? Um, how can we um, collaborate with, with other players to combine insights um, and outputs, thinking about um, you know, correspond complementary data sets, um, you know, visualization tools that will enhance understanding, speed things up. So, um, and this then means you know, that, that um, things like pilot schemes are, are really you know, important for, for learning, for thought leadership, for, for gaining you know, reputation as a publisher, um, and also you know, find, finding out um, what, what other people are doing as well. 
So um, I think some of these um, organizations have already come up um, today and some might be spoken about some more, um, but also the rest of the conference. Um, but I think what's really important is these, these questions and these issues are so fundamental that I'd argue no single publisher can resolve them alone. In fact, there's a need for, for publishers, um, I think in, for some facets of their work, to themselves act with an open research mindset and work together to improve their capabilities and their ability to, to harness the power of open science. Um, you may know this uh, co uh, concept of co-opetition. Um, which is where um, other potential rivals, um, you know, competitors in a particular market, come together to, uh, to solve a particular problem, which is in all their benefit to, to solve. And then they continue to um, compete in other parts of, of the industry. Um, uh, another example would be in the car industry, where uh, they, uh, you know, a number of car manufacturers came together to look at seatbelt design. They realized that nobody buys a car on the basis of, a seat, basis of its seatbelt. So it made sense to combine resources, uh, design the, you know, the best seatbelts they could. Everyone uses them and they, they push out their, their um, competing budgets, time, effort to other points of design and performance. And that's something I think that's, that's quite a good lesson, I think, for the, for the publishing industry to, to think about which things are to be competed over and which things are, are to be collaborated on. And, uh, and so for organisations like STM and OASPA, um, that, that's where you, know, you find those sorts of communities, your fellow publishers. Um, and I think then with Research Data Alliance, Force 11, um, and, um, and, and others, to be honest, um, you, you find... Um, potential partners who, who are looking at things perhaps slightly differently, who are thinking more about um, the open science in terms of um, for, um, Force 11, um, but um, in terms of RDA, it might be more, you know, there are certainly funders, there are persistent identifiers, it's perhaps more about the technical ability um, and the, the solutions that, that people might want to, um, want to employ. So I will stop there because I want to know what um, what you think. I want to hear what um, ooh, what you have to say. Sorry, I'll stop sharing. Um, there we go. And um, and that's it. Thank you, thank you, uh, Fiona, for uh, this. Uh information and uh, it is useful for the early stage uh, uh, editors as well as publisher. Uh, you provide uh, uh, main, uh, main information here and uh, that will be useful for all. First of all, uh, that uh, one have to understand about to the uh, 21st century technology into the publishing. Right uh, now, there are so many journals which are following uh, the one PDF file, uh, like we had said, and uh, they are publishing their content uh, offline still. There is no proper process. So as you had mentioned into the first picture, the importance of the technology for the publisher. That, that was the first point. And uh, it is basically very much important when we talk about to the a uh, researcher, publisher, and the funding agency together the institutions. Because these four entities are uh, important in this uh, domain and how to identify one research institutions or university that how much uh, articles or what they are publishing. Second thing is same related to the scholars where they are basically taking the funds, where they are publishing and uh, from which institutions that you define through the identifiers. So that is also a part of important uh, of this uh, domain. And here uh, in the second last uh, slide, you mentioned about to the open ex, uh, uh, associations where uh, basically one publisher have to approach. So uh, the, all these things are uh, important and uh, the point basically uh, uh, here into the next uh, presentation, basically uh, Nabil is talking about the ORCID in uh, main. Uh, so 
uh, that is the main point uh, of the next uh, uh, next discussion so it it is really very important and uh, how basically uh, you know you can help uh, uh, to the uh, early stage uh, early stage publishers that what, is uh, what, sorry yeah go ahead please so um how can uh, what, what do early um, stage publishers need to know to be able to um, develop careers and, and flourish um, in, um, in the current space? Um, well, I would say, for instance, that certainly um, Force 11 and the Research Data Alliance are free to join. And um, you can also um, attend a lot of, um, you know, certainly sessions and, and meetings online, particularly recently, um, and certainly join working groups. Um, I think Research Data Alliance at the moment is probably a bit more active in the working groups, but, um, but the, the, you know, it's also a way of, again, building networks. And I think that's a, a really key um, thing just generally is to, if you like, think about well, what, what, I think as I was to say, publishers are not just publishers now and also, funders and universities are not just those things and they're therefore also sometimes publishers as well so it's thinking about um you know what am i interested in and who else is doing it um and are there ways of if you like making it easier for our researchers to to publish that we that we can help with and i, and I think um there's that that's something that you know particularly it, it's not just people who are early in their career but people who are young in their years if you like are really good at because that they are the, the you know the born digital natives they're going to have um uh if you like very kind of practical ideas often about well you know why don't they do it differently <laughs> whereas um perhaps those of us who have been in the system for longer we're thinking no no you can't change that uh, it's, it's sort of sacred, but it actually a lot of these things aren't and they need to be questioned. And um, I think at the moment the, the system is in, in the mood to be questioned. And um, I think I'm actually, um, I, I'm actually attending the Researcher to Reader conference at the moment as well. Um, and um, which, I'm, which I'm an organizer on. And certainly one of the things that's being discussed in that is how to ensure that early career, mid-career um, publishers um, are able to, to keep attending events, um, which, which they, you know, they, they should be, such as, such as in fact, Researcher to Reader, which is now hybrid. And I think it's going to always be hybrid now. And so there's, there's um, there's also thinking about how to, to find these sorts of events and attend them and ask questions at them and, and find your own ideas. And I think um, what's also definitely the case is that if you are, if you are early in your career, um, then it's, it's people like being asked questions, people like helping. So if you have a question or a problem, um, you know, don't be afraid about asking, asking questions and looking for people to, to connect with on, on LinkedIn as well. And, um, you know, think, you know again, um, it, I think particularly open, open science practice, I think in, um, it's inherently seeking to include and to consider new ideas and find new perspectives. So again, it's hopefully, it, it should be actually kind of a good open time to be a new publisher. Mm. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, for the collaboration purpose, whether that is uh, with the scholars or uh, uh, professors, it is time consuming, it takes time. And second thing, it supports we uh, coll uh, collaborating with them. Then uh, you mentioned the trust. Trust uh, is very important factor in the collaboration. So trust comes from the value. So if uh, one will give the value, obviously trust will come and uh, uh, the relationship will be strong. I think you had mentioned already in your presentation, this collaboration and trust. So, uh, but uh, uh, it is true that uh, for the sake of to say, it's very easy to say that we have to collaborate or, but it is very difficult to collaborate uh, and then again, provide the value uh, of in, in that. So, can you give uh, some tips that uh, if tips 
that uh, if suppose uh, we have to collaborate not only a national uh, funding agency, national uh, scholars, uh, but together it uh, international uh, agencies as well as funding agencies. Hmm. Yeah, no, um, and I, I agree. I, I um, have watched with interest, for instance, um, Hindawi as a publisher um, start off with um, a, a quite, I suppose, a, um, an ambiguous um, reputation uh, because people weren't quite sure about it um, and it perhaps didn't have um, pristine processes, um, but it has worked really, really hard to, um, to achieve, uh, a, you know, I suppose reputation to to be very transparent and to show what its values are and um, and then be able to uh, com you know, compete uh, on a, on a world stage and of course now it's um it was highly valued by by Wiley quite quite recently to to be bought um, to think about how to collaborate um, well I, I think something something that um, does help is to is to start um, putting in ideas to um, present at conferences, um, and it might just be might start off being a lightning talk, or it might be um, be on a panel. Um, so um, so again, to have a look at perhaps what conferences you might want to attend have done in recent years, and then contact the organisers, um, and then yeah, you know, and then be very very open about what it is that you you want to do, what you think you can contribute, and where you come from. Um, um, I'm trying to think in terms of, of building up uh, collaborations more generally. Again, it's it's um, trying to trying to be able to articulate the value that you bring, and I think that, again this is something um, I was looking at yesterday, trying to understand what's the value of open access. You know who who values it, and and because that means you can work out who's going to pay for it, and also um, how they'll how they'll be going to use it. And it might be actually it might depend if you're um, in the humanities, for instance, it's very, very different from if you're in um, bioengineering. And, uh, um, I, I don't know uh, more information about to the force 11 that you had but, mm, force 11. But uh, yesterday, uh, uh, Riona, uh, uh, from the open access switchboard, uh, she is uh, basically from the sister branch of uh, OSPA. So I have some idea about the OSPA and uh, STM research data, but what is uh, about this uh, force 11? Okay, um, so it's the um, future of um, research communication and e-scholarship mm -hmm. is what force stands for. Um, and it's um, it's just a very it's a loose organisation. If you like, you can you can just sign up to to be a member, um, and then then um, you have an opportunity to you know, join working groups. Um, I was recently on a working group which was um, actually set up in response to the the pandemic. Um, it was to look at how to continue um, providing open science training when it's all online so it's called repo um but um and again, again anyone's free to join and attend and um, and they can they can just uh read the messages look at the website um or, or they can come to the meetings and so forth um and again it also means you can see what other people are, are doing and potentially just get in contact with them um, so if you've got uh, an idea or if you've, you've started working on a tool um, and you want to see if there's somebody in you know, the life sciences who's interested in tool making um, as well, who, who might want to have a look at it with you or, or you know, tell you how, how to market it to North America, um, it, it would work you know, to, to, to help you, to, you know, support in that. Um, there is a, a conference, uh, I think, which I think should be happening the end, towards the end of the year. Um, I'm afraid I don't know exactly what's happening with that this year, um, but there is also, um, which I, I didn't mention, the Force 11's to Scholarly Communications Institute, um, an annual um, summer school, and, um, and that, I'm on the steering committee for, for that, 
and um, and that runs in August, or sort of July and August. And that's um, also now, um, well, it certainly has been entirely online for the last couple of years, and I think it will continue to be online at the very, you know, it, it will be hybrid or online. And that's very, very um, cheap to um, attend. And, um, and um, we do we do a range of, of basically all the instructors um, provide courses in a couple of time zones as well to make sure that that um, you can you can speak to people from around the world. Um, but the it also has a, a load of, um, sort of plenary sessions that um, you know last year we did a research data across twenty four hours so it started off um, in California and went through Australia Asia Africa Europe. And then North America, South America, yeah, yeah, basically. So, so again, I think it, I think it, it only it costs very like ten dollars, I think, to go to the plenaries, um, and it costs probably about a hundred dollars to attend a course. But you, there are a number of um, scholarships. Um, it's it's not that hard to get a scholarship if you if you sign up. So. Um, that would be, I think, a, a really good opportunity um, in the next six months um, to do. Okay, right. Uh, and uh, this is very a general question because when we talk about to the open science, in open science, the purpose is that whatever we are, whether we are performing the experiment or in uh, doing some kind of uh, theoretical calculation, at that time, uh, we have to provide all the data, all the calculations, all the result and analysis for all to discuss and uh, to share, to collaborate, right? But, wow. uh, <laughs> yes. but uh, oh. on the other hand, uh, in a um, uh, developing country, uh, people try to hide their research before publication. So there are two things. One is uh, uh, moving with the open science, and second is with traditional approach, where uh, one basically hiding their idea before publications. So uh, is the open science is in favor of more uh, spreading the knowledge uh, awareness or the earlier one model of the publishing? Mm. No, it's a really interesting question. I think that the um, if you like, you, you could say it's kind of scientific colonialism um, in some ways. It's it's a, an assumption that um, everybody is similarly resourced as Europe and North America is resourced for science, and um, and therefore everyone should be doing it that way, their way. Um, I think. Okay, so nuanced um i think open science but also when, when i say open science i would mean open research as well it would be any any discipline um which i think is the way it's used um in in mainland europe um it it, it is going to mean different things to to different disciplines anyway um i think there's also a sense that at the moment to do true open science would be so exhausting you'd never get anything done um and and as such, you know, there, there's a certain, you know, practicality. So if you like, we have some ideals that it would be nice to, to have if it meant that everybody could contribute and everyone could, could read. But um, that's, that's one way away. Um, in the meantime, um, I think there, there's, there, is incre there is understanding that if you have a funder who has funded for your science to be open, then you, you need to make it open but if you don't have that then um, perhaps what you um, can best do if you like is is um, optimize how much you know how much information you provide um, by which I mean um, you you um, you may you know either need to keep your you know results and um, and method you know a lot of information about your work behind some kind of wall um, embargoed, you know, in a, in a closed space, you know, that could be for sensitivity reasons, and it could be because um, otherwise you're going to get scooped by somebody else with your morals. But um, but to at least communicate, yeah, 
put information out there about what you're doing so that people know it's happening and people know it's there and if they want to know more about it they could ask they can ask you and then you can make a decision um and the analogy i'd have with, with that is um if you go to a, a supermarket and um there aren't any lemons and you go to where the lemons normally are and sometimes that appear they'll just get rid of everything and i think do they actually sell lemons or they've moved the lemons, what's happening? But sometimes, which I find a lot more helpful, they'll just literally have a little sign saying, sorry, no lemons, you know, not available. And I'm thinking, right, so if I need lemons from here, this is where I come back next time, or, you know, I can go back and, and ask when they come back, whatever. But um, if you like, it, it, it places it. And it means that you're, you know, you're still in that conversation. And, um, and, you, and again, you, you, you've, got some, you've got control, but you, you've also, you've you've um laid claim to those ideas you're you're participating um does that does that help yeah oh. and uh, it will help uh, mm. uh sure because uh one more question here uh, i got some sense uh, uh that you mentioned it basically uh depends on the uh funders and uh, depends on the institution so if funder basically uh, you are getting, uh, the scholar is getting the funds and the policy or publication policy of the funding is so that uh, they are promoting open science, then uh, there is no problem. You can say all the data, all the result and analysis before publication and can invite other one for the collaboration, right? Yeah. Mm. And, uh, now, the the next question is related to the collaboration and because you are uh, associated uh, with the uh, literature work and uh, you did your dealing in english so uh, in earlier presentation uh, we have one speaker uh, that also bit, uh, related to the literature and uh, had mentioned a very good information in, about to the india in reference to the uh, i am talking just now in reference to the India, but it may be true for other countries. In literary section, in literary domain, because we people are we people belongs to the science, and we know about to the science and that culture that uh, in sciences, in general, uh, there are uh, more there are two or more than uh, two authors remain in the research article. Right. Uh, there are some collaborators uh, like. Oh yes, yes. But uh, uh, the presenter mentioned here uh, in reference to the India, I am mentioning, but it may be true for other country, that in literary work, most of the time there is only one author, or it's rare that uh, two or three authors. So what is the reason or uh, what do you think basically you are also part of the literary work and you had observed in Davi or any other, with the, any other publisher if they are publishing any literary uh, journal. So what is the reason why the people of uh, uh, social sciences and humanities cannot collaborate like the science people? Oh, interesting. Um, well, Obviously, there's a massive range of disciplines, again, um, in social sciences and humanities. Um, mm. And I think probably quite a lot of social sciences will be amenable to collaboration. Um, thinking um, so sort of sociology, for instance, um, things like you know, long, you know, population studies, mm. the kind of thing that you, you would... Um, collaborate on probably often psychology as well which has got um a much more of a kind of scientific technique in the way that it's advanced or some branches of it have anyway um but i think i think um, where uh, it's partly a pace thing i think some um again because often with certainly literature um people's ideas don't come as the result of some kind of funding call or, or other, other prompt. Um, there might, might be something that you long sit on and um, germinate in your, your spare time. And I think they've become immensely personal. And, um, and they are, uh, you know, if you like, more like a baby than a, <laughs> than a, a product. And, um, and so people do want to, want to retain the, the hold. So um, when you'll often, I suppose, get, co um, you know, obviously edited, edited, you know, volumes 
with a, a chapter by each by different people. And then you might get co-editors, for instance. Um, but I think it's I think it's um, it's also about the kind of knowledge that you're talking about. So the fact is um, it's subjective. So there's only going to be one subject, um, which is you know, me, the writer, um, in terms of their, their viewpoint, whereas probably, you know, the more you go towards social science and then to the harder sciences, um, you are at least trying to, to show objectivity or um, that you've, you've considered a range of viewpoints. And that's a strength, if you like, to, to be able to, um, you know, perhaps bring, um, you know, different discipline angles to particular problems. Um, so, so, so yeah, it, yeah. It may be uh, that most of the time uh, in uh, social sciences, uh, that, that is the main part of when we uh, see in terms of the uh, globalization in terms of the population, in terms of the environment and the other things, uh, right? That may be a, a part of the, or uh, related to the architecture. Architecture is different, uh, but mm -hmm. uh, related to the culture, right? Uh, in that terms, uh, basically people can collaborate, but most of the time, either the scholars are limited to the local problems or local uh, things. That may be a reason or not. That may be a reason uh, from my point mm. of view, mm. right? Uh, no, so, I think you're right. Yeah, I think that um, uh, a lot of humanities domains or disciplines are tiny, if you like. They can be very, very specialised, and so there will only be a, f you know, if you like, a few key people who's everybody in the world that you need to to interact with because that's the number of experts. Um, so again, that might, that might also mean it's it's difficult to um, collaborate because then that would be half of you ganging up on the other half, perhaps. Um, but um, I think again, um, thinking about some of the people that, um, that I've come across in in the humanities space, the digital humanities mm -hmm. do act a bit differently. Again, um, they they can be very collaborative, um, uh, but again, I think it might be because if you once you move things up online and start doing the collaborating it it, it does make you behave differently i think maybe you get different sorts of outputs then as well yeah now now uh, if there is any question from the audience side because uh, since last uh, 10 15 minutes i am discussing if there is any question from the audience side uh, most welcome related to the open science and uh, the practices, uh, if you have, most welcome. And uh, is there any question? Uh, from our audience, uh, any question uh, related to the open science or anything related to it? So it, uh, if there is no question, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Fiona, for this wonderful discussion and your time at the, uh, in this, uh, you know, yeah, uh, in this um, session. And uh, it was really great. And uh, hopefully we will connect and uh, we'll ask uh, something more uh, after this session. And no, yesterday, uh, Duncan, actually, when we were discussing about uh, the Indian chapters, uh, he mentioned, and uh, Mary also mentioned about to you uh, uh, that you are giving the presentation. Mary, Mary Hedison uh, also mentioned about to you. So uh, thank you, thank you so much uh, for your uh, wonderful time and discussion our detail, in all the things in detail. Uh, I hope our Indian scholars uh, will get some idea about to it and. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Fiona, for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very looking, much looking forward to seeing what comes out of this conference. I hope the rest of it goes really well. Thank you. Thank you. And now I invite uh, Professor S. N. Panda. Uh, to introduce our uh, next speaker, Nabil, who basically will talk about the ORCID. 
and uh, Professor S. N. Panda. Just uh, uh, first of all, let me uh, let the participant uh, to know about to you uh, about to the curing a little about uh, that is a part of Chitkara University. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sushil, for giving me the opportunity. Uh, we have a research center in Chitkara University, uh, Curin, that is Chitkara University Research and Innovation Network. And uh, we are looking after the projects, publications, patents, and uh, even the entrepreneurships. And we involve the students in our real-time projects and uh, we uh, do the devices for the need of uh, the base of the pyramid. So that is main aim uh, of this particular research center is to provide the support and help and uh, develop the necessary innovations for the base of the pyramid, right? Now uh, I have given the uh, responsibility to introduce uh, uh, Mr. Navil CV. Uh, Navil CV, engagement lead of global director member Navil CV is responsible for fostering ORCID community within the global direct members. As a part of his responsibilities, Navi supports ORCID direct members as they engage with the ORCID to integrate different workflows and benefit from the ORCID API interoperability. With an energy engineering degree, Navil is passionate about the open research, as well as diversity and inclusivity in the innovation and research eco ecosystem. Now, I, re I request Navi uh, to please take over the charge. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sushil, for giving me the opportunity uh, to introduce Mr. Navi. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor uh, Bandan. Thank you very much, Professor um, Dr. Sushil. This is really uh, an honor to, to be with you today at, at this conference. Uh, I'll try to add um, like some value to what uh, Dr. Fiona shared and um, to what you know, all, all the speakers shared during the conference. So I'm gonna um, hope that you can hear me well, right? Just check. Great, thank you very much. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen on this uh, tab and then I hope that you all can see my screen. Yes. Great. Uh, so yeah, the purpose of my uh, talk today is really uh, to, um, yeah, basically introduce ORCID for, uh, let's say, the new users and new researchers and freshly, um, uh, let's say, uh, graduate researchers and students but also uh, to provide um, like an update on um, what is ORCID for the, uh, you know, uh, the elder generation of, of researchers, uh, which is very important because, um, you know, now moving to uh, this online or digital open research uh, publishing infrastructure, uh, I think it's um, very useful and it's very important to uh, consider identifying things, right? Identifying um, users, identifying uh, publications and works and contributions, and also identifying research uh, organizations. So uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's my first slide. Um, I, uh, I'm Nabil Ksibi, uh, so I add my name here in, uh, in yeah, the uh, Latin alphabet and the uh, Arabic alphabet, but this part doesn't uh, mean a lot. So well, I'll be focusing on this third part actually, which is the link to my ORCID record, All right? So um, without further ado, what we will be talking about today is a uh, small introduction about ORCID, where we will be describing the ORCID's mission, um, an overview of the ORCID offers. And uh, of course, we'll be uh, checking what is about this ORCID ID and we'll be, um, seeing uh, an overview of the ORCID records itself. Then uh, we'll be talking a little bit about the value of um, this ORCID ID for authors and for publishers. 
All right. Uh, at the end, I'm just gonna try to bring a couple of examples of the ORCID adoption and how we are doing uh, globally. Uh, so the ORCID mission is really you know, inspired from uh, a challenge um, that is you know, a very old challenge that um, is faced by uh, scholarly, uh, um, you know, communication community, uh, by uh, researchers, by students, uh, and this everywhere in the world, right? Uh, and during this conference, I heard a lot about similarity of names. I heard a lot about, um, yeah, changing names from uh, a position to another, um, how to get uh, contribution for my um, research and, um, you know, how to get recognized for my contribution in general uh, using my um, name. Unfortunately, a name is not enough. So in, in a world where, uh, you know, we have machines uh, speaking to each other, uh, we have uh, machine to machine, um, you know, programs and workflows, um, some systems and some platforms doesn't really acquire the name uh, of the researcher or, or the individual as uh, it should. You know, it really depends on, on the forms, on, on the platforms. Um, some forms, uh, you know, when, when you are registering for your profile, doesn't include the middle name, for example, um, doesn't give you um, other possibilities to write your name. Uh, so this is why ORCID thought about this unique identifier, which is free for any individual you know, contributing in the research uh, ecosystem, uh, and which is also interoperable with a lot of other uh, systems. So this is um, mainly um, you know, the, the, the essence of, uh, of the ORCID mission and why ORCID is here. Uh, so this ambiguation, I hope that you know, all the participants uh, really uh, know about um, the definition of this term um, is it's really you know lifting ambiguity and uh, recognizing persons and users for their um, you know contribution without um, having you know the similarity of, of names and similarity of uh, um, of name writings uh, sometimes. Uh, then the ORCID mission, so uh, really uh, the ORCID mission is to, uh, you know, build a world or create a world where uh, all who participates in research, innovation and scholar scholarship are uniquely identified and connected to their contributions across disciplines, borders and time, All right. So um, not only we are providing this uh, ORCID ID, we are also providing a couple of other, let's say, um, uh, interrelated services that will help ORCID in conveying this mission. If we uh, check about those offerings, um, very, you know, very simple and very uh, straightforward, we provide uh, three uh, things. <laughs> the first one is unique identifier, which is the ORCID ID, which is the 16 digit that you are using uh, to identify um, your contributions and to identify yourself. This identifier is uh, persistent. And um, as, as uh, Dr. Fiona shared the definition of the persistent identifier, uh, which is a long lasting um, reference to an object or uh, sorry, to a um, like a thing on the internet, it can be an object, it can be uh, a reference to uh, the name of the individual or uh, the organizational identifier. So that's, um, uh, that's uh, regarding the volley under which ORCID ID is, uh, let's say, classified. Then uh, it's important to say that this identifier is free of charge for researchers and for individuals um, who are contributing to the research uh, cycle. The second point is the ORCID records, and we're gonna check what is the ORCID record and um, what can we add there, how can we connect it to other platforms, and uh, how can we get the most out of this, uh, you know, centralized um, place where we have all of our contributions. 
Then uh, we also provide a set of application programming interface, uh, API, uh, and yeah, please uh, let me know if you don't know, if you have uh, or you don't know um, what is an API and uh, uh, how it's uh, linked to the ORCID record. Um, but in essence, this uh, API is uh, really, you know, uh, the interface uh, that are helping systems and users as well to connect with the ORCID registry that is containing all the ORCID records, right? So uh, we thought about this interface or this like um, communication um, tool, if we can say it, uh, to help users and to help um, publishers, service providers, funders, really all institutions that are um, contributing to the research cycle to connect and you know pull information from this registry or push information to this registry or just read information set um, uh, you know with visibility set to trusted parties, right? So three things: the ORCID record, the ORCID ID, and the APIs. So with those three things, we can help. Um, a lot of institutions and organizations to uh, implement ORCID and to benefit of this um, authentication, let's say. Now the ORCID ID and a, a small overview on the ORCID records. Uh, this is like a template record or an example record uh, with um, Sofia Maria Hernandez Garcia as a uh, researcher. Uh, she's having all her activities added in her ORCID records, as you can see here from um, employment um, uh, to education and qualifications, um, invited position, membership and services, funding, research resources, works, peer review, really anything that is related to her contribution or to her efforts can be linked and synced with the ORCID record. Uh, we'll talk about the two methods to add this information into the ORCID records, uh, and then, um, and then, yeah, we'll expand a little bit on some examples uh, around this. So, if uh, Sophia is having a complete ORCID record and really, uh, you know, having everything uh, there, uh, she will benefit of the portability of the data that is there. So, I can really uh, export my the whole ORCID record in one page. Uh, I can also use my ORCID record to uh, connect it to other platforms. So that's one of the uh, portability forms, let's say. Uh, she's benefiting of naming disambiguation. So if she's having one unique ORCID ID um, and um, in, in that ORCID record, she can add all the variation, variations of her name uh, in English in, or in any other language, uh, she's um, um, she, she, she's you know halfway to uh, to obtaining um, this uh, disambiguation of name. Now, if the other uh, part, which is the uh, university system or the publishing system or the funding system, is also adopting ORCID and can authenticate this ORCID ID on the um, on the ORCID registry, means that uh, they will say when when Sophia will be connecting with her with her ORCID record, um, the system will call the ORCID API or the ORCID registry and check if this ORCID ID is really in the registry. So this is what we call authentication, right? And this is really important to uh, in, in the signing process and um, uh, in helping researchers, you know, quickly log in and not filling again all uh, all the forms and all um, let's say. Um, the fields related to their profile. The name's flexibility, as I said uh, here on the name disambiguation, we can add all the variations of, of our name in uh, all the languages in one and unique place, which is um, the AKA section in the ORCID record. Uh, and of course, as I said, more time for research and less time in filling forms and do uh, the administrative uh, tasks, which is here reduced administrative burden. Uh, and yeah, as I said, you'll have everything centralized in one place, which is um, all your research, or all your search basically in one and unique uh, place. So this is the uh, circle diagram. Uh, I like the circle because this is really explaining that uh, Sophia can really interact with 
institutional systems, whether you know, institutional repositories at the university, um, publishing system or um, you know, grant submission system. Uh, Sophia can also interact with uh, the discovery and profiling system. If a university, for example, is having a, a CV central system where um, they want to populate all uh, the information regarding their students, their researchers, uh, then um, Sophia here can really you know, share her ORCID ID and connect all this information with that system. Um, yeah, also, you know, there's also the, all the known, uh, other known platforms like uh, Google Scholars, like, um, uh, yeah, you know, the profiling systems and um, um, all, all the platforms that uh, basically collecting this kind of information and, um, uh, and providing them in certain profile. Uh, with the funding system, it's uh, also uh, the same thing. And sorry, so for the publishing for the publisher and publishing system, this is um, really related to uh, uh, publishing systems and uh, publishing platforms. But in terms of funding, um, here's where uh, the Sophia can connect with her ORCID record to that grant submission system. So sorry, I just uh, you know. Uh, inverse publisher with funder, but the idea is there, the idea is the same, grabbing information from the ORCID record and pushing information to uh, the ORCID record. And now the value for authors and publishers, of course, uh, there's here, you know, these six values that, uh, yeah, you, you can read here uh, on the slide, but briefly, uh, this is explaining how uh, the publishers and journals can understand um, their authors or their researchers uh, by you know, collecting the ID, um, by um, collecting all the information related to previous uh, publications and previous contribution. ORCID can also uh, help in OA policy compliance and you know, transformative agreement um, management, let's say, by acting as uh, an open trusted source of affiliation data. Uh, better viewer selection. So we'll see uh, how uh, it looks like on the peer review side. Uh, the peer review recognition uh, as well. So we'll have, we already have a lot of systems that uh, already integrated ORCID um, for uh, peer review recognition, including the uh, UKRI, uh, which is recently um, integrated ORCID uh, to basically um, uh, acknowledge, let's say, the, the reviewers' um, works and the reviewers' uh, contribution. Um, there is also uh, the enhanced discoverability, so um, disseminating uh, the knowledge and disseminating um, the information that's part of, uh, let's say, the open research mission. And uh, ORCID is ensuring this, let's say, this, this point um, uh, yeah, by, by having an ORCID ID, which is um, available, that can be available to public and then can be uh, connected to any other platform and system. Uh, so a more consistent experience, um, of course, if you need more than uh, one um, access, for example, to the API or the ORCID registry, uh, you can upgrade your membership if you are uh, an ORCID member. Um, and then uh, integrate ORCID really with all your systems. You, if you have a, an HR system that you want to, uh, you know, um, feed uh, from, um, you know, the, the ORCID record, if you have a CV central system, if you have a um, grant management system or university press, all those can be connected with ORCID and you can benefit of uh, the ORCID authentication uh, starting from those uh, integrations. Uh, and of course, interconnected infrastructure. So this is really proving the interoperability of the ORCID API and how uh, it can, um, you know, it can work and it can uh, communicate with uh, all uh, systems and, uh, and platforms uh, known in the uh, research ecosystem. Uh, if you want to explore more, if you don't know about ORCID as an institution, 
uh, I would invite you to do those three steps. I will share, hopefully we can share, uh, you know, the presentation slides after um, the conference, but you just need to go here on this slide, click and check the service provider um, or certified service providers, uh, including, you know, OJS and including a um, lot of systems, uh, either open or, uh, or commercial, uh, but check if your system is there. If not, uh, we have also another list, which is called the enabled systems. And you can uh, check also if you have your system there. If not, it's, if, and you have developers, it's easy and uh, not so complex to prepare, plan and test your integration on the sandbox. Uh, then when you really acquire uh, the knowledge about ORCID, how can I integrate my system with ORCID? How can I benefit of this integration? Then uh, you contact us uh, for membership, and then we will guide you through uh, the next steps and um, really, uh, you know, support your onboarding and assist you in uh, launching your integration, which is the third step, right? Uh, and uh, which is also uh, important because right after the launch, you can monitor, uh, let's say, the traffic uh, that this integration uh, generated, like connected IDs, uh, pushed works, um, uh, the type of works that are pushed, um, everything related to, uh, you know, really the, the, the submission uh, in details. Um, you can also use this um, metadata in, uh, in you know, different other systems and um, uh, really, uh, you know, have uh, this connection with ORCID that is ensuring um, the ORCID, the, the author disambiguation and a link in their contribution to their um, profile and to your system. And uh, um, talking about linking the contribution to your profile and to uh, the publisher system, uh, now, if, if, if you talk a little bit about the ORCID DOI auto link feature or what we call auto update, which is a nice feature uh, uh, that is um, a, a common work uh, between Crossref data site and ORCID, uh, where uh, if you are a, an author uh, and um, you, you are linking your ORCID ID uh, to the author profile of the publisher or the university press or, or the journal, uh, you can also invite co-authors to link uh, your DOI too. Then in the next step, if the publisher embeds, you know, author's ORCID ID in the metadata when the manuscript um, or data set is accepted, uh, then Crossref and data sites will check automatically for, uh, you know, this ORCID ID in, in the metadata. And, um, and really, uh, you know, when assigning this DOI, there will be this this uh, procedure of check, which is um, resulting to uh, an automatic push of this publication to the ORCID record, right? And then at the end, uh, you know, uh, the ORCID record will receive the new publication from Crossref or data site. And of course, if permissions granted, uh, they can add to the author's uh, ORCID records. So, so here, when I when we say if permissions granted, it really depends on the level of um, integration that um, that the system is having. OJS, for example, is offering for ORCID members to push, um, you know, publications and uh, works. Uh, OPS, uh, Open Preprint Server, is allowing the same. So these are for you know the open uh, access uh, journal systems. Uh, a lot of also. Uh, commercial systems or uh, hybrid systems I, are um, also um, uh, offering, let's say, um, uh, a link to this functionality. Uh, but mainly, uh, you know, as a small journal or, uh, you know, a, a new uh, editor, uh, if you are registered with Crossref and data site, you can benefit of, uh, of this functionality. Uh, on the other figure, it's a snapshot of the ORCID registry and just to show, uh, let's say, the percentage of journal articles in our registry and uh, the number uh, that is presenting. So uh, 25 million, around 26 million um, um, journal articles added, uh, which is a um, considerable number, let's say, uh, to, uh, to have. 
Then uh, the peer review and reviewer recognition um, system or re reviewer contribution recognition. Um, I, I have this small example from um, faculty opinions with this assertion to the authors record. And you can see in the details, the DOI of um, this assertion or uh, this review uh, and every, uh, all the um, details, let's say related to, uh, to this review. Same thing for uh, F1000. This is the, uh, an assertion, a review assertion where we have the DOI, we have the name of the organization and uh, a description of the review. And um, sorry, and here uh, is the, um, how to, well, an example from reviewer credits uh, showing how, uh, how easy to, to synchronize peer reviews with the ORCID record. Um, but you can you know, check on the reviewer's credits, how uh, the ORCID integration is built there. Uh, well, I'll not go in details to, on this slide, but just to show you, uh, you know, the different uh, steps and different phases uh, of, uh, of submission. So it's a day of a life in a manuscript, uh, let's say, um, again, Sophia, um, as a researcher, uh, she's signing into a journal and getting identified. And then, um, you know, always using the, the ORCID ID, we'll have, um, uh, let's say, the link to uh, the review uh, that they can, uh, or she can edit and, uh, let's say, uh, add her uh, review. Then uh, this information or uh, like, um, um, as a publication, uh, the, it, it will be, uh, let's say, publish it on on the on the ORCID record. Um, then linking this to discoverability, um, this will really uh, you know bring um, better and easier uh, system connection, uh, better reader experience, and easier discoverability. Uh, you can also use this workflow or the result of this workflow in reporting, and which is uh, really uh, you know. Uh, um, having this final goal or final objective, which is reducing uh, administrative burden and um, uh, having more time in, 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 let's say, doing research, basically. Uh, so that's the uh, most important phase, let's see, uh, in this diagram, um, how ORCID can um, enable, let's say, or uh, um, launch this process. Uh, and uh, when this, you know, ORCID ID is linked to the metadata, it can uh, really go on all, all, all the process and loop back uh, to the ORCID record um, without losing anything, without, you know, uh, uh, doing further, let's say, or adding further steps or doing further uh, actions. Uh, now, in terms of ORCID adoption, uh, so I like the slide because, and we are having a lot of more tweets, let's say, um, day, day over day from authors, from researchers, um, asking journals and asking publishers and editors uh, to at least use ORCID for the sign-in because this is really uh, helping them in accessing directly, you know, the submission system and not losing time and sometimes uh, not facing rejections or, uh, you know, uh, complications or errors. Um, so examples from India, uh, of course, we have the um, Shitkara University. Uh, I think this is a repository system, uh, or something like a profiling or, or publication system. But there we have uh, the ORCID ID of this uh, researcher or this doctor, uh, which is also in the profile of the, um, uh, uh, um, it's also in, in, in his um, own profile, right? Uh, what we really aim to do is to have this connection um, uh, automated, means that Dr. Rahul here uh, should be authenticating his ORCID ID uh, so that it can be linked to uh, the, uh, let's say, profile uh, system or this uh, um, publishing system. And then depending on the scopes of this, uh, let's say, uh, authorization, 
um, this system will be able to either pull information from the ORCID record, like uh, anything related to this uh, researcher, like pub previous publications, fundings, um, invited positions, employment, anything related to that, and fill in to uh, this system and vice versa. Uh, if, if you want to um, get in uh, information from the system to the ORCID record, then uh, it's called synchronization um, of data, let's say, between the registry and uh, your system. There's also uh, the ERIN system, which is a national uh, system uh, created by Inflipnet. We also have there, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, the use of public API, um, but we are now uh, in discussion with Inflipnet um, in order to enhance, let's say, this uh, integration and uh, be able to uh, you know, circulate information between the ERIN system and uh, the ORCID registry. Uh, in terms of uh, members, uh, we have um, our uh, unique member in, in, in India, which is uh, IIT Bombay. Um, they are working hard to integrate with DSpace, uh, their institutional repository. Um, the DSpace integration is not easy uh, unless you are uh, already in DSpace 7 or uh, you know, those uh, um, higher versions. Um, but DSpace 7 is having something ready for ORCID, right? So in the, the upcoming months, we'll be uh, knowing how, um, how easy uh, an integration with DSpace can be. Uh, then uh, globally, so just a couple of numbers. Uh, we are 24 uh, consortia. We're working on the, uh, now, on, on this moment, we are working on the 25th consortium with Chile uh, joining us. Um, we have uh, almost, uh, you know, uh, 88 million uh, total works added. We are operating in 55 countries, and we have 1,200 integration with uh, sy different systems. We are also 1,203 member organization, and we have around 7 million yearly active record. And uh, I thank you so much for uh, this opportunity. Uh, I welcome all the questions. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nagri, for providing all uh, things in detail. And uh, it is really wonderful uh, to know more about to the uh, ORC, uh, ORCID. And uh, uh, there are many things, actually, uh, that may be in, uh, in uh, our audience mind. Uh, they are interested to ask uh, some question. Uh, let me uh, give up first of all uh, to the audience. If audience have any question, please uh, go ahead and uh, ask the question uh, through the chat box, please. And uh, now we'll hear first question coming is from the Hesika side. On behalf of the Hesikas, she is, I think, uh, the undergraduate student. Right, so her question is, uh, is there a particular age or educational level suitable for creating ORCID or even undergraduate student can also create? Is it advisable for undergraduates uh, to proceed with it or they should do it in a later stage? A very good question, I think. Yeah, yeah, indeed. That's, that's a very good question. Uh, and yeah, sorry, during my presentation, I referred to, uh, let's say, graduates or, or postgraduates, uh, but we really aim and, uh, you know, it, this is a uh, nirvana vision or like dream vision to have um, uh, all who participate in, in scholarly, uh, uh, you know, activities having an ORCID ID. So um, I, I'm, I'm, Good for the idea for uh, you know starting from college, uh, you can work on your uh, ORCID record, uh, add there all the projects that you uh, did, you know even at uh, at the college phase or uh, um, you know even before if you have any kind of contribution to research or um, this is like a starting of uh, your big idea that you want to achieve uh, when you finish your studies, um, then yeah. ORCID is very welcome to see, you know, those contributions added to the ORCID record, even at the very, very early stage. Uh, Navili, uh, if I am not, uh, if I am correct, it is not uh, limited only to the research article. It is 
all kind of contribution, whether in terms of the open educational resources, in terms of the uh, any 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 related work, and it should be basically approachable to the colleges, associated uh, colleges actually. Right now, most of the researchers who are associated with the universities and uh, well reputed institutions actually only those people are following ORCID. So my suggestion to uh, all the audience, which basically belongs to the colleges, college is basically a, a part of the university, right? But it's small in the size. And their faculty members basically uh, have to encourage uh, to create the ORCID or CID and uh, whatever they are doing, because uh, you had clearly mentioned in the beginning that picture, not only the research article, there are so many uh, scope, basically uh, your educational institution, uh, your other activity, whether that is reviewing or any other things, or you are creating any content. So for all, for all to discriminate uh, you, your identity from the others for that uh, work actually, that I understood. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I'm gonna uh, copy here the link to uh, the scopes that are, um, let's say, supported by the ORCID registry. Uh, and that really, you know, shows um, what you can add to your ORCID record. You know, you, you can add from, you know, the, the classic journal article uh, to uh, really, you know, a preprint to a research tool, uh, to even translation websites that you worked on, working paper, um license patent uh you know annotation per artistic performance really anything that you did you know during your uh, scholarly um, career you can add it to the orchid record and if there is something missing then uh, we are very um you know w welcoming the idea to add uh, those kind of things for now this is inspired from the castray uh, standards uh i think it's in, in um uh, yeah, we are we are actually trying to get in up to date with our, those um, let's say work types, and we are trying to include uh, all the activities that uh, can be related to uh, the research um, in general. There is one thing uh, that basically my I have noticed because a publishing model is changing uh, time to time. And nowadays, uh, some journal had started to put the video content also, right? Uh, similar uh, F1000 you had mentioned here, that they also changed their approach for the traditional uh, publishing. So tomorrow, it, it might be that uh, people who are writing the blog can be a part of the it. Uh, obviously, it is totally different from the uh, research article publishing or that uh, a professional uh, journal website, but it might be uh, the content of the scholar can be helpful to the society, and that can be part of identity. Yes, yeah. So definitely, I think if we are, we are talking about, let's say, um, kind of presentation or other uh, media uh, that we want to uh, link, let's say, to an activity on the ORCID record. Um, then, um, yeah, it really depending on the content of, of this media or the content of this um, um, this work, uh, and then link it to the work type, uh, which is the um, the most close work type, right? So if, if it's a video, for example, on uh, encyclopedia entry, uh, then uh, it should go under the encyclopedia entry. A work type wallet right if it's um like um yeah something inspired from uh, an article um then it can go under um let's say uh, the category of journal article um but then yeah the the, the assertion is really flexible and um the media uh, that is used to let's say present this work um can um yeah depending on the content on this media uh, we can really link um, um, let's say that uh, performance of that work to uh, the orchid record under one of the work types because um, uh, i have also observed many researcher basically they have their own website and uh, they write some article in terms of you can say blogging 
Mm-hmm. So that kind of contribution, I think one can include into the orchid because that is the uh, contribution of that individual, right? Uh, mm-hmm. But here, uh, when uh, basically we are providing this type of information, those who are not aware, and uh, they can basically uh, can copy of other uh, people content. So is there any uh, mode to check uh, that the content which basically one person is updating on their profile is their own or not? At right, at, at now. So uh, yeah, for the moment we are not doing um, like um, these kind of checks. Um, because this is an open registry, right? Um, anything can add, uh, yeah, anyone can add, uh, you know, anything on, on the registry. Uh, but then uh, we are really counting on the institutional assertions, uh, you know, in order to make those uh, records trustworthy. So um, if a publisher, um, uh, yeah, can, can, can integrate with ORCID in a cert publication that will be under, uh, you know, the source will be under this publisher's name or this journal's name. Uh, unfortunately for individuals, um, you can use the public API. I mean, as an individual, you can go to your ORCID records, uh, open developer's tool, create your integration from there, add your redirect URI and link it to your own personal website. But uh, you cannot sync publications. Right, because using, you are using the public API, it's limited to individuals. It's not, we are not supporting lots, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the public API. We are having a user, um, user group, Google user group, where you can post your question there and contribute to, uh, to an answer and or have a knowledge or, or a response to your, uh, your question from there. But as an individual, uh, unfortunately, you cannot synchronize uh, your pub- your own you know, personal publications from your website to um, uh, to let's say your registry. But your university press can do it. Your university can do it. Your uh, publisher can do it. Uh, your funder uh, can do it. You know all the institutions that um, let's say helped in in this work or in this publication can do that for you, of course. Uh, by becoming, um, you know, a, a member and integrating uh, your, their system with Orchid. But that's so, a good question. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Um, Sushil. I'm going to uh, check further responses, let's say, and further answers yeah. to this question. Coming in my mind that uh, because of this pandemic, open educational resources uh, content has increased. And if suppose I am a member of the Orchid and uh, my university, uh, wants to look the contribution of uh, a teacher in terms of the same point that I had discussed with you, then it basically will appear in their databases that their faculty, their uh, teacher basically are contributing in this way. So from that point of view, it will be useful uh, that I, I, I feel. And now, uh, Wani, uh, are you thinking to ask some th- question? Uh, it will be great if you have something in your mind and uh, uh, related to these kind of activities. Uh, actually, it was a very great new thing for us. Actually, uh, uh, I was not aware about the ORCID till yet, but uh, as soon we are going for that and definitely we are creating our audits for that and it will help us a lot. Uh, I have not any specific question for this very uh, topic, but it was a very new thing for me. Thank you so much. Yeah. And from which? Uh, sir, actually, I am uh, right now working as an assistant professor here in Himachal Pradesh as in IEC University. But I am pursuing my PhD from Chitkara. Okay, great. Yes, Chitkara, Rajpura campus, yeah. Okay, great, great. In pharmaceutical and, sciences. Because ORCID is the only identity of the individual that make uh, it differentiate from the other. And it's a uh, uh, database is, is totally uh, more organized because there are in general. And most of the time, exactly. Most of the time when we are going to uh, search any databases, right? For example, if you are searching any author in Google Scholar, there would be various names which are very similar. And authors have definitely, uh, whether it is first name, uh, last name at uh, initials, but most of the you know, journals, most of the articles you will find various names of authors in a similar manner. 
so it is definitely a requirement of any unique identifier for that and orchid is doing so that is a very great thing yeah now you connected the orchid with the uh, research credit uh, in terms of the review uh, this question to nabi and uh, uh, i had to also observe when we see the identity of the scholar so they usually create uh, on uh, pablo through pablons uh, through the scopus as well as on the google scholar together pablons also include the uh, information the reviewer or editor like that right so here how basically orchid can provide the information in terms of the data that uh, this scholar has reviewed uh, so much article that appear in the same sense like in pablons or in a different way uh, yeah so if um, so we have we have what we call um, search and link wizards uh, so uh, these are also not, not the functionality so i'm going to quickly share uh, sorry i'm going to quickly share my um, desktop to show you and i'm sure that uh, anyone who is familiar with the orchid record already knows about uh, the search and link wizards uh, i'm just going to go quickly uh, hopefully that the connection will allow it just to show you from where uh, you can synchronize uh, you know your work either from big da databases like crossref uh, or data site or uh, pablon's web of science so if i go uh, quickly here to my orchid record i'm sorry a bit, a bit slow um, and to get, uh, you keep continue and uh, 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 there is an option basically into the ojs uh, to uh, uh, to get the overseed of the authors open journal management system there is an option right but when i was trying to do it uh, i got basically some technical problem i don't know what was it but no problem after the conference this conference uh, we will discuss the point uh, together and uh, see the opportunity uh, how basically the university can get the benefit in terms uh, you had mentioned in orcid report and uh, how basically this uh, information uh, will be useful for the university as well as for the scholars in terms of the visibility of research and uh, many other points yeah definitely so uh, the ojs integration is um, a complete integration so uh, really you can uh, use your instance to connect uh, to basically the orchid member api so that's what we are uh, really aiming for uh, but in general, uh, yes. So OJS is one of the uh, best integrations that we have. Uh, it's really offering um, a good, some good features to link up your publications with your uh, university instance. Uh, and so yeah, I'm, yeah, I have a very slow internet connection today here um, in South Africa, <laughs> but I'm trying to um, yeah. If, if you just put search and link wizard on on Google and then uh, the word orchid, you'll find this page which is really explaining how you can use those search and link wizards, which, you know, which are um, linked to uh, databases, basically. So if you click uh, on this uh, button here, search and link, you will have a list of databases, including um, Crossref, including you know, Crossref uh, metadata uh, engine, uh, including data site, including uh, web of science. Um, you can also find some of the you know, uh, um, uh, other, uh, let's say, um, agencies like uh, Japan, uh, uh, you know, um, Japan GOI uh, agency, like Eritrea. Uh, so yeah, a lot of, uh, you know, um, search and link wizards that can help you synchronizing all your works from those databases to your ORCID record uh, with just one simple click. So uh, yeah, that's uh, that's on on the search and inquisit. And yeah, getting back to your uh, let's say comment on OJS, uh, we really encourage all the journals and university journals and university presses, you know, especially uh, university presses, to like, like explore uh, what is about Orchid and and their OJS instance, um, if they are even using another uh, you know software, uh, then you can explore the list of the service providers that are offering an integration with orchid and uh, you know 
try to test, we have the uh, sandbox environment that is uh, free for uh, any organization that want to test uh, an integration. Um, we have also our support team that can help uh, you know, answering any question related to uh, your integration, especially if you are uh, you know, willing to join ORCID and uh, willing to monitor uh, you know, uh, the results of this integration. Then, um, yeah, we, we are very happy to uh, support the community, you know, even with small information or, uh, you know, small answer to, to your question. Definitely. Uh, this is my personal request to all the uh, uh, scholars who are basically sitting here from different institutions. Uh, this is basically a part of, uh, uh, of the publishing as well as uh, to uh, uh, a, a kind of recognition as well as to uh, identify yourself in a different uh, from the other. So you people just uh, contact directly to the uh, Nabil. Uh, Nabil, please can you write your email ID into the chat box so people can contact you. So it will be useful for all. All right. So yeah, and uh, membership is free for all the scholars and. Uh, all the postgraduate students, uh, they have to create it uh, and all the faculty members. And most of the journals basically are, are, are always ask about it and it, has, it is a condition uh, uh, is in some journal uh, that uh, they will publish the article with ORC ID. And since uh, last one, two issue, we had uh, made it uh, compulsory to provide the ORCID ID uh, in our publications. In our so is uh, there a question from uh, the audience side? It will be great to basically uh, at this platform. Uh, we have one or two minutes uh, if someone has any question. Uh, sorry, Dr. Sushil, I'm seeing in the uh, chat, so I'm just copying the uh, email to like our membership page to explain um, basically how about this membership and um, to log in if you want to uh, become a member. Uh, but then uh, there's also a question from Dr. Uh, Asok uh, saying, um, if any researcher is not using his ORCID ID for last few years, whether he will face any problem to start active again. Uh, so yeah, there's no uh, issues and no challenges in re reusing your ORCID ID. You just need to remember you know, your ORCID ID if you remember you know, those 16 digits or if you know, you're trying to uh, do a new registration and uh, the ORCID system will prompt you know a um, message saying that this might be you you know according to the name if you recognize you know your profile and your ORCID record then at this case even if you lose access and you um, lose password or uh, you know having any difficulty in connecting uh, you can reset your password. You can connect us, connect with us, and ask us on the support team uh, to help you gain again access. Um, uh, yeah, basically, you know, at the support team, we are having a beautiful uh, team that uh, uh, is, uh, you know, answering all researchers' questions. And you know, we are having uh, now almost 14 million researchers and 40 million users. Uh, so imagine the volume of uh, requests and volume of, um, let's say, tickets that we are having on the support queue, but we are all answering all those queries and all those uh, responses. Um, yeah, thanks to our uh, support team. So yeah, if you lose access, if you are um, having a doubt on your ORCID ID, um, if you think that you registered an ORCID ID with a certain email address and you want to check this with ORCID, please contact us and it will be a pleasure to uh, assist you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nabil, for this wonderful uh, interaction and giving the uh, most important information for the present time. So I am really thankful to you and your team uh, to share all this information. So thank you, thank you so much. My pleasure, um, Dr. Sushi. And we will uh, meet uh, after the conference. Uh, I will uh, discuss this point. Right, in reference to the university. Definitely, definitely. I'm gonna also add my uh, my email address just in case uh, you want to contact me directly. I'm very happy to uh, respond to any queries from the audience or from uh, Shitkar University. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you thank so much. You.
Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. And uh, now in the in this uh, second day, uh, we have our uh, last session, and uh, that uh, in the last uh, talk uh, we will discuss uh, more about the uh, uh, cross ref activities and UI number and many more things that can be more useful. And uh, now I invite uh, Professor Prithi John, ma'am, uh, to introduce our next speaker, uh, ma'am, Professor Prithi John, ma'am. Good evening. Good evening. It's a privilege to introduce Amanda, who is Crossref's head of member experience. She has worked previously in educational publishing for over 18 years at the intersection between digital marketing and digital product support. And she's been with Crossref for over four years. And her team provide support to new and existing Crossref members, making sure they can provide complete high quality metadata about their content and get the most out of their Crossref membership. I think this session is going to be extremely useful to us as we listen to her and hear about the wonderful work that she and her team have been working with the wider scholarly community helping them to make the most out of this metadata to find, cite, link, and assess scholarly content, particularly to identify the relationship between objects, people, organizations, funding, and so much more. So it's my privilege on behalf of Chitpara University to invite Amanda to lead us in this session. Thank you. Thank you, Preeti. Thank you. Over to Amanda. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Preeti, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, Dr. Sushil, for the uh, invitation. I'm just going to share my screen. Let's have a look. OK, I hope you can all see my slides now. Is that correct? No, uh, it's too late. Mm -mm. I'll stop the share and start that again, just in case it's having a problem. Okay, let's do that again. Okay, is that sharing now? It is showing that uh, Monda had started a uh, screen sale. So. Great, but, but can you see? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see it for uh, some say, moment. I wonder if it's the internet connection. Mm -hmm. They are because of that. It might. Give it a few moments. Maybe if I move my slides back and forward a little. No, we are moving, uh, actually uh, ten to fifteen minutes in advance. There is no problem, so you can take your time. Okay, so you still can't see the slides, is that right? Uh, the other option is that uh, within that time we will discuss and you just send the, the PPTs to me by email. Okay, let me try one more thing. Do the same thing uh, together. Okay, let's try that once more. Yes, yeah, yeah. You can see the slides there? Yes, yes. Very good, okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for the invitation, everyone. And I'm here today to talk about Crossref's community-led approach to maintaining the scholarly record. 
So I'll, I'll start with just a bit of background about Crossref, um, and then we'll move on to talking a little bit about how we help to, we, we and our members help to maintain the scholarly record. I'll then talk about capturing the research nexus. Um, I'll then talk about next steps for the audience today. And at the end, there'll obviously be time for everyone to ask any questions. So let's start with a bit of background. So how does Crossref work? So we work with publishing organisations across the globe. Um, organisations need to join us as a member and they commit to various member obligations. Um, and that part is quite key. I think some people just think about DOIs when they think about Crossref and they think they're just buying a DOI when in fact working with Crossref is a lot more than that. Um, members have to commit to do various things in order to register their content and to help maintain that scholarly record. So when publisher members first join, they commit to accept some member terms and commit to different obligations for how they'll work with other members and keep that scholarly record maintained. Uh, when they join, members get a Crossref DOI prefix. So that, um, that's a number, I'll give an example there. It usually starts with 10 dot and then five numbers. And then the member can then add suffixes to that DOI prefix in order to create DOIs for their published content. They then register that content with us. So they'll register the DOI they've created the resource resolution URL. So that's where they want that DOI to point. So the web address of where that particular article sits. And they'll also register lots of other metadata about that article with us. They then display that DOI they've just created on the article landing page. And the metadata that they provided to us is made available through our free open APIs. Members also commit to keep that metadata up to date. Um, and obviously as a member organization, we are uh, governed by our board, which is made up of member organizations. So all member organizations are able to stand for a seat in the board and have a real voice in kind of the direction that Crossref is going in and, and where we focus our attentions. Um, and each year, all members get a chance to vote in those board elections. So how does all of that help to maintain the scholarly record? Well, the starting point is the persistent identifier. So here's an example of an article um, for the Journal of Technology Management for Growing Economies, which is published by Chikara University. And you can see a little arrow there pointing at the DOI that they've created for this particular article. So uh, Chikara University were given the DOI prefix 10.15415. And they've created the suffix, the end part of that DOI, and they've, that's given them a unique persistent identifier for this specific article. So here's a bit more information about the structure of a DOI. Um, so if you've seen DOIs on articles before, you'll, you'll obviously recognise this structure. So the beginning part, the bit in red, is the DOI resolver. So this is the bit of the DOI that helps it act as a link. So having this bit here means if a researcher sees the DOI and they paste that into a browser, the DOI will resolve them to the right place for that article. Second bit of the DOI there, the bit in blue, is the DOI prefix. Um, so that's provided by Crossref to the members. 
And then finally, at the end, the section in yellow, you have the suffix. And that's the bit that the Crossref member themselves creates. So we don't provide um, the suffixes. The members come up with that themselves. So there we are. We've got our DOI on the landing page for this particular article. And having that DOI there gives a persistent identifier for that article. So if a researcher wants to find this article again in the future, or if they want to cite it in an article that they're writing, they're able to use this DOI. And they know that that DOI will always resolve to where that, that article is located on the internet. And that's because if, for example, Chikara University decides to host this, this journal on a different website, they'll update the metadata that they hold with Crossref to give a new different resource resolution URL for that DOI. So if somebody uses that DOI to cite the work, um, they know it's always going to go to the latest location, even if that location has changed. This is also useful because uh, a lot of journals move between publishers. So for example, if a, a different publisher with a different website acquired this journal in the future, we could transfer ownership of this title over to that different publisher in our system. And that different publisher could then update the resource resolution URL for that DOI and have it point at their own website. So somebody might have cited this article 10 years ago, and the article might have been on four different websites in the meantime, but as long as they've cited using the DOI, you know they're always going to find the current location. So this actually means that sometimes a publisher might have journals with DOIs on lots of different prefixes because they've acquired journals over the year, over the years have already had DOIs registered. So once a DOI is registered, that never changes. Um, so you might see um, a journal which has DOIs across a few prefixes, and that's absolutely fine. It just means that that original DOI is the persistent identifier. And so because of this, this ensures that persistence of the scholarly record. Using the DOI means you can always find that article, even if it's moved somewhere else in the future. And in some instances, even if that publisher is no longer publishing, um, the DOI can be updated to an archive location, for example. So that's all very well and good for making sure that your own content has a persistent identifier. But one of the other obligations for Crossref members is something that we call reference linking. So this means our members in the references at the end of each of their articles, they include DOIs there as well. So again, this provides a persistent identifier for the content that they're citing. So this is a way that the Crossref members work together as a community. They commit to using each other's DOIs um, in their references so that, that um, the scholarly map stays persistent um, and all of the content can always be discovered. So I've got an example here. I think it might, might have been a Taylor and Francis article where you can see in the reference list at the end, they've always included the DOI expressed as a link. So people can always find those articles again in the future. So that's the persistent identifier side of things. But the, the DOI, the persistent identifier, is really just the start of things. And where the real value comes in is that extra metadata that the publisher members register with us alongside the DOI and the resource resolution URL. So members, when they register their content with us, they'll include 
a lot of rich information about that article. The article title, the journal it belongs to, the authors, the authors affiliations and ORCIDs, if they've got them, um, funding information, licensing information, all sorts of extra information. And that information is held in the Crossref system as XML. Now, some members are able to send us XML directly, which is great, but not all members are able to. So we also have uh, helper tools, which are basically online forms where members can just type in this information and behind the scenes, we turn that into XML. So a couple of key helper tools are the web deposit form, which is something that, that we provide at Crossref. And we also have for members who use the OJS platform, um, PKP actually provide a plugin for the OJS platform to register content with Crossref. Um, and again, it, it, it's an easy way to just type in the metadata and it can be sent to us. With OJS, there's, there's two options. You can either have the plugin just create the XML for you to download into a file and send to us, or you can set it up to register everything with us automatically. Um, the second option is obviously the easiest, but it's important to remember if you do choose that option in OJS, it will automatically register all of your content. And as there's fees for each item that gets registered with Crossref, that might not be appropriate for you if you aren't yet ready to um, register all of your back file. So just something to think about for those who are using um, OJS or the OJS plugin. Um, and here's an example of what our own web deposit form looks like. So you can see it's a very basic form and you can just type in information about the article that you want to register, um, the name of the article, the authors, their affiliations, their ORCID IDs, um, maybe an abstract, the DOI itself, the URL you want it to resolve to. And there's other optional bits on the form, which I haven't shown, where you can add more and richer metadata to. And then behind the scenes, that information is stored in our database. So I've actually just done an API query here for that um, Chikara article we were looking at earlier. So you can see this is how it's stored behind the scenes in our, in our system. So you've got all the information there, the title, uh, abbreviated versions of the title, who are the authors, what are their affiliations, you've got the abstract, the publication date, all sorts of information stored in our system in a standardized machine readable way. And then that metadata is then made freely available to anybody who wants to make use of it. We've got um, interfaces that human beings can use, and we've got interfaces that are more useful for machines. So our interfaces for people, we've got a tool called the Simple Text Query. Um, now, this tool allows anybody to upload a list of references and pull out any DOIs that have been registered for those references. So that's quite useful for Crossref members who want to do reference linking. But the main tool for humans searching our database is our metadata search. Um, so we've got two flavors of metadata search. There's the standard one where you can add in article titles, authors, DOIs, ORCID IDs, etc., and get pull results out of the database to see what we have in our system for those elements. There's also a version of metadata search where you can just search for funders. Um, and the screenshot I'm showing there is from that funders interface. And what I've done there is I've done a search for the funder Welcome Trust, and it's pulled out any content that's been registered with Crossref 
where the publisher has said that Wellcome Trust was the funder of the research. So obviously that's useful for the funders themselves to get make sure they're capturing the outputs of their research, but it's, it's also useful context for others as well. So on to our APIs for machines. So we've got uh, various APIs available for machines to programmatically pull this information out of Crossref. So we have the REST API, which is the most up-to-date and, and modern API and is the one we recommend that people use. Um, it outputs in a format called JSON. We also have um, open URL, um, and if there's any librarians on the call, you might recognize that. That's an that's API that's often used by library link resolvers, so things like Alma. We also have an OAI PMH API um, that outputs in XML, and it's again, it's something that's often used by the library community when they're looking to harvest metadata. Um, and finally, we have our original XML API, which allows um, anyone to just pull out the um, XML results and query them. So our REST API, if you visit api.crossref.org, you can find more information about using that to query our metadata. And if you wanted to actually run a query, you would just type in api.crossref.org slash and then some extra facets there to pull out the information you need. So, for example, there's a bunch of endpoints around funder data or journal information or individual works or prefixes. Um, but if, if anybody's interested in that, do go to api.crossref.org and it'll, it'll give you more information and some example queries. So obviously having all of that metadata freely and openly available in machine readable format is very useful to a wealth of different organizations who try and share or make use of um, scholarly information. So you can see here, there's, a, there's lots of different types of organizations that make use of this, um, manuscript tracking systems, bibliographic management, library discovery systems we mentioned before, metrics and analytics, um, specialist databases, scholarly sharing networks. Um, and because our data is freely available, um, we don't necessarily know exactly who's using the metadata and exactly how they're using it. Um, but we do know, for example, organizations like uh, Google Scholar, Dimensions, um, various other databases make use of it but it is important to say they just make use of our metadata um, so registering your content with crossref doesn't necessarily guarantee you inclusion in those databases um, but once you are included they'll pull our metadata to get um, rich information about your content So a quick mention of uh, other Crossref services that are available just outside of content registration and sharing of metadata. So we have a funder registry, which is a free, open and unique registry of persistent identifiers for grant giving organisations. Um, so publishers can use these to include a unique identifier for a funder within the metadata that they share about a publication. And there's a few different ways to get this information um, and, and it's available to everyone, not just Crossref members. Um, you can use the funder registry search, which I showed a screenshot of earlier. Um, you can download the information or you can use the uh, REST API. Uh, we also have the cited by service whereby members can query the metadata to see which sources are citing their own content. 
um, and they can then display those counts and links to the citing work on their website. Um, it's free of charge, but because it's reliant on other members registering their references with Crossref, so we've got something to search and pull back, it's only available to members who are themselves registering references with Crossref. We also have the Crossmark service. So this service allows members to register information about when their item of content has changed. So maybe there's been a retraction or a withdrawal or an update. So there's two sides to Crossmark. Um, members obviously need to register the information and the links to the other um, content within the metadata, but they've also got the option of displaying this little check for updates um, mark on the article itself, either on the HTML page or even on the PDF. And then readers can click that and they can see whether the item they're looking at is the most up to date. And if it isn't, they can find a link to the updated version or the retraction notice or whatever it might be. And finally, we offer the similarity check service to Crossref members. So this gives Crossref members reduced rate access to the Authenticate tool from Turnitin. Um, there's, there's an extra annual fee and cost per document checked for members for this service. Um, and it allows members to check manuscripts that they are considering publishing against a huge database of already published content. So that database has over 90 billion current and archived web pages, plus 82 million subscription articles and 13,000 open access repositories. Um, and the reason why Crossref members get reduced access to this service is that they contribute their own published content into that database. So Crossref members are the reason why those 82 million subscription articles are actually available in that database. And the way members do this is in the metadata they register with Crossref, they include a full text URL link for similarity check, which the team at Turnitin can then go to and index that published content into the database. And that obviously improves the service for everyone because it means there's more content in the database and it's easier for Turnitin to access that content. So because of that, the Crossref members get this reduced rate access. And then once members are eligible, so once they've registered content with Crossref and have included these full text URLs, so Turnitin can index their published content, they can actually start using the service. So they can upload manuscripts into the Authenticate tool. They can then see a similarity check report, which shows the percentage of similarity between the manuscript you've just uploaded and other items in that database. You can even compare them side by side and then the editor can then use their skills and experience to work out whether that percentage similarity is okay or whether it needs further investigation. So for example, you might have a very high similarity rate, but actually what you're looking at is a preprint. So that might be fine. Or you might have a fairly high similarity, but it's actually just a well-researched article with lots of references and quotes. And again, that could be fine. Um, or it might actually indicate a problem. And that's where the editor skill comes in. Um, so we encourage members to not just look at that percentage, but to investigate further and use their skills and experience to make a decision. So I've been talking um, quite a lot so far about registering journal articles, um, but actually, um, there's a lot more to um, research than just journal articles. And obviously journal articles don't have 
the supremacy they used to have. So at Crossref, we've started focusing on what we're calling the research nexus. So our vision for the future is a rich and reusable network of relationships connecting research organizations, people, things, actions. So the creation of a scholarly record that the global community can build on forever for the benefit of everyone. And what that means in practice is instead of just focusing on a journal article or just focusing on maybe other research outputs, we're able as a community to focus on all of these relationships and links here. So obviously that middle circle there, you've got the research outputs, but you also need to understand uh, who created it. Um, and there's various different subsections there. So not just authors, but who generated the data, who revised it, who reviewed it. You need information about who publishes it. And again, there's nuance in there, who hosted it, who edited it, who publishes it, transferring ownership, checking similarity. Um, you've also got comments on the research outputs or people who are modifying it by reproducing it or annotating or maybe quoting it. And also we want to capture that information about who's funding. And obviously funding isn't always just monetary. It might be around giving access to facilities, for example. So it's that research nexus and those links and relationships that we want to make sure we capture going forward. Um, and that isn't just in Crossref's gift. That's something that the whole community needs to work on together. So at Crossref, we've been expanding the types of content that members are able to publish with us. So for years, members have been able to register journals, books, conference proceedings. And in the last few years, we've added peer reviews. So unique identifiers can be added for the actual reviews before publication. Also preprints, so members can register preprints before the article is actually published. And most recently, we've uh, added grants. Now grants is it's quite a big departure for Crossref because it means for the first time, organisations other than publishers can be members. And we had to change our, our bylaws to enable funders to become members of Crossref to register persistent identifiers for the grants that they award. But that's such a key part of that ecosystem, um, we really needed to do that. And we've also started looking more closely at how we can capture links and particularly relationships in our schema. So I talked a little earlier about Crossmark. So that gives us a way to, to capture these links around corrections and retractions. But we also want to capture links about licenses or links about the funders, their grant IDs and the published work, or the author, their ORCID profiles and their published work, or data site IDs and other data identifiers linking that data to the published work. We also want to look at how we link preprints to the version of records um, and also the new raw IDs, research organisation registry identifiers, we want to make sure we can include those as well to capture accurately the affiliations of the authors. So I'll go into a little bit more detail on a few of those. So funders grant ideas and, and published work, that's, that's quite a, a key new area for us. So how this works is the funder joins Crossref as a member and they register a grant with us. They then share that grant ID with the awardee and the, the awardee can pass that grant ID onto their publisher. The publisher can then include that information in the metadata that they register with Crossref. And then that means that that information is made available through our APIs for anyone to pull. So the published, the funder can pull 
all the records of um, outputted work, either that they funded or for specific grants, which is super useful for them. And it also gives researchers that extra context when they're evaluating work. Often seeing who funded the work is, is a valuable bit of extra context. Nabil talked a little earlier about linking um, ORCID profiles and their published work. Um, so obviously if uh, author includes their ORCID ID in the information they submit to their publisher, their publisher puts that in the metadata they provide to Crossref, and then Crossref can push that information out to the author's ORCID profile, obviously with their permission. Data citation, this is, this is really key. Um, obviously data's, we, we, we touched on this um, earlier, but data is so key for transparency and also reproducibility. Um, if researchers want to build on previous work, um, they're gonna have to be able to see the data and make use of it. Or they might need to reuse it. Or also credit is quite key here, making sure that the people who created the data get credit for when it's used or reused. And again, members can add data citations to their metadata with Crossref, either just through references, or if they wanted to give a bit more detail, they can use the relationships bit of the schema, which can give a little bit more information about how that data relates to that research. So was this data an output of the work <clears throat> or was this data just used to create the work? And we also have preprints and version of records. So um, preprint repositories and publishers are now able to register DOIs for preprints with Crossref. Um, and eventually that preprint may well become a published piece of work. So our system constantly checks for any title and author matches between a preprint and a version of record. And if we find a match, we email the member who's the owner of the preprint and ask them to create a relationship in the metadata between that preprint and the version of record. So again, it, it helps see kind of the evolution of that, of that idea and of that work. So that's just a few of the ways that we're either ourselves or in collaboration with other organizations trying to capture that research nexus a bit better. So what's next for um, everyone listening today? Well, if you aren't yet a Crossref member, do think about joining Crossref. So I mentioned before, we're a membership organization for scholarly publishers. Um, so if your work is likely to be cited in the scholarly ecosystem, you're eligible to join. Um, we ask that members are the largest legal entity. So that means, for example, if you are part of a journal that's published by the university, then the university should join as the member. Um, that also helps to save a bit of money because there's a membership fee an annual membership fee for each member and we wouldn't want hundreds of individual journals having to pay separate annual fees we'd want to collect it all together under the parent organization so if your university joins they can use their membership to register content for all the journals that are published by that university um, also in order to join you need to make sure that you can meet those obligations that we spoke about before so you need to be able to register that metadata with us you need to have a landing page for the article where you can display the doi you need to be able to do reference linking you need to be able to commit to keeping that metadata up to date and particularly keeping that resource resolution url up to date and there's also a decision about whether you want to become a direct member or work with a sponsor. So we have various sponsor organisations that we work with who, who um, enable membership for Crossref members. So 
a sponsored member has the same benefits and obligations as any other member, but they would work through the sponsor. Different sponsors provide different services, but most uh, pay one annual fee on behalf of the members they work with and also receive the invoices for content registration fees. And they then decide what they charge the members for their service. Some of them do the actual content registration on behalf of their members, um, some of them don't. Um, some of them are able to provide local language support. Um, so if you're thinking of working with Crossref and you're thinking of becoming a member um, through a sponsor, do look carefully at the sponsors available and do make sure you've talked to them about what services they offer and also what, what the pricing would be of working with them. For some publishers, working with the sponsor is absolutely the best way to go. For others, direct membership. If your organisation is already a member, I'd encourage you to look to improve the metadata that you register with Crossref. Um, so we have a, a, an openly available tool called um, Participation Reports, and you can visit it at www.crossref.member. Uh, sorry, forward slash member forward slash prep. And you can use this to find a visual representation of the metadata that all members have registered with us. So you just need to type in the name of a member into that search bar. As you start typing a few different names sort of here and you just click on the correct one, the one you're looking for, and then you'll be able to see um, what percentage of that member's content includes these 10 key metadata elements. So I just did a search this morning for Informatics Publishing Limited, um, and you can see, for example, 55% of their DOIs registered with us, the metadata includes references. 36% of it includes license URLs, 44% includes abstracts, and so on. And the metadata that members register with us, it doesn't stand still. Um, there is a one-off charge for each item you register with us, but then after that, any updates that you do to the metadata are free of charge. And we recommend that members do continually add to that metadata and, and, and keep it up to date. So for example, at the moment, it looks as though informatics publishing hasn't been collecting ORCID IDs, but they've got 1% there. So it looks like they've just started collecting ORCID IDs. So we would encourage them then to capture ORCID IDs for their existing content that they've already registered with us and just make sure they're adding those ORCID IDs in in the future. And we'd also encourage everyone to not only think of these individual metadata elements, but really start thinking about the links and relationships between them to help with capturing that research nexus. So in summary, um, persistent identifiers and DOIs are great, but they are just the beginning. And rich metadata is where the value really starts. And then capturing that research nexus really helps us to just complete that picture. Thank you. What questions do you have? Yeah, definitely. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda, uh, to providing all the details about the uh, CrossRef activities and especially on the contribution of DOI in the research publications as well as uh, how basically it uh, impact uh, the output in terms of the citations and many other things, mm -hmm. right? So uh, uh, first of all, let me uh, ask the question from the audience side, if there is anyone. Uh, so is there any question? Right. Uh, Right, there is no question, but uh, definitely there are some questions in my mind, and uh, I will try to uh, basically uh, 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 try to ask on behalf of the audience so they can also get the flavor in the same sense. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time, uh, I have observed uh, uh, that some journal uh, basically that governed by the run by the 
universities and associations are not considered a DOI, right? In that case, uh, this can be uh, can basically uh, when we are uh, not providing a, a identifier to the uh, digital property, and you had mentioned here, and your plugin is also available, so that count citations that how many times basically this particular article cited at uh, any other platform, right? That means uh, at, at different, different uh, journals. So if the person basically, the case you had mentioned in uh, like that, so if the journal is not providing DOI, then how one can count citation? A separate question, this is first question related to the journal. A journal publishing the article, without DOI number. So how that journal will count the citation for their own journal, number one. Second question, if a, a article that include a reference, uh, which basically uh, is taken from that kind of journal, which is not giving the DOI number. Mm -hmm. So now the question for the second one, how basically that uh, that uh, author, that researcher will take the uh, benefit of this credit? These are two questions and your take uh, on these two. Sure. So, so cited by, are cited by service can only work where the articles are registered with Crossref and also where the, mem the publisher of the article during the citing has registered their references with us. So they've included their references in the metadata. Um, if those two things haven't happened, then cited by hasn't got any information to hook into. Um, outside of that, they could look to something like Google Scholar um, to give them the citation information, I'm guessing. Um, yeah, I think that's probably the only thing to to recommend. Um, but obviously, with cited by, um, you've got that accurate information about um, people who are citing your content who are registering DOIs with Crossref and including the references. Uh, but uh, this Google Scholar information will include to the other indexer like the Scopus and Web of Science. They will, yeah. So, so our so our cited by is it only covers um, stuff that's in our database. So mm -hmm. you might find that our information, our counts are different from Web of Science or Google Scholar or what have you, because we we're only including the stuff that's in our database. So we often say to members, it's it's important to kind of look across a few of these solutions to get you know to get a good a full picture because not everybody not everybody is registered with crossref right, right, right. yeah so uh, this this thing is clear and now when you are uh, trying to show uh, the picture of the similarity index uh, right at that point i had observed at number 9 point uh, can you show that slide uh, in the right side uh, there was some basically report of the individual contribution. Yeah. And there was at eight number uh, was uh, the IP address uh, of the source. Bear with me, just navigating to the, there we go. Yeah. This, yeah, this, this slide, yeah. At here, uh, the source uh, at eight number, Eight, is the IP address of the computer is given at eight, eight number in the right side. Uh, individual six, source, four. individual source here one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Oh, yeah, yep, yep. At eight number. Uh, I just observed the IP address. Uh -huh. I think that's a bit sorry i'm gonna to have to i'll stop sharing that's a bit too small for me to see Bear with me. No, no problem. so there was actually a ip address of the system and uh, so my question actually uh, my question was related 
that uh, IP address of the computer, that means uh, uh, what it indicates if that comes into the source. Uh, it is true that uh, at number nine, it is uh, taking the source of cross wrap because that have all the data and it is not necessary to go the, uh, the algorithm may be designed that way that consider only the uh, first, or first cross ref uh, data, then after the other one, if not available. So uh, at eight number, IP address is given. At the 10 number, uh, a website link is given, not like uh, as mentioned uh, at the nine, uh, nine number, nine point, point number nine. That is clearly mm -hmm. mentioned that this is the source of cross ref and the article title or uh, other information is available there. So my question is that uh, when the software is not providing exact information that this is the, uh, the, the uh, either the page, page of the website or the proper thing. So here one is IP address and second is the website only. So that may be, a, uh, that create a question that uh, the software basically is uh, considering the whole website instead of the precise way that this is the particular source. Mm. Uh, that, that is uh, a kind of worry in my mind and also want to make it clear that when uh, this software, uh, this who bas uh, that basically check the uh, similarity uh, index, uh, just taking the IP address and that IP address may be of uh, any repository of any institution or like that or someone has uh, put their content there and a general website uh, URL. And that is not, uh, should, that should not be countable into the uh, overall similarity index. Yeah, I think I think I get your question. Yeah, so in the results, um, by default, you'll see lots of different things. So there's different repositories actually within um, Authenticate. So there's, for example, one repository is the content that they've got from Crossref members. And another one might be um, items that they've identified as preprints. And another repository might be just content that they've crawled from the web themselves. So outside of the content that they've got from Crossref. Now, what you can do within the tool is you can set to include or exclude any of those repositories. So you as an editor might decide, actually, I'm only really interested in published material that's been registered by Crossref members. I'm going to exclude anything that comes that's just been scraped from the web um, because I don't think that gives me accurate information. Or you might include all of it, but that's where the editorial skill comes in so you're not just looking at the overarching number you're looking down each of these and going okay that one i'm not worried about i'm, I'm going to exclude that but that one that one does look like a worry because that does look like a published article with 80 percent similarity i'm going to i'm going to investigate that one a bit more and this is a good idea that uh, we can give the dui number to the dissertation in our university and in anywhere uh, we can give the DOI number, right? Uh, it will be useful as well, like uh, you mentioned to the proceeding and to the books. So uh, for that point, actually, I have to learn uh, what will be the procedure, what will be the metadata for that, right? Uh, and obviously it will be different uh, compared to the journal uh, for the proceeding as well as to the book. Yes, so um... In our schema, there's there's different um, elements that will be captured for different content types. So, uh, for example, for a journal, you'd capture the ISSN, but for a book, you'd capture the ISBN. Or for um, conference papers, they can be kind of collected under conference proceedings in the same way that book chapters are collected under a book or articles are collected under a journal. So the, the structure and the fields that we'd capture for each different content type are slightly different depending on what that content type needs. Yeah, very nice. Is there mm -hmm. any question from the audience side that will be great? 
If there is no question, thank you. Thank you so much, Amanda, ma'am, uh, to provide all the details and this for this wonderful talk and giving your time to us to make it complete uh, in all way. Uh, so we had covered almost uh, all the area of the research publishing as well as publishing research. And uh, thank you, thank you so much for your time. And now, basically, we are just uh, at the end. And uh, I invite here uh, now, uh, Professor uh, Manoj Manuja sir, uh, uh, Pro Vice Chancellor Chitkara University to sum up uh, and vote uh, for the vote of thanks. Uh, and uh, at the last, uh, uh, after the vote of thanks, uh, my request uh, to all the participants, just please open the camera. We will take the screenshot. So uh, after that, and uh, I had basically requested to the participants that uh, I will uh, say uh, 10 prizes to the uh, participants if they will ask the best questions, right? So for that, uh, uh, I will basically, uh, I have to conclude, I have to observe all those things and uh, uh, then after I will uh, share the information with them and uh, definitely I will uh, send the uh, prize uh, that I had mentioned on the WhatsApp group with all the participants. Right. Along with it, uh, uh, those who are basically interested to uh, get our journal copy, so they just uh, uh, write an email to me and uh, I will send uh, all the journal copy or a single copy according to that, uh, whatever is your field. And uh, in addition to it, uh, there are so many things that we had discussed in these two days and uh, most probably some researchers those who are new or at early stage had learned number of the things. I, I have also shared here a, a feedback for a feedback form. Uh, so I can get uh, some feedback that where I basically missed the point and uh, what I can improve in the future and what type of to uh, topic basically we can cover for that purpose. I did try my best and if something somehow I had missed, uh, so I'm sorry for that. But uh, it is now the time uh, for a vote of thanks by uh, uh, Professor Manoj Manuja, sir. Over to you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Sushil. Uh, dear all, a very pleasant evening to everybody. It is my pleasure to present the vote of thanks to such an esteemed gathering of researchers, scholars, faculty members, and students all the participants. It must be a very absorbing two days engagement where a lot of very interesting as well as very relevant topics have been discussed by researchers of international repute. The objective of this conference is to exchange knowledge and information about best practices and latest technologies in publishing research developed and used by the experts. If I revisit the title of the conference, which is International Online Conference on Innovations and Challenges in Research Publication, I can clearly see a few keywords embedded purposefully like innovation, challenge, and research public publishing. And if you revisit these keywords, you will get to know that last two days covered each and every keyword in detail. That is the beauty of this conference. Many thanks Dr. Sushil Kumar for organizing such a nice, relevant conference. Day one was very nicely aligned to address various critical points of research publication. The context was very rightly said by our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Ashna Mantri. She emphasized on some niche technologies and tools used during the research publishing. The session on innovation scientific writing with ethics, here ethics is a keyword, was very nicely articulated by Professor Chaitali Moitra, wherein she shared the importance of ethics during the search, which is very relevant also. Professor Shiridhar Gautam nicely explained the open source framework for India and its benefits and advantages. His talk was in fact very important in the context of 
Indian Research Environment. Many thanks, Professor Shildhar, for the nice talk. I think the panel discussion was the prime slot of yesterday's conference, where distinguished researchers shared their views of publication and research ethics. Dr. Sushil, you moderated the panel discussion so nicely that I am thoroughly impressed. International expert Professor Campens shared the practical aspect of collaboration, which was nicely taken by all participants. Whereas Professor Johan, in his afternoon talk, stressed upon the critical importance of driving that transition to full and immediate open access. Because nowadays, everybody is talking about open access. Whether we have transitioned or we are transitioning, that is a big question we need to answer. Next session, Professor Duncan touched upon a very important and relevant topic of impact of ease for editors and authors. That, that was a very, very critical topic for authors and all the participants because he touched upon so many relevant things. Afterwards, Professor, Professor Kathleen talk, talked about moving beyond the journal. Was in fact, was very, very interesting topic. And she brought a very different perspective to the discussion table. And all the participants really enjoyed that session. But day two was even more interesting, where it all started with Professor Sheba's talk about the importance of journal quality, indexing, and analysis in research. It was very nice session altogether in Indian context, but it was internationalized when Professor Sheba talked about various relevant quality parameters. Professor Vaishav Sharma shared her views on how to select the right journals for publishing your research. And that was very, very useful for the new authors also, because it is very important for the new authors to select the right journal. And that was a very, very good session on day two. Professor Anubhav touched upon a very critical aspect of publishing, that is ranking research wherein he brought a totally different perspective for the participant. Dr. Rishali gave a very important insight about DOAJ, which is a hot topic nowadays, and everybody would like to explore more. Next topic was really very nice, where Professor Murphy shared some of the best practices used in open science and their implications for research public publishing. Professor Nabil, the industry SME, gave an insight on ORCID because that is one particular aspect which each and every author must understand. And last session, Professor Amanda, fantastic talk on cross-reference. It, it, it was really very, very nice. I must congratulate you for such a nice thought sharing session you have taken for our participants. It has been very much aligned with today's scenario of research publication where you talked about community-led approach to maintaining the scholarly record. Many thanks, Professor Amanda, for that. Towards the closing note, I would like to put on record the flawless execution of this international conference under the able leadership of Dr. Sushil Kumar, Deputy Dean Chitkara University Publication. It has been his sole initiative that we all have met virtually to discuss some many relevant tools and technologies used for research publishing. In the end, I would like to thank, I would like to sincerely thank Honorable Chancellor of Chitkara University, Dr. Ashok K. Chitkara, and Honorable Pro Chancellor, Dr. Madhu Chitkara for the kind guidance and support throughout the execution of this conference. Without their support, we could not have organized such conference on a large scale where international experts like Professor Amanda from all spheres have exchanged their 
ideas, thoughts with a large number of participants. Many thanks to all the participants for their wholehearted support and attendance for this conference. Many thanks, looking forward to such gathering in coming days, coming months, coming years from Chitkara University. Definitely yes. God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for your kind words and uh, all these uh, to motivate us for uh, such kind of activities. And uh, it is really wonderful to see the uh, to see the enthusiasm of uh, young scholars and their participation here. And uh, I, I, I what what basically I thought uh, at right now. Uh, after the getting the feedback and uh, if someone from the audience side uh, can say some uh, thing or can suggest us or can speak a uh, little more uh, their idea or, or observation because Dr. Asok uh, Kumar uh, is sitting uh, morning to evening with me and uh, other uh, uh, participants also because he has opened the camera in this uh, Professor Lokesh Kumar, Dr. NJ. So then uh, let me uh, <laughs> announce the name and uh, many other uh, uh, young scholar also, Dr. Surinder Kumar Tiwari ji, uh, I had also uh, frequently his uh, profile, the Manish Tonk ji, uh, Sahid Wani, and uh, many more. Please uh, open the camera so I can at least recognize that uh, once uh, that you were uh, in the conference, and uh, you had seen uh, actually again and again to me, and I don't know that uh, how I conveyed the message uh, to interact with the experts. But uh, it was uh, my uh, actually intention that uh, through that discussion, actually, uh, actually I can provide some idea. Uh, if uh, I am not clear at my end, but at least through the expert, you you can get an idea about to the publication as well as the things or uh, technology that we use into the publishing, right? And again and again, sir, uh, what I did, I just try to uh, interact with the expert in that way that uh, something basically I know when I ask the question, it is true. But uh, sometimes uh, on behalf of the scholars and uh, the question they had given to me, and I'm really thankful, uh, 47 people had given uh, the questions. Out of them, uh, some question uh, actually I could cover uh, here, but it does not mean uh, those questions so uh, uh, I could not basically attend or uh, say uh, here at this platform is not of importance. But the thing is that uh, you shared uh, your time, your ideas here at this platform, that is more important. And this was not a traditional type of conference or activity. It is uh, you, if you are attending the uh, uh, lectures and the inter uh, interaction type uh, of activity, it, you uh, personally, I, I, I feel that uh, it, it was totally different experience from uh, the as usual uh, uh, trad uh, traditional conference. And uh, I uh, just try to uh, basically uh, uh, share uh, the information by this way. And now, uh, because your mic is uh, basically is uh, uh, looking for uh, to interact or to share some points. So without taking much time, because I have already taken two days and you people were listening. So this is your time to share your experiences as well as uh, uh, whatever you want to share and use the platform uh, with other also. So, so uh, try to finish your uh, content or your uh, thoughts within one or two minutes because you are here more than 100. So it will take two minutes, so it will go to 200 minutes. So you can understand that thing. Uh, Dr. Tejvi Singh, uh, Dr. Sunil Kumar, Dr. Surinder Kumar Tiwari Ji, uh, Dr. Abhubi Ji, and uh, 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 Professor Raj Mittal, uh, Madam, thank you, and uh, Dr. Sumit Kumar Ji, and uh, many other people, those who basically could not open the camera. At uh, this side, uh, Dr. Paminder Kumar Ji. Uh, please open the camera if you are available. At least uh, let me uh, see you basically who are the participants. Ah, let, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, please share, uh, share your idea, your uh, anything that you want to say. Please go one by one because. Uh, uh, good evening, doctor. Yeah. May, I, may I take a couple of minutes, doctor? 
Yeah, only two minutes. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Doctor. Actually, I'm I'm Sudan Kissinger. I'm from I'm working in Saudi Arabia. I'm one of uh, the editor in your journal. Actually, I came to know through my my dear friend, Dr. Pankaj Kumar, who is working in the physics department, probably still there uh, in the Chitkara University. Uh, yes. It's a really, it's a great pleasure. Actually, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, we have vacation these days. So when I saw the mail immediately, I just uh, registered and logged in. I, I, when I saw the topic, it was uh, kind of vague. It's, it's a, a bit of open topic. But when I started to attend the session, I really felt actually it's a very, very relevant and important topic in the present scenario. So the, the, the topics and, the, and the, you know, the theme that you have taken for every session, it's so excellent. Uh, probably I could say I, I'm, I'm probably I'm very uh, less experienced than compared to many other uh, leading professors in this panel. Uh, probably about 20 years. But even now, I, I did not know many of the nook and corners of the publication. It was so excellent and uh, it's immensely uh, planned and also it gave plenty of information for people like me. Probably if it is for me in this case and so many other young researchers, surely it gives a lot of details so that they could concentrate well and in which path they could direct or they, which path they can go uh, that can give or taken by these two uh, days conference. I really thankful for Dr. Shushil and the entire team. Uh, 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 Dr. Manoj have said uh, probably uh, it's the sole responsibility of Dr. Shushil. Of course, I could see that the whole two days how uh, dedicatedly he was in the conference and took the conference without any delay. You know that is the important thing of successful of a conference, even in a physical conference we could not make this kind of successful because in our online platform, we could face a lot of difficulties, but it was so smooth, meticulously planned and clearly executed. Thank you so much for the entire team. And thank you so much for the opportunity that is given to me, Dr. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Anyone, and if you will see the opportunity, yeah, please go, sir, go ahead. Uh, okay, sir, uh, you are not audible. Can you please? Uh... Uh, thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, Abdul Malik just for, or Asok yeah, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, uh, my name is Abdul Malik. I'm, I'm from Nigeria. I really, it's an amazing experience. I got through about this conference because I have my first publication with Chitra University in 2016. And I have some two other publications in, especially in issues and ideas in education. It's really a great experience. I have learned a lot. I thank you very much for this opportunity. I pray for the success of your University and uh, the researchers in general. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Dr. Asok, uh, you are not audible. I don't know. Can you please uh, check again? Or uh, you can use directly a uh, mobile phone uh, in, instead of this uh, uh, wire. Because you were sitting uh, uh, two days with me together, I, I had observed this thing. Until that, uh, you manage all these things. Uh, is there anyone? Asok sir, just uh, try to manage. Uh, I will basically give the opportunity to interact. Uh, till that, uh, Professor Raj uh, Mittal, uh, would yeah. you like to say? Yeah, yeah, please. Go. Uh, unmute, please. Uh, unmute uh, Professor Ravital. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Sunil. Well organized, a very informative co uh, conference, and it is a great experience for me because I am I'm publishing the paper, but did I did I don't know their interpretation. With this conference, no, I am very much clear about the concepts. This is well information for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Yes. 
डॉक्टर रेनू इज देयर और डॉक्टर रेनू ओपन द कैमरा या डॉक्टर अशोक प्लीज इफ यू कैन नो नो टोडी बल अनम्यूट अनम्यूट no so dr suvendra kumar tiwari can you say something uh, basically it is it's your choice if you want to say you can say if you uh, i will not force but i want to know uh, that uh, if there is a any uh, any 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 uh, deficiency you can uh, let me know hello i am audible yes sir thank thank you sir kumar sir uh, i am dr surendra kumar tiwari professor in department mathematics dr sivira university kota bilaspur chatisgarh uh, very well organized by you this conference and a really great relevant topic all session are are excellent all speaker are very excellent and experienced thank you very much thank you thank you sir uh, dr sunil uh, you are sitting there and then after dr lokesh sir first of all namaskar aap sabhi ko so first i would i would like to thank dr sushil kumar for providing me opportunity to speak here and also a good conference many key points were there which were not earlier mentioned to us or we were not familiar with all those points earlier regarding publishing plagiarism key points about plagiarism uh, then also this conference remind me of the famous conference conducted by professor sushil kumar in icrt nb in 2012 so i would like to attend offline conference in tigara uh, whenever you will give an opportunity in the future so thanks a lot for providing me such opportunity to listen this uh, conference online thank you sir thank you sir dr lokesh shubhran ji hello yeah sir can i audible yes sir. hello yes sir very informative uh, both the, the session and i will uh, really thankful to all the uh, uh, vc sir of the kara university and sir uh, also uh, you sushil kumar sir and all the uh, management of the kara university thank you sir thank you and from the young scholar side i would like to actually uh, mujhko acha lagega if uh, any young uh, scholar research scholar can say uh, their thought yeah sudeshna yeah sudeshna please yes sir i am audible to all of you yes yes good afternoon to all sir uh, actually i am very happy to know the various uh, uh, research area various uh, uh, thing about the research area but we are the young scholar all are not digest by me actually sir so it it is uh, again uh, you conduct this type of seminar then only one type of uh, uh, topic is discussed then it is benefited to us sir all are um, excellent uh, but we digest something <laughs> something we, we cannot digest sir actually that is the thing but it is excellent sir all uh, thanks goes to sushil kumar sir and also all speakers all the participants thank you sir yeah my purpose was that uh, at least some idea some word some type of uh, picture you see so in future actually you can explore Yeah, that information when you see in future i basically you did not get surprised yeah, that what is it right that was the point i can accept that in the youngest uh, stage uh, it is uh, it is uh, quite difficult yeah is there anyone please uh, uh, can share and then if there is no possibility to share your thoughts then uh, we will see the next uh, thing but it is on record so it will be uh, useful for me uh, and as well as uh, for you yeah uh, dr renu sikla would you like to say something thing okay no so i know i uh, now i think that uh, hello yeah 
Dr. Vinay. Uh, Please join yeah, the camera. Yeah, sir. Uh, sir, can I say something? Can I say something, sir? Yes, you are audible, but uh, the camera is not open. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sir, thank you so much for, for, a, for a very little talk. But I would really like to say you that the conference has been so informative, sir, uh, especially from my side uh, in the, the plagiarism session, actually, because uh, plagiarism has been very single word, but uh, uh, we can uh, we should follow the very small, small thing if, if we write the, our uh, research work in a very informative, in a proper way. So I would really enjoy that particular plagiarism session I'm trying. And also I'm trying to uh, convert my work in a, that particular way that really uh, being very informative and uh, find a very less tourism. So thank you so much, sir. It's been a beautiful, uh, all the sessions have been beautiful and we are very thankful to all of you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And uh, those who could not basically give the feedback on the Google form, please uh, spend some time and uh, it will take hardly two, three minutes or if more than that, uh, it, it could be basically and it will help us uh, at least uh, for the future uh, event. So, uh, if uh, uh, Manish, uh, Manish ji, would you like to say, Manish ji, uh, there are so many uh, young people are here. Yeah, you should take the opportunity. Plagrism ka, aap tumhe nisar ma to suno, plagrism ka vaati bata raha hoon. So now again, if I have to take the screen, so for uh, what the name are not sufficient, camera is required. Asok sir is here or no? Uh, basically, he was uh, trying to share something. Uh, Kashmir Singh sir, would you like to share something? Uh, not uh, like the the uh, tariff nahi hai. Tarif nahi, uh, the point basically that you had observed differently uh, to silent ho aur mera <laughs> i basically would like uh, to uh, think that and, uh, other things. so if anyone is interested to share, uh, they can share the idea, they can share their experiences or for the future planning, if you have something in your mind. So I can basically arrange. It is the vision of our chancellor, sir, uh, to manage all these things and to motivate me uh, to push me for this kind of thing. This is actually uh, the idea of uh, our chancellor. Uh, Dr. Asok K. Chitkara and uh, he's a visionary person and uh, uh, take the initiative in a different direction and give me the responsibility to basically uh, we are uh, uh, platinum open access journal. Earlier I was not aware about to the platinum and the type of the open access but uh, last time uh, the, uh, in the 20, uh, year 2020 I was attending a meeting and uh, in that meeting of Vona Vone, Vone uh, Campaigns actually uh, is the part of uh, OSPA sister branch that is called the switchboard or open access switchboard. So when I was attending uh, her uh, webinar at that time, basically uh, I got excited to know many more things that was required me being an editor, being a part of this Chitkar uh, University. So I have just requested some time. 